Um, my name is Nick Madencia, and I am the student body president of Baylor University. Um, at Baylor, we have a cool little tradition where we will be in McLean Stadium, which is our football stadium. A total of about 35,000 people are in the crowd. And what we do is we divide the stadium right down the middle, and one half says Baylor, the other half says Bears. So we're going to do that tradition this morning, except I want you, if you're on this side, all of you guys, I want you guys to save. And if you're on this side, I want you guys to say America, okay? You guys cool? Okay, we're going to give it one test run here. If you're on this side. Okay, that was pretty good. That was pretty good. I think we can do better. All right, here we go. For real now. Save. America. Save. America. One more. Here we go. Save. America. Awesome. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce you all to Dr. Shelley Sakula Gibbs, who's going to lead our panel this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome, Texas Youth Summit. It is a pleasure to be with you. My name is Dr. Shelley Sakula Gibbs, and I'm a former U.S. Congresswoman and serve currently on the Woodlands Township Board, but that's not what I'm doing today. Today, I'm here to keep these young men um, in line, basically, and they're going to share with you how they came to be where they are, conservative, young policy enthusiasts, and that's what y'all are supposed to be, too. So I'll introduce you right now. You already met Nick, Matt and Saya, and this is Cole Meshagan. And Cole, go ahead and start up and introduce yourself. Hi, y'all. I am the state chair of the Texas College Republicans. We're comprised of at least 16 colleges and counting, um, over 1,000 members, and I'm also a senior at TCU. Go Frogs. So we got a little rivalry going on. No. And then I also work as a policy analyst for America First Policy Institute, where I work for patriotic education. Great, great. That's all good. Nick, tell us, besides being a cheerleader, what do you do? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Nick Madencia. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, I have the pleasure of serving as the Baylor University. Woo! Second Bears. Uh, student body president. Uh, I am uh, about three years into working in politics. Uh, my first job was actually working for Christian Collins, so I'm just so deeply appreciative of all that he does and all that you do to come here and support uh, what it means to save America. And young people, that's your job, right? As sad as it is, I'm a baby boomer, and we kind of mess things up, I think, for a lot of y'all. And, you know, the debt's really big, and the, there was the sexual revolution, and then now we have the transgender movement, and it's just a, a pathetic situation that we're handing off to you. But I know y'all are capable of fixing it. So thank God for that. I'm, I have faith in you, and I'm confident that because you're here, you want to learn and you want to share and grow. So first off, I'm going to go back to Nick. So what do you think is the, the most important thing that's going on on college campuses right now that can be addressed and fixed and must be fixed? Yeah, I think the scariest part of being a college student right now is seeing this monoculture develop, where if you are not liberal, if you're not woke, if you're not secular, you will get absolutely beaten over the head until you are. And I think that as educators, that's a really scary thing because part of the job of an educator is to provide students with diversity of perspectives and different thoughts um, and, you know, uh, to be able to do that. But I think the scariest part of it is just feeling like, hey, I'm a Christian, I'm a Jew, and I'm conservative, and I feel really alone on my college campus. And that's a scary thing. Yes, feeling alone and then feeling canceled. So what do you think, Cole? I'd say the biggest problem is indoctrination, going along with that monoculture. I mean, the academia, the professors, there is a way that they want you to think. And it's intimidating. It's intimidating to write a paper that goes against your political professor's opinions and just see what it has to say. But honestly, you have to do it. You have to stand up and know that there's enough conservatives, look around the room, behind you to back you up in that fight. Have, has anyone experienced the actual cancellation, like telling you you have to get out of this club, you're not gonna, you don't qualify for this, or have, gotten a bad grade because you did something that was counter to what the uh, dogma was that was coming, like CRT dogma or some gender identity dogma. Has have y'all heard of, had a friend that experienced that? Well, I'll say, um, I just found out actually yesterday, the vice chair of the Federation had a philosophy test with Sam Houston State University just nearby. One of the questions on it was, Black Lives Matter, true or false? <laughs> she knew what the correct answer for the professor was, but she put the uh, her take, it wasn't going to be a correct answer. Yes. That yeah, it's a setup, right? It's a setup to kind of weed out 
who are compliant, because it's all about compliance and power, and who is not compliant. So our job is to not be compliant, to stand up for truth, goodness, and beauty, and the Judeo-Christian principles that we were founded on. So tell me about um, some of the things that you're organizing, that you're doing to help students, because it's lonely. It's lonely standing up. Go ahead. Yeah, well, one of the things that's been really interesting in my journey as a uh, Baylor student by president is that uh, a lot of people know what I believe on Baylor's campus. A lot of people know that I am a conservative Christian, which in my opinion is the only way it should be. Uh, I am a conservative Christian uh, in that, you know, I love Reagan and I love Jesus Christ and I love my family. And so just the fact that I even got elected by 15,155 of my peers to serve in this role, I think sends a statement. And uh, let me just tell you guys, if you're here and you're a student uh, in high school or college, just the fact that you're open with your beliefs and you tell people what you believe and you step into settings where uh, you are inherently the minority like you would in higher education, that is an act of service to all of us. Because, uh, you know, Dr. Shelley, I didn't realize how many folks were at Baylor who, going back to your previous question, uh, had to do things like, hey man, I'm in this liberal arts class, but I can't tell my professor what I believe. And it's always funny when they get a uh, overtly political, uh, something like an essay question, where it's like, how do you feel about the murder of George Floyd? And it's like, well, there's not really a way you can answer that in a way that would get anything other than an F, because your professor already has the answer to that question. Um, so it's been amazing hearing all of those stories and knowing that I'm not the only one on campus who feels like con the conservative Christian voice is being oppressed. Good, good. And so if you have a, an incident where you experience some sort of cancellation or some discrimination that you know is against conservative values, what's the best step to take? Do you have an idea? Is it to go public, like you're saying, go public with it? Or is, are there other organizations that will stand up and help you in your fight? Like, you know, besides waiting to come to Texas Youth Summit and air your grievances, which are, uh, it's valuable to share, but what, what are some of the steps that we can take and offer students, giving them support? Yeah, definitely. Um, honestly, reach out to the conservative clubs on your campus. They really do know uh, solutions. I'll, one personal experience, right before fall break uh, two years ago, the honors professor sent out an email requesting that we, uh, TCU includes mandatory vaccinations. That was not going to happen. So we decided, me and along with the turning point president of TCU, met with the chancellor. Amazing conversation, expressed our beliefs, and he assured us that he would not do that. There are, especially once you get to the higher level faculty, the administration, they want the college to succeed and so they're going to work with those conservative clubs and conservative clubs are not just a way for you to meet people they are a way to be represented on campus along with student government so you mentioned two what are some other conservative clubs that are that are out there you, so you're the uh, Texas College Republican state chair yes, and there but there are other groups too you mentioned turning point tell us a little bit about that uh, there's YAF Turning Point, Young Conservatives of Texas, all of these are the only, uh, we work with all of them because the only difference is they're nonprofit organizations. We are the collegiate arm of the Republican Party of Texas. And so we all work together. They bring in one type of speaker, we bring in politicians, but we're all just standing for the same stuff Judeo Christian values, free liberty, free enterprise, American exceptionalism. Pro life. Pro life. I, th I know there are some people out in Stud the audience. That uh, are students for life. Students for life. Uh, there's great groups out there that are representing the innocent life that is, is being extinguished nonstop in this country. And uh, I, I know that there's Students for Life, and then there's Susan B. Anthony List, there's Texas Right to Life. Here in Montgomery County, there's Life First. And we need young people to stand up for life because it's the first liberty, right? Life is our, we, if you take life away, you have nothing else. So anything else that you want to add about that for us people to, to, to join, to support, to put your time in? Yeah, I mean, that's a, a great question. I would say, uh, you know, if you're here in high school, the moment you get to your college campus, if you do decide to pursue a college degree, get involved in whatever club it is, whether that's Turning Point, uh, Leadership Institute, something else, uh, Young Conservatives of Texas, College Republicans, just get involved to have that community because they will support you immensely. And the biggest thing there is that you will know that you're not alone. 
That, yes, it's very important to have somebody to stand up. And there are also, I've, I've seen national organ, organizations who, should this, should whatever incident is going on, rise to the level of a lawsuit, they will, they will join you and help you. So that you might say, well, I can't afford to fight this on my own, right? But there are big organizations. Are you familiar with some of those groups like uh, First Liberty and uh, the Thomas More Society? and various other groups, they will back you if you really need something. Because I've had students come to me that say, look, my teacher is giving me a really bad grade because I'm not going to comply with what their thought process, this um, CRT or something else uh, that is very negative about America. Like, I'm not going to buy that, but yet I'm going to get an F and then I won't be able to go to law school or medical school. Because medical school has become, from what I hear, pretty woke. In a, in a lot of its acceptances. You know, they want to accept people that are more on the liberal side versus the conservative side. So if you're facing that, again, don't feel like you're alone. Reach out to some of these organizations that these young men are involved in. And I know there's a bunch of young ladies out there who are involved in these kinds of things too. Conservatives need to stick together. We really do that uh, if we have to because Division will cause us to, to, fail, to fail. Well, let's talk a little bit about the, the uh, upcoming election. I think that's a very good thing. I'm a part of the Mighty American Strike Force. Has anybody here heard of that? It's a group that used to be called the Mighty Texas Strike Force, and we organize and move out to various what I call purple states or swing states and help win the presidential election. Sometimes we work on other elections like Senate. In fact, I tried to get Cole to come with me to Georgia whenever there was a runoff. Right before the uh, January 6th invasion of the Capitol, there was a big two Senate runoff in Georgia, and uh, that was in 2021. It was actually January 5th. And he did not come at that time. I didn't get to meet him personally, but it was a great, great opportunity. And what I was telling the gentleman in the back is that there was, um, there was a lot of ballot harvesting going on in Georgia that I saw. There was a man that was a reporter. He went into a homeless shelter, and in that homeless shelter, there was nobody in there except the director of the shelter. And he said, well, today we have a report that 3,000 votes have come from this homeless shelter in the mail. 3,000 mail ballots have come from this homeless shelter. And he said, is that possible? And the man said, yes, it's possible, because we allow people to use this shelter as their address of record. But the point was, where were all these people? And who filled those ballots out? And who collected them? And who put them in the mail? That had to have an influence on the election, because that's one homeless shelter. Think about it. Multiply that by all the homeless shelters in Georgia. So we have to, as conservatives, be aware that the mail ballot is here to stay. We have to utilize it. We have to make sure it's going to work for candidates who represent the values of Judeo-Christian principles, the values of life, of family. And that is very important. So stay engaged. Look for groups like the Mighty American Strike Force that you can work with. And uh, to, so what are your thoughts for the upcoming election, Cole? Well, I'm going to direct it to the youth. For, um, for those of you who are on college campuses or about to go to college campuses, look at where your vote can make the biggest impact. You can actually register to vote on your college campus. So if you're coming from a West Texas area that's very conservative, but you're going down to UT Austin, you know where you should be voting. Um, and Good again, point. college students, we're the grassroots force. Democrats are, and the liberals are very good at making every youth an activist. It is time we have that mentality where every conservative is an activist for conservative Judeo-Christian principles and go knock every door, go make every phone call, and go get the uh, officials that align with your views elected. Good point. What do you think? Yeah, so I'm just curious. Raise your hand here if you're under the age of 35. Okay, so most of us. You can put your hands down. We have to be honest about the fact that right now on college campuses, we are getting beat by the Democrats and the liberals. We have to be honest about that. And that is a really unfortunate fact. That's a fact I loathe. That's a fact that every morning I wake up and I try to fight. Um, yeah. But there's three ways we can fix that. So number one, if you just raise your hand and you're over the age of 18, you have to come out and vote. And don't just vote in the general, vote in the primary. I don't care who you plan on voting for in the primary. I've got my personal opinion about that, but just go out and vote in the primary. Number two is you need to be part of a mobilization group. 
We are stronger when we are all in the same ocean together because a high tide will lift all of our boats. And then number three is you need to be energy, energetic and enthusiastic and vocal about your conservative Christian or Jewish beliefs. Absolutely, be vocal, be, be loud, and, um, and, and, but also do this. I always tell people, you will win if you are persistent, if you are professional, and if you are charitable. Because loud and angry does not work, right? But loud and generous and educational, yes, share your values, share your education, but do those other things as well. So I think that this next race that's coming up in 2024 is going to be so important. And I'd like to hear what the young people are doing on the campus to rally, to get people engaged for the 2024. Any ideas? Yeah, um, first we're registering voters. That is the big thing. Um, 60, 70% of Americans vote, uh, that's bad. <laughs> it needs to be higher. Because I know that we are still, to the Reagan's point, uh, we are still a silent majority, or Nixon. We are still a silent majority, and because of that, we need to get the vote out. Uh, and then also, you need to actually know the candidates, not just the big race, but all the way down. We saw during COVID how important those local offices are. So college Republicans, we're hosting lots of forums or speaker events where you can actually go meet those speakers, those county judge, county commissioner candidates that are going to have a large impact on your everyday lives. And with the internet, there's no reason you can't learn about a, a candidate's real basic principles. Uh, just, for instance, school board, it's nonpartisan. Don't assume that that means anything. Everybody on that school board has very strong opinions about education, whether they, they want gender teaching in the school board or whether they don't, whether they want a chaplain on their campus or they don't. Find out the nitty-gritty. Don't just say, oh, it's nonpartisan, so I don't really need to get involved. You do, and, and that includes city council races. So uh, what do you think is, should happen now? Well, I think the first thing that needs to happen is I think every single person in this room should take some time to reflect on how blessed we are to live in a country where we can have an open, honest dialogue about politics and about which guy or girl we like the best and who we're going to vote for. And I think that our college students especially need that because something I've noticed on campus is that our age group, we don't realize how blessed we truly are uh, to be living in the greatest country in the history of the world in a country where we can have open, honest dialogue about politics. Um, but other than that, I think Cole really hit it on the head. I agree. So what I, I think it's about time for us to wrap up. I'm not sure if that's, um, no one's telling me like to do this, but so we'll do one, one final thing. I want, to, I want to leave with a uh, positive note about what you're saying. We're, we're very blessed to be in the United States, very blessed to be in Texas, but Texas is kind of a last stand. We're holding, holding up the flag for the rest of the country. Never doubt the value of being a Texan we need to stay strong in Texas. And like he said, vote, pray, work. <laughs> we have to work, for, otherwise somebody else will take the rights that we cherish away. So final comments for you, Cole. Um, like she said, it's the last stand. So I want to take a warrior mentality. Go to Joshua 1, 9. Be strong and courageous. Do not be discouraged. Do not be dismayed. The Lord your God is with you wherever you go. We are on God's side. We are, uh, will stand for our Judeo-Christian values, and we will see this nation be made great again. Yeah, I think looking around this room and knowing you're not alone is one of the biggest hopes politically that we can have for ourselves and for each other. Because when you step foot on a college campus or a high school campus and your professors you know, throw out some crazy uh, oddball leftist idea, it's really easy to feel alone in that moment. But look around and be reminded that you are not alone. You're surrounded by your brothers and sisters in Christ and in uh, conservatism, and that it's our time to band together because we really don't get a mulligan on elections. No, we don't. Yeah. God bless you all. God bless Texas.
Hello, everyone. My name is Heidi Martinez, and it is an honor to be here this morning. I am so humbled to have this opportunity to be here today to share my story with all of you. I truly believe that me being here today, standing in front of this wonderful crowd, is a testament to God's divine intervention. Because the odds were not in my favor, and I'm going to tell you why. I grew up in a huge indoctrination camp. Yes, I was born and raised in communist Cuba, an island in the Caribbean that has been under a dictatorship for over six decades, 64 years to be exact. So I know what censorship looks like, and I know what oppression looks like, and all of its consequences. I was subjected to communist indoctrination from an early age, with a constant brainwashing from a totalitarian regime that controls all aspects of life. Yes, the government of Cuba decides what the people eat and when to eat it with their rationing books. The government determines what to air on TV, what books people are allowed to read, and even what type of music they can listen to. The government forces children to attend events where they make them chant slogans like pioneers for communism, we will be like Che Guevara, you know Che Guevara, the cold-blooded killer? I remember chanting the sickening phrase when I was six years old. Now, while the tyrannical regime violates basic human rights, like freedom of speech and freedom of religion, they use their well-oiled propaganda machine to tell the free world that Cubans actually love socialism. And the Cubans are grateful to Fidel Castro and the revolution for providing them with free health care and free education. Free? <laughs> At what cost? Is it really free? when they have to, when Cubans' uh, salary is an average of $25 a month. It's a worth all the daily struggles Cubans face, like no electricity or running water for hours, even days sometimes. The food rationing, the lack of basic hygiene products and medication, so no, there is no free education in Cuba. There is no free health care in Cuba. But you know, Cubans are not allowed to disagree, complain, or even question anything. They are obedient and loyal figures in the background of a totalitarian regime. And they're just there, quietly suffering, just trying to survive. The ones that have been brave enough to speak up have ended up in jail with fabricated evidence and no fair trials. And many others have been tortured and murdered in Castro's gulags. I was 16 years old when by the grace of God, I was finally able to escape communism. However, I was just a product of their indoctrination tactics. Like all Cubans for the past 60 years, I was taught only what the government stipulated, which was to blind blindly obey their oppressive and controlling mandates. And the unwavering misconception that the capitalist world, specifically the United States of America, was responsible for the dictatorship's 
flaws, incompetence, and basically the destruction of the country. So you're probably wondering, Heidi, how, how does a 16-year-old girl born and raised in the most revered utopian society of our times embraces the American values of individual freedom, rights, and opportunity? Well, I was blessed because this very kind and generous family took me under their wing. And yes, it took a lot of hard work and a lot of unlearning and learning. Imagine realizing that you had been lied to for so long. Remember, I was taught in Cuba that this country was evil. But how? How was this country evil when this country welcomed me with, with open arms and showed me a world full of possibilities and opportunities worth living for? So I immersed myself in the culture. I learned the language. I became a proud American citizen and a conservative with a great passion for politics. I now work for Americans for Prosperity, the premier grassroots advocacy organization transforming policy around the country. And I am from Florida, but we have 36 chapters across the nation, and we actually have one here in Texas. And, you know, I want you to, to just Think about what I just said today. And I want to inspire you to please get involved, to take action, to speak up, to join organizations like American, Americans for Prosperity or Turning Point USA. Support policies that matter. Run for office because we have to protect the freest country on earth. And I'm going to leave you with this quote from Margaret Thatcher. There are many difficult things about freedom. It does not give you safety. It creates moral dilemmas for you. It requires self-discipline. It imposes great responsibilities. But such is the destiny of men. And in such consist the glory and salvation. In such, too, consists our national greatness. As the book of Proverbs says, righteousness excels a nation. Thank you. Good morning! Oh my goodness. Guys, stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Come on. Good morning. It's so good to see all of you guys. I'm Lily Kate. I live in the Woodlands, so if this is your first time in the Woodlands, welcome. I know it may not be as beautiful as California, but I'm so glad you're here. How was last night? I mean, come on. That was amazing. Okay, now that you have your morning stretches in, you have actually like some energy in you. I hope y'all had coffee this morning. Not yet? What? I mean, they did put this pretty early, but it's good to see you guys. Okay, you can sit back down. Who here is in high school? Awesome. Who here is in college? Okay, sort of even, a little heavier on the high school side. You're in a super special time of your life if you didn't realize it already. You're finally being able to define yourself in the context of the real world, getting to decide your own life, your own decisions, your own culture, your own habits. You're getting to really figure out who you are. And so as you're doing that, 
I hope to be a word of encouragement and wisdom and perspective for everyone in this room because as you probably know, the culture is going to be grabbing at you and trying to assert itself at every angle in your life. It's gonna try and weave its way into being part of your life, whether you know it or not. And so as you're doing that um, in high school and college, you're going to learn that American feminism has been a movement that is only fighting for equality under the law. You're going to learn that feminism has actually been a force for good in society and that it's a completely harmless movement that women all around the world owe their loyalty to. So you will learn that feminism has delivered on the two things that it promised, which were freedom and happiness for women. But that is a huge lie. So let's finally put feminism in a coffin and send it down the river with all the other failed ideas like socialism or communism or like women actually believing that Pete Davidson is cute. I mean, where did that come from? So feminism in its early days promised women two things. They promised freedom and happiness and they have delivered on virtually neither of those. Women are not more free today. Women have to work grueling nine to five hours at their office to barely make it by. Women spend far less time with their friends and their family than before. Women are not actively being protected or defended by their male counterparts because women and men both stay single for longer amounts of time and so how can someone be free if they're not being protected? Women are often addicted to drugs, alcohol, not to mention other prescribed drugs that they have. Women today, of course, lack extremely basic skills, and essentially, a lot of women, they're basically useless outside of being able to order Chinese food takeout and um, knock back a handful of Advil. So how can you be free if you really have no skills? Heck, most women can't even get out of bed without needing 30, 300 milligrams of caffeine in the morning to actually wake them up. So women today might have the right to vote, which is fine and good, but is that really an accomplishment that feminism can take credit for at the expense of everything else that women have lost in America? Okay, fine. Maybe women aren't technically more free today, but what if they're really happy? I mean, look around, come on. Women are not happy today. Women suffer from anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation. Most women will try to deny it, but our natural feminine want to be seen has turned into a crippling need for constant attention in our society. Women are driven completely crazy by hormonal birth control and they take on unnecessary trauma from abortions that they willingly participate in. See, women now try and insert themselves because of feminism into a masculine shaped box and then expect to be fulfilled by that. Women spend more time trying to deny their biology than actually living in harmony with it. Women, uh, a study titled The Paradox of the Modern Woman's Unhappiness, you can look it up, examines women's declining levels of happiness from the 1970s until now, and essentially it ends with this statement. It says, women's well-being has fallen over a period in which objective measures point to robust improvements in their opportunities. So no, as we can see, feminism has not made women happier. So I wanna ask you this, why would we keep trying to continue and push this ultra feminist narrative? Why when its accomplishments have been so dismal that we're still attached to this message, why? You see, feminism's failures have actually been so intense that the idea of feminism has really gone backwards and has turned into an anti-family, anti-life, militant Marxist movement that has successfully destroyed the institution of marriage, has emasculated men, has encouraged modern women to be completely rebellious and idolize the male archetype. Okay, well, Lily, how do you know this? How do you know this? because the feminists themselves actually said it. Lena Gordon, a feminist historian, said, the nuclear family must be destroyed 
and people must find a better way of living together. Feminist author Germaine Greer said, I am passionately opposed to the nuclear family with its mom and its dad and their children. It is the most neurotic lifestyle that has ever been developed. She also said that women should be deliberately promiscuous. S Sally Miller Greerhart, a feminist science fiction author said, and this is a great one, guys, the proportion of men should be reduced to and maintained at approximately 10% of the human race. So this is what feminism is based on. Clearly, it's a deeply rotten ideology, and I'm sure you've seen in your own life that it's really not that productive either. They've confused power with empowerment and has turned the nuclear family into its perceived enemy. And so while secularism is decaying in American exceptionalism, feminism is the branch of secularism that has been tasked with rotting women from the inside out and decaying at men from the outside in. The utopian goal of feminism is to destroy the strength of the family and give the government full control. And it does this by violently overthrowing any male hierarchy, which is a scary concept for a lot of modern women, and inserting women in its place. Because over and over and over again, feminism yells that women are the victimized, women are victims, and men are the only ones victimizing them. And what is so crazy is that so many men and women alike have accepted this restrictive characterization on their life and set their lives up within the bounds that feminism has laid out for them. See, the idea of the victimized and the victimizers has in many ways seeped into the societal consciousness that we all share and really has become a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you see it, you believe it. And if you believe it, you will become it. But I want to let you guys in on a little secret that the feminists would be terrified if you actually knew. Because the dirty little secret is that subscribing to this feminist, toxic, disordered mentality is the only thing that is keeping feminism, the rotten radical type that we have today, keeping it alive. Feminism is only thriving because women have chosen to believe that they are victims of men or of the patriarchy or of traditional feminine roles like being a wife or a mother. You see, if women all woke up one day and decided, you know, we're like not oppressed, especially in America, and our lives are far better than women even 200 years ago, if women all did that, they'd realize that they didn't need feminism because feminism expends most of its resources trying to convince you, girls and guys, of course, that you need it. Feminism needs women to need it. You see, it's this blue-haired movement is really just a big bully trying to convince women that they have no ability to make their lives better. And so what now? You're in high school, you're in college, you're about to start really exploring and defining yourself. What do we do about this? Well, I think as a society and as a culture, we need to have a very serious conversation about what the proper roles of men and women are. Maybe we can have that conversation here. That's my goal. Because the feminists have gotten it so wrong. <laughs> And so we must be able to point to something that is better, that is more constructive, and that is more keen to allow a society to flourish again. And so, guys, I want to start with you. Let's have the conversation that feminists have been trying to run away from for basically 100, over 100 years at this point. So, guys, a good man, as you probably already know, but I'm going to remind you, he turns nature and chaos and order, a disorder into order, and structure. A good man runs to the horizon. Well, not runs to, he runs toward. He pushes to defend from evil forces. He pushes for the highest adv civilizational advancement that he can. You see, society is deeply afraid of what you guys can do 
and they like kicking you down because they don't want you to band together. They don't want you to become brothers and fight in the trenches again and simply fighting for what is right. They are terrified of what you can do. So that's why they try and isolate you and encourage women to dominate over you. And so girls, you have a uniquely beautiful ability to create culture everywhere you are. You can turn a rigid, sterile, cold space into something that is warm and inviting and beautiful, literally just with your presence. You see, there is an ordained complementary relationship between men and women, and it's a beautiful dance, and it makes life so worth living. You see, men civilize nature, and women civilize men. Men, or women, give men the reason to build the things that they do, and men give women the stability to flourish and blossom and create the culture in those things. So, it's time for you to start choosing, to start being conscious of the choice that you have in front of you. You see that there is a life that can offer you something a whole lot better than what the feminists envision for your life, guys and girls. Feminists offer you a life of climbing the corporate ladder in resentment and bitter competition, and we, the Christian and conservative and mostly homeschooled movement, want to offer you a life of freedom that is filled with community and that is filled with just rich fullness. The feminists offer you a life of frustrated and tense relationships, a perpetual state of anger at the world, while we want to offer you a life of harmonious, fruitful relationships that seek loving words, that don't seek revenge and domination. Feminists offer you a life of misery and a life that is completely void of love, again, whether you're a guy or a girl, because feminism is an extremely imperialist idea. Feminists offer you a life that is just not even worth living, and we want to offer you a life of something so much better. And so, again, you're in high school, you're in college, you're for the first time at liberty to explore yourself in the context of the real world. And so I want to encourage you as you're doing this, as you're on your college campuses, as you're at high school, and you're presented with choices about how you want to live your life and what framework you want to live your life in, I just wanna encourage you to choose freedom to choose happiness and choose the two things that feminists have completely failed to give you. Thank you. Good morning. Buenos dias a todos. How are y'all doing? <laughs> Are you ready to take back our country? Because it's going to take proud Americans like yourself to step up. Every single one of you needs to get involved. This is the most important election of our lifetime. And I know that y'all hear this every time, but no, really, this is the most important election of our lifetime. My name is Mayra Flores. I was born in Burgos, Tamaulipas, Mexico, and I was blessed to come here to the United States when I was six years old legally. And that is why it's so important for us to focus on legal immigration. We don't want no women and children to go through the abuse and trauma that they're going through. I want every six-year-old little girl that comes here to the United States to have the same beautiful, amazing experience that I had. And I am forever grateful to my father for doing things right and bringing me to the most amazing country, the United States of America. 
My parents were migrant workers, so we moved a lot growing up. I lived in South Texas, but I also grew up in Memphis, Texas, in a small town in, by Amarillo, Texas. It's not Memphis, Tennessee. It's Memphis, Texas. And I had an amazing experience growing up there. We worked uh, at a... I worked there since a very young age. I was 13 years old when I started working alongside my parents, which instilled in me the value of hard work. How many of y'all work already? Wow, amazing. And you should be very proud. It instills in us to work hard and to continue our education. I did not want to work in the cotton fields for the rest of my life. <laughs> so I continued my education, but graduated in San Benito in 2004 and became a respiratory care practitioner. I am a proud uh, mother of four, but I am also a proud Border Patrol wife. And I worked in the medical field for many years taking care of children, the elderly, but I felt that I had to step up. I felt that the things that I was blessed with, my children, our children, were not going to have those opportunities. But I have to be honest with you. I grew up in a very conservative home to always put God family first. But my dad was a Democrat. So when I told him in 2010 that I was walking away from the Democrat Party because he raised me a Republican, even though he didn't know that, he said, absolutely, he's like, absolutely not. And I explained to him how our values align with the Republican Party. And he had a hard time understanding because you got to understand that, you know, everything you hear on TV, especially in Spanish speaking uh, networks, is that the, the Republican Party doesn't want people that look like us here. And that's a complete lie. They've told us that the Republican Party is only the party of the rich, which is also a complete lie. See, the Democrat Party wants you to stay poor, to continue controlling you. They don't want us educated. And they brainwashed, not just my father, but they've brainwashed so many Hispanics, so many in my community. But I told him, Dad, I can no longer continue supporting a party that doesn't represent me and doesn't represent the values that you instilled in me. So what's more important, the values that you instilled in me or your political party? And it's time that we put our values first and not a political party. Because no political party is worth you putting God aside. And it took him a while. It took him a while to understand. But he went from being a hardcore Democrat to being a hardcore Republican. <laughs> And he was the most supportive father um, in the world when I told him that I was running for office. And he said, what? You're running for Congress? And I said, yes, I'm running for Congress. And we have been told by so many people that you have to have, you know, decades of political experience, that you have to graduate from a very prestigious university. And look, President Biden has decades of political experience, graduated from the best university, and what good does it do? He has no common sense, no love for our country, so don't come at me, don't come at us and telling us that we don't have what it takes. Actually, we need more people like us, people like you, to start running this country. That's what we need. The everyday American that understands the struggle so don't ever allow anyone to tell you that you can't or that you don't have the qualifications. Look at our vice president. I mean, no, don't look at her. She's irrelevant and does absolutely nothing and is an embarrassment. Not just for this country, but for us women. She's done absolutely nothing. So I want y'all 
to know that any of you could run for office and can become a member of Congress, a senator, and can run for president. Don't ever allow anyone to tell you that you can't. And when I told my family, they were very surprised because politics is not something that, that we do in our family. But I explained to them how I felt that I owed this to this country who's, give, who's given me so much. This country allows us to be ourselves, allows us to embrace our culture, our language, and in return, just to love her back and respect her. So I had to step up and fight for this country. And a lot of people said, well, weren't you born in Mexico? I don't think you could run. And I said, I Googled it. Google says that I can, and I did. And I became the first Mexican-born Congresswoman ever elected in history. <laughs> and I'm very proud of the work that we're doing in South Texas and that we continue to do in South Texas to inspire more Americans, more Hispanics to get involved and vote Republican, the party that aligns with our conservative values, that stands for faith, family, and hard work, because that is who we are. And in this election, all Americans, conservatives, we got to come together. We have to put our differences aside, because even amongst us Republicans, we're gonna have some differences, and we're not gonna agree on everything, and that's okay. But on this election, after the primary, we have to come together. Vote for whoever you want in the primary. But after that, we have to unite. This is the most important election of our lifetime. I'm not gonna tell you who to vote for in the primary, but I'm gonna tell you who I'm going to vote for. I'm going to vote for President Trump. And let me tell you why. Because under President Trump, we had a secure border. My husband, who is a Border Patrol agent, we have never seen anything like this before in South Texas. I don't need to hear it from TV. I see it. It's in our backyards. Over 10,000 people cross illegally every single day. We've had over 7 million people cross illegally into our country. Some are good people but some are not. And those are the people that worry me. And if we care about the good people that wanna come here to work hard, to accomplish the American dream, we need to focus on legal immigration. They need to come here to the United States legally. It is a slap on the face on migrants like myself and the millions that are actually waiting in line right now when they're giving these people that just crossed illegally into our country a status and work visas. This administration encourages people to come here illegally and is rewarding illegal immigration. And that is why millions of people are coming to the United States illegally, because this administration is rewarding and encouraging illegal immigration, knowing that the Mexican cartel is making $13 billion a year in human trafficking. This cartel does not care about children and women. They abuse children and women every single day. They don't care. They have no respect for human life. I have family in the state of Tamaulipas. Tamaulipas is one of the most dangerous states in the country. My grandparents still live in Mexico, my family. I don't visit as much because I am afraid. Millions of Mexican Americans still have family in Mexico and they don't visit as often because they're afraid. So why would we want where we're afraid to come here to the United States? That is why border security is so important. Children are being abandoned in the middle of nowhere. A two month old baby a few days ago was found abandoned. Two days ago. He's not the first baby that our Border Patrol agents save. And these children 
come in with a little paper in their pocket with the name and a phone number to call. And we sent these children to these sponsors, so-called family members. 30 days later, we call them, and guess what? They're no longer picking up the phone. And right now, we don't know where 87,000 children are. The United States of America is the number one in child trafficking. Mexico is the number one supplier. That needs to end. We should not be on that list. And when I am in Congress, and we need to continue putting pressure on those in Washington to put in place laws that protect these children, because I don't care where they're from. We should protect our children. And we should put these people that traffic with children in prison for the rest of their life. Anyone who hurts a child, traffics children, should not be given a second opportunity. Enough. We need law and order in this country. And I believe this is something that we should all come together and change. This shouldn't even be a Republican or Democrat issue. Putting child traffickers in jail should not be politicized. Securing the border is going to keep children safe, is going to keep women safe as well. Because if we actually care about migrants, we should be focusing on legal immigration, where they will not go through the trauma and the abuse that they're going through right now. And because our Border Patrol agents are focused on processing, we have less agents in the field, so we have drug traffickers coming in, terrorists coming in. God forbid we have another 9-11. Stay vigilant. Pay attention to your surroundings because we are not safer than we were in 2001. We're not. We're actually less safe. So pay attention to your surroundings. And that is why border security is very important to me and to Republicans because we care, the sa we care about the safety of the American people, and we care also about the women and children coming in as well. I had an opportunity to speak with one of the women a few months ago. She was coming from Venezuela, escaping communism, socialism, and yet you have people here in the United States pushing for socialism. You know, I wish we could, tra we could do a trade-off, you know? I wish we could send all those people in this country who support socialism, we could send them to Cuba and Venezuela, and in return, bring some freedom lovers. I had the opportunity to speak to this, to this woman, a mother of three little girls. Her husband had been killed. And she said that the United States was the first country where she wasn't raped. Every country she stepped in, she was raped. And she said, this was the first country that I stepped in that I wasn't abused. I saw the men in green, and I thought, here it comes. And then they didn't. They treated me with respect. And I will always remember the men in green. Los hombres en verde, that was her, how she told me. Los hombres en verde, I will always think of them with love and respect because they were the first men that did not abuse me. And this is what these women go through. And they're going through this because they're being encouraged by our own government to come here to the United States, knowing how dangerous this journey is. So the only responsible is our government for encouraging it, but also their failed government as well, that we send billions of dollars to. We need to stop sending billions of dollars to these countries that are also responsible and part of the problem. We're currently buying oil from Venezuela. Why are we buying oil from Venezuela? 
knowing how they treat their people. So it's so important that you understand that this election is the most important election and why you need to get involved. It's about your future. It's about the future of your children that you don't have, but you will one day. It's about them. And I inherited an amazing country and it's not fair that we inherit y'all, this country that is in right now. So we have an opportunity to change things and the route this country's heading to. We do. But it's going to take all of you to get involved, to encourage your families to get involved, your friends to go out and vote. For us to, in 2024, secure the border, strengthen our economy. People right now are struggling. 61% of Americans are actually living paycheck to paycheck. They can't pay for their rent and their mortgage, their car payment, their groceries. So it is time that we rise up and fight back and not allow this communist party, socialist party to take our country. Because this is our country and it's worth fighting for. It's worth fighting for. And if someone like myself that was born in Mexico was able to accomplish so much, it's only in America. I want you to be proud of being an American. I want you to wave the American flags proudly. People tell me um, all the time, well, aren't you Mexican? And I said, I'm proud of my culture and I'm proud of my heritage, of where I'm from. I will always embrace it, but I'm a proud American. I am a proud American and I love this country very much. And it's time that we put America first. And those of you that are Hispanics, if there's any Hispanics here, the, the, le <laughs> the left will try to tell you that if you embrace America, that you're not proud of who you are. Not true. You could love both. You don't have to choose. You could love your culture, embrace your values, everything about you and your mom and dad. But you're an American too, and you can be damn proud of it. So don't you allow anyone to tell you that you can't love both. It is who you are, it's in our DNA. And I actually think that because I love my culture and where I'm from is that I am supporting the Republican Party. Because if I support the Democrat Party, that's against our values. But again, thank you so much for allowing me to be here. God bless y'all. And again, get involved. I would not be in the position that I am in if it wasn't because of people like y'all that get involved. So get involved. God bless you and God bless America. Well, that was an awesome speech. That was a part of our 501c4 Texas Youth Action. So we, this event is by our 501c3 Texas Youth Foundation, and that was a carve-out of our Texas Youth Action. And we're about to have a panel with Congresswoman Myra Flores and a candidate, Kenneth Omore. And the real special thing about these two candidates is they're really working to reach new people and grow the Republican Party. And we can talk about that as a part of the 501c4. They are doing things that are unprecedented. And Myra Flores is in a D15 district, and she's up by two points. That's incredible. Everybody should give that a round of applause. So um, with that being said, we'll have uh, Myra and, and Kenneth come up. Let's give it up for them.
Well, there's so much that I could say about these two wonderful people, but I'm going to let them introduce themselves. And of course, Myra just gave a speech, but maybe she'll give a little uh, overview for those of you who are just walking in for the first time. Well, I'm Congresswoman Mayra Flores, and I became the first Mexican-born Congresswoman ever elected in history. I'm from South Texas, and we we're working very hard in South Texas to grow the Republican Party and get more Hispanics to vote Republican in 2024. I'm Kenneth Murray. I'm a first-generation American. I'm originally from Nigeria. And I am so grateful to today be called an American because I tell folks <laughs> only in America would a child of a nobody become somebody without knowing anybody. You know, when I think about the growth of the Republican Party, I think of people like Young Kim, who came from South Korea and went to Orange County and became the first Korean uh, Republican woman in Congress. And then I think about Congresswoman Myra Flores, who came from Mexico and worked hard, and I want her to tell some of the ways that you know, she struggled to get to where she is, and became a Republican member of Congress. So not, why not in Southwest Houston have a person a young man from Nigeria be a member of Congress. Why not? Amen. Amen. So, uh, Myra, if you would maybe just talk about your family and the struggle to get to where you are and, and how young people can overcome adversity to get to where they, God has called them to be. Well, my, my father and my mother had, you know, no um, education, um, but they're very hardworking and full of, of wisdom, and that's what's gotten them to be where they're in, they are today. And I'm very proud of both my dad and my mom for all their, you know, accomplishments, even though they didn't uh, have the opportunities that they gave me. You know, my, when my dad brought us here to the United States, I was six years old, and he always in, instilled in me the importance of going to school and getting education because he didn't have those opportunities. He actually started working since he was seven years old, taking care of goats and farms, and that's how he was able to provide for himself and his family. And then, of of course, he had an opportunity to come here uh, to the United States. My, my grandfather actually was born here in the United States, uh, but fell in love with my grandma from Mexico. <laughs> and my grandma did not want to come here to the United States, so he moved to Mexico. And that's how they raised their family in, in Mexico. And uh, uh, my, my father was born in Mexico as well, but because his father was born here in the United States, he was always able to come here um, as well. And I'm so grateful to my dad because even though he had a very rough uh, childhood, he always tells me that, yes, he grew up poor, but he never knew he was poor. <laughs> he said, I, I nunca sabía que era pobre. I never knew I was poor because I had so much love, you know, in my family. And myself, we grew up with very little, but I always never saw poverty because I always felt that if I didn't have the money, I could work for it. Because that's what my dad instilled in me at a very young age. I was actually 13 when I told him I wanted some Doc Martens. And I'm sure y'all know what I'm talking about. And he said, no, I, we, I can't buy you Doc Martens, but you can go work in the, on the weekend and you could raise the money and buy yourself your own Doc Martens. <laughs> that's what I did. And then I, I fell in love with getting my own money. And I, I was like, okay, I want to work every weekend to every summer. And it just became a part of me working in hoeing in the cotton fields up in, in Memphis, Texas. And then I graduated and became a respiratory care practitioner. But I have, you know, always seen hard work, you know, in my family. My family is a part of it. It's in me. It's just instilled in us. And, yeah, I just want to inspire all of you that um, no matter where you work and what you do, always believe in yourself and keep on pushing, keep on going, and you'll accomplish uh, your dreams. Because in this country, if you work hard, you can accomplish the American dream. Amen. 
Amen. Well, life is about struggle and hard work. Uh, Kenneth, if, if maybe you could tell a little bit about your story. Absolutely. So, well, like Myra, I'm from um, a polygamous home. And for those of us probably wanting to know what is a polygamous home, so it's a system of marriage where a man is allowed to marry more than one wife. So from my mother, um, we have, my mom had six children with my dad. But my dad had over 60 children from other wives. Let me say that again in case you missed it. So my dad has 60, over 60 children from other wives. But all of these changed when I turned nine because my parents separated when I was nine. And my dad, my dad was no longer a support in our lives. And I will forever owe my positive attitude towards life to my mother, a woman who single-handedly ensured that all her six children had a college education in a country where there was no student loans available. I, thank you. I say this because for us, I have no idea, even up to today, how my mom knew or thought it wise when my, my dad and my mom separated all what she knew to do was to run to church, to run to God. I can tell you stories upon stories, but I am a product. I am a product of a child whose mom laid the foundation for a future for. And I can tell you that that's one of the biggest things that's happened to, my, happened to me in my life. Because today, not only that I am an accountant... I also became a CPA, and I'm also a college educator. I worked with um, large oil and gas firms, and, and um, a couple of years ago, 2017, my family, my wife and I, welcomed a set of triplets. <laughs> and and, and uh, I had to make a choice. I had to make a choice to either give all of my time and my life because it's, it's tough to be out there working in corporate America. And I applaud everybody who's doing that, but I needed to be in my kid's life. So I resigned from working in one of the largest oil field service company to start my own CPA firm. And one of the reasons why I did that was to be present in the growth of my children. And today, I'm so grateful I made that decision because it's been one of the best career decisions that I've ever made in my life. Think about that. Only in America, you know, working in a field to being a member of Congress, selling on the streets of Nigeria, right? That's correct. And ending up in America as a U.S. citizen and running for Congress. And Myra's been endorsed by the biggest people in everywhere. And Kenneth, he's endorsed by Mattress Mac here and, uh, in, in Texas. And that's, that's amazing. That's huge. He's got I big endorsements, and people are taking note. And they recognize that they love this story where people have immigrated here, worked hard, and become something. That's what we want in our party. Am I right? Amen. Amen. Well, when I think about these two people, I think about their faith. And I really want to talk to them about God and how God has played such a pivotal role in their life. Every time I hear Myra or any time I see a social media post, it's always about Jesus, always about God, always about prayer. And she's the real deal. It's not like she's faking it to make herself look good to voters. Like, she's legit a, a, a believer, and I know that about her. So I just want to talk about how important faith is in her life and how it's transformed her and how it affects the way that she lives and runs for office. Well, you know, faith was just instilled in me. I don't know any other way. <laughs> I don't remember not ever believing in God. You know, that is something that my parents instilled in me at a very young age. Um, my grandmother as well. I remember, um, you know, my grandmother would go everywhere with the Bible. So every, we have, you have so many pictures of her and she's always with the Bible with her. 
you know, so she was always um, giving me advice, instilling me the word of God. And I have to be honest with you, when you're a teenager, you know, a lot of times I would be like, okay, Willita, está bien, you know. I would just, you know, she would always tell me, why are you listening to that type of music? And <laughs> she would get mad at me when I would go, I would get there and I would be with my loud music and she would always, you know, criticize my choices. <laughs> and, I would, and she would give me the list of people that she thought it was good for me to listen to, and I would be like, that is so boring. No, you know, and, but she always just kept on going and always instilling in me, you know, the word of God, both my grandparents, and, and I look back now, and I catch myself listening to that music now, and to all of you that are grandparents, it's so important that you are present in your grandchildren's life. You have no idea. I would not be in the position that I've, I'm in um, without them. My grandparents are everything. I'm blessed to still have, you know, uh, my grandparents on my mother's side. And I, I don't think my faith in God would be as strong as it is. And I always saw them on their knees praying. And I really do believe that God has protected me in, in, in so many ways because their prayers still live. Even though, yes. So, if you are a mother, pray for your children because no one else will if you're not praying for them. Pray for your children, pray for your grandchildren, and those prayers will live for many generations. And even though my grandma on my father's side is not here, you know, when I think of her, I think of her walking to church with that Bible you know, with her uh, and me stopping her and asking her if she needs a ride. And she says, no, I could walk to church by myself, you know. And I was like, she would walk everywhere. And this is in Mexico, you know, so people are very used to walking everywhere in Mexico. Uh, but she was always so in love with God, you know, and she inherited that love for God in me. And I'm just so grateful. And my parents as, as well. I don't know life without God. You know, um, he's always been there for me, and when I have fallen, he's picked me up. He's just given me the strength, and I trust in him. And sometimes, you know, a loss is not really a loss. You know, people will, will, will tell you, how do you feel about this loss? Sometimes losses can turn into wins. And, and God, you know, puts us in certain positions because that's what we're meant to be. So just trust in him. Keep on going. Don't give up. You're going to have failures in your life. You're going to mess up. All of you young people, you're going to mess up. Learn from them. Stay in prayer. He's going to keep, he's going to give you the strength that you need uh, to accomplish what you, what you want to accomplish in life. So going back to my mom, um, leaving my, or my dad and my mom separating, and all she knew to do was go to the church. The church actually was responsible for my learning the saxophone. How many of you were here yesterday when I played the saxophone at the beginning of yesterday? Okay. So the church actually paid for me to go and learn the music instrument in a music school. I was 16 years old when the church sent me to learn the saxophone. And I've always been in church. I gave my life to Christ when I was nine years old. And since, ever since then, I can tell you that God has transformed not just my life, because that singular decision that my mom made by taking all of us to the church had had an impact in our life. Not only that all six of my mom's children today, they are, I, can, I can safely say we are born again Christians, and God has been very, very tremendous in the growth and success of all of us. I owe everything that I have in my life to God, because without Him, we are nothing. We have time for one more question, and uh, I just want to preface this question with you guys both have Texas Youth Actions endorsement, my personal endorsement. I'm 100% behind y'all. And uh, I wanted to ask about the inroads that you are making in your district because 
Uh, Myra Flores, of course, as I mentioned, she's in a D plus 15. That means she's 15 points behind starting out in this district, and she's up two points. She's way overperforming. <laughs> Kenneth Amore is running in CD7. And what's amazing is that district is 12% African. And I want to differentiate, not 12% African-American, 12% African. There's a difference. And he's reaching so many people. I've seen him. He speaks to huge crowds of Africans. And I see him talking to them, saying, you need to switch from Democrat to Republican. And they're like, OK. <laughs> Nobody had ever asked before. <laughs> so um, I watch it. It's working. And I just want to say I'm proud of both of them. But I would like for them to expound on this. You can clap. That was a Jeb Bush moment. Please clap. <laughs> <laughs> well, Texas District 34 in South Texas is 90% Hispanic. It's actually the, the district with the largest um, Hispanic um, in, in the country. Um, and a lot of people, you know, always questioned, how can you win in this district if this district, you know, is 90% Hispanic, Hispanics tend to vote, um, uh, Democrat, and I said, the Democrats in South Texas are very different from Austin in New York. The people of South Texas are all about faith and family and hard work, but they have been instilled and brainwashed for decades um, that the Democrat Party is the party of the poor and the Republican Party is the party of the rich, and that you know the Republican Party doesn't want people that look like us here. Just pure lies. Uh, but people are waking up in South Texas. They're seeing the destruction of the border. They're seeing the economy um, being destroyed by this administration. They're seeing how this administration is fighting against parental rights and wanting to take away the custody of your, of your child if you don't support gender ideology. And we are very protective of our children and the nuclear family and they're they're waking up and realizing that the democrat party wants them to stay poor wants them to stay uneducated to continue controlling them and that they are not representing our conservative values and i'm very proud of the work that we did um last year in uh in 22 this was um, a district that was very difficult but we overperformed and we're going to overperform once again. This district, by the way, was a, um, a Clinton 36 in 2016. And we just kept on investing and kept on investing. But this was all organic because the first time that Republicans invested was in 22. You know, prior to that, we were out there on our own. <laughs> um, but I'm very happy that, you know, President Trump made a huge impact in South Texas in 2020. You know, he made a, a Clinton 36 into a, a Biden 15. That's 20 point gains, you know, in South Texas. And, and that's how we were able to continue making um, inroads in, in the district. And I'm, I'm hoping that with the presidential election and the work that I'm doing as well, focusing on kitchen table issues that matter to the people is what's going to win the, the souls of the people of Texas District 34 and the entire country because I have support not just from people in South Texas, I have support from people all over the, all over the United States and I'm, I'm truly grateful to all of you who are um, a part of Team Myra, so thank you. So Texas 7th Congressional District is the most culturally diverse district in Texas. It's about 72.5% people of color. So it is a minority majority district. And it's a district that we are running. It's a district that has the highest amount of African immigrants in the state of Texas. Now, if you're, if you're ever familiar with the continent of Africa, you, you agree with me that a lot of our values are very conservative in nature. For me, 
I have no idea when it became so difficult for us to be able to differentiate between who a man and a woman is. And this is how I tell them. Your mother is a woman and your father is a man. <laughs> it's as easy as that. There is no definition for that. You know, and I, and I think we, we are making a lot of inroad because it's not just a problem of the right or the left or Democrats or Republicans. It's a matter of common sense. I mean, it's a matter of common sense. Think about it. It is, it is a matter of evil versus good. And until as Christians, as believers, we become so tired and upset and, and, and we, you know what we call the, the holy anger? When Christ went to the temple and people were trading in the temple and he, he picked up a whip and whipped them out of the temple, he was not, he was not being mean or being just trying to be upset with it, but he, that was what we call holy anger. I think it's time for us as children of God to be able to rise up in holy anger against the evil that is happening in this land, and by the grace of God, we will succeed. Well, give it up for these candidates one more time. Thank you. Thank Bob, you so much. Let's give them a round of applause. Follow them on social media. Like their post. Get involved with them. Go to their website. And thank you guys so much thank for being you. here. Thank, thank you, you so much. Let's get a picture together real quick. All right, so thank you all. Thank you all for coming. Um, are you having a fun morning so far? Yeah. All right, all right. Um, so this is an honor for me. My name is Mina Kim. I'm an independent journalist from South Korea. I was one of the few that delivered the actual news to Koreans and Korean Americans during the 2020 election about President Trump. So um, that's enough of me. Today we have Tanner Roberts. Um, he's a best-selling author. He wrote two books called Dumb Politics and 101 Reasons to, 101 Tips to Become Radical Liberal. How's that? All right, so, right. and then we also have Mark Ivanio. Um, he is a Texas licensed attorney who serves as executive director of Republicans for National Renewal. And he facilitates cooperation between conservative movements internationally, especially in Europe. We also have Carrie Cheshire here, Executive Director of Texans for Strong Borders, uh, and also the President of Texas Anti-Communist League and Sixth Generation Texan. Okay, so it is so great to have you on board. Today we'll discuss um, border crisis, China, Ukraine, and how Trump has changed the GOP. Um, so let's get right into it. So let's start from home. Um, here in Texas, the U.S. is being invaded by illegal aliens every day. Recently, I've heard about the city north of Houston called Colony Ridge. Can you expound upon what's going on in Colony Ridge, Carrie? 
Yeah, so most folks have probably seen the stuff on Fox News, the, the crossings down in Eagle Pass, and seen that not only is Joe Biden refusing to secure the Texas border, but he's actually actively facilitating the invasion, that you're seeing folks come across, you're seeing Border Patrol cut the wire, you're seeing a, a, a deluge of people, over 7 million illegal aliens uh, through the Texas border uh, just since he's taken office. And why are these folks coming here? Uh, these folks are primarily coming here for jobs. They're economic migrants. Uh, they're falsely claiming asylum, but they're coming up here because they know that they can get a job. And one of the places that they're doing it is right here in Houston. Uh, and, you know, you, most companies don't require E-Verify. Sadly, uh, the Texas legislature failed to pass a bill requiring E-Verify, despite the efforts of uh, right here in Montgomery County, State Representative Steve Toth, who carried our bill on that issue. Uh, but what these people are doing is they're working and ultimately, a lot of them are settling in this place called Colony Ridge, which is about, I don't know, 20 miles east of here, uh, just outside of Cleveland. And what that development really is, is it looks more like a uh, kind of Brazilian favela, something that would be more common outside of Rio de Janeiro than something that would have any place here in the United States of America. Uh, these people are coming in and using I-10 loans. They're not citizens at all. In fact, it's advertised in Spanish as Terrenos Houston, come be a landowner in Houston, USA. Uh, and what it is is a, effectively an illegal alien colony with over 60,000 folks at it. Uh, and these people are living in squalor. Uh, there, there's bad septic, there's bad drainage. And, and what it is is effectively setting up an environmental disaster. You're flooding Houston with illegal aliens. And then when we actually get another Hurricane Harvey or something like Huffman, Spring, Kingwood, et cetera, are probably you know, more at risk of flooding because of the way this has been developed. So um, what is the biggest difference between how Trump handled the border and how Biden is handling the border in terms of what actual actions he took um, that were eff effective? Yeah, I think the, the, biggest, the biggest difference is that Trump instituted remain in Mexico and Biden has instituted come to America. Uh, w under the Trump administration, we actually saw apprehensions at the border. They said, hey, if you're going to claim asylum and you're from Honduras or El Salvador or Guatemala, maybe you fear for your life of all the stuff down there, but you've passed through six or seven countries along the way where you probably don't fear for your life and you can wait on the paperwork over there. Uh, Joe Biden actually came in and flipped that on its head. Uh, he removed Remain in Mexico. He actually also instituted the CB1 app, which is basically Uber for illegals. I didn't know, you all probably don't know about this, but if you're in Mexico, uh, you can schedule a pickup on a bus uh, as an illegal alien, and they'll come down, Border Patrol will come down and drive you up into our country. Uh, we're also seeing patriation flights of folks who are coming from Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Sri Lanka, other places flying directly into the United States uh, that Joe Biden's allowing, encouraging, and enabling. Uh, Trump had a policy of putting Americans first. I think Joe Biden's policy has been putting America's last. Right. So I've heard, I've also heard from the news that um, New York City is gearing up to pay over a billion dollars on hotels over the next three years to house illegal aliens. Um, and now New York City is being flooded with hundreds of illegal immigrants while the city is actually being flooded by the water too. So, I mean, if there's no border, there's no country, as President Trump once said. Um, so, Mark, why do so many American politicians from both parties, this actually came from the actual Twitter, twi tweet X from Elon Musk, um, why do they uh, care so much about Ukraine border, but not so much about U.S. border? Well, that's a great question, Mina. Uh, thank you very much. First, I'd like to extend a big thank you to Christian Collins and the Texas Youth Summit staff for putting on this amazing event. It's a pleasure to be here. And, and to answer your question, uh, I'm old enough to remember, I think it was about five years ago when President Trump first wanted to build a southern wall, or the wall on our southern border. Uh, the, the fake news media, the Democrats, the establishment Republicans were saying, $5 billion for a wall, that's just too much. Sorry, the Treasury cannot bear this burden. But then it came to, how about $40 billion for the border of Ukraine. Well, sure, why not? How about 40 more billion? Yes. How about 20 more billion? Of course. And so it seems like there's this concerted effort from the Uniparty to get together and fund this other wall, or this fund the border protection of another country uh, thousands of miles away. And at first I thought, well, we all know that Joe Biden and his family have corrupt dealings in Ukraine, so perhaps they, Ukraine is using that as leverage to force money, extort money out of the US. 
But then we see the Union Party also getting behind that. And so now I'm convinced that that money is being sent to Ukraine. Ukraine is washing that money, and it's ending up all over the place, whether it's with military contractors or going to FTX, uh, Sam Bankman Fried, who then donates that money to the establishment. So you're paying, you're selling out the country and its people to then have money benefit you. And what benefit does the Union Party get from protecting the southern border? Mm -hmm. Nothing personal. Sure, it benefits the people in the country, but it doesn't benefit them personally. So I think they are doing that to benefit from it personally as opposed to do their job, which is to protect the country and its people. Interesting. So um, I heard that you helped organize CPAC Hungary in Europe. Um, and you helped expand also conservative movement in Europe and help facilitating uh, the movement. Um, what is it like in Europe um, right now, and why is, what is their view on Russia-Ukraine issue in terms of them looking at America, how, how America deal with this? Sure, so uh, Western Europe seems to be of a similar position as our establishment, which is, well, yes, of course, we need to fund the war, we need to crush the Russians. Uh, of course, they don't want to actually fund it to the same extent we are, they depend on us and say, well, America should do it. It's an investment. But also, we're not going to fund that much, uh, even though it's in our backyard. Whereas countries like Ukraine are more neutral. Because first of all, they say, well, it's easy for Western Europe to say, yeah, we need to fight the Russians when they're right next to Russia and they get most of their energy from Russia. So they're in a way dependent on Russia. And so to them, there's, there's no point in having this hot war with Russia. And so they're, they're calling for peace. Uh, and actually, recently, Poland has got fed up with Zelensky. They're saying, they're portraying Zelensky as some kind of a beggar, always demanding, and he's ungrateful. And I think the whole world is starting to get up, fed up with Zelensky's too. Even the people who initially supported the war in Ukraine, uh, supported Ukraine, now they are coming around and saying, you know what, I think after $100 billion, we've had enough of this. Wow. Um, so as we have limited time today, I want to touch on a little bit of uh, President Trump's America First policy and how it has affected um, international affairs. So when President Trump, um, Trump was president, the Korean population, I'm from Korea, um, thought he was terrible because, because of how mainstream media portrays him. And because how they portray, the, uh, how they portray him is that because he, he goes for the America First agenda, that means he doesn't care about other countries, but only about America. But I mean, on the other hand, he was the only one who ever uh, tried to negotiate directly with Kim Jong-un. So there's confusion about GOP foreign policy goals globally. Um, under President Biden, um, obviously, adversaries to the U.S., China, North Korea, and Iran um, are more emboldened to act than when Trump was president, whose agenda was America first. So you would think maybe it, it would be the opposite. So my question for you, Tanner, is how is that there seems to be more world stability under President Trump than under President Biden? Yeah, absolutely. And I actually wanted to echo the same sentiments. It's amazing to see the Texas Youth Summit. I was here when it was just about 100 people inside of a small conference room. So it's really awesome to see what it's become today. So that's credit to you guys, and that's credit to everybody behind Texas Youth Summit. Um, to answer your question, uh, let's look at Ukraine. I know Mark talked about that a little bit. The fact is that we're using a lot of non-military spending to subsidize businesses, to subsidize agriculture, uh, to really prop up that economy while ours is failing, while we're regulating and taxing to death small businesses, small business owners, employees, and that really illuminates the weakness on our American first policy, which isn't even existent. So when other countries see that, where we're putting our own citizens last to the favors of other countries, one of the most corrupt countries too, in Europe, that sends a signal that they can run roughshod over the rest of the world um, and that our incompetence has no bounds, like we saw in Afghanistan, right? We saw that, what happened there. We let American troops die there, we left allies there, and we skirted out of there like cowards. It was awful. Um, we've seen it with uh, Ukraine, of course. We're going to see it with China and Taiwan. We're going to see it across the globe if we don't get this ship right and get back on an American first policy. Okay. 
Sure, um, I agree. So um, you wrote a book called Dumb Politics and 101 Tips to Become a Radical Liberal. Um, tell us about your opinions on how China is trying to make young Americans dumb through TikTok or... Uh, yeah, absolutely. So China's biggest export, it, it isn't semiconductors, it isn't uh, medicine, it isn't technology, it's dependency. That's their biggest export. They want not just the U.S., but most of the world dependent on China. And we saw that during the pandemic when we couldn't get anything. We had all supply chain shut down because uh, China was our uh, uh, biggest export. We were dependent on them. And so it's no surprise that they create a social media platform designed to just brain dead our American youth with TikTok. Um, so it's, it's, you know, I wrote in my book, Dumb Politics, to never underestimate the ignorance of the masses. And China exploited that. They know how distracted we are, how distracted we can become, and how dependent we become on useless information and useless content. They tapped into that, and that's what they're feeding us. And, you know, American uh, 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 politicians are too focused on going after American social media companies for posting true information, for, you know, posting a meme that offends the administration, for essentially doing Biden's bidding. They're focused on that. They don't care what's happening with TikTok and how much damage it's causing our youth and uh, what it's doing uh, to, you know, everything, uh, all of our youth out there. So while they're focused on that, China is just brain deading our whole population. And they're doing it with ease. Now, I know a lot of people that say, you know, uh, China uses TikTok to gather information, which they do. And unfortunately, a lot of uh, young Americans don't really care about that because, well, how does that affect me? You know, how does that, what do they need my information? I don't have anything. Well, the moment you become complacent in information, your private data getting gathered is the moment you've given up all freedom. And that's what a lot of uh, uh, American institutions have become, American youth have become, and it's what our government's allowing to happen. So, uh, yeah, that's, I think, one of the biggest problems we have right now is China's dependency, our dependency on China as one of the biggest exports of dependency. I think that is very true when it comes to not only America, but different parts of the world as well. China definitely has been trying to infiltrate into other countries and trying to make um, the country's communist countries. Um, that brings me to Mark, back to Mark. As you're the president of the Texas Anti-Communist League, um, what do you think the Texas GOP should do or American GOP should do to combat China? Well, I think it, I think it starts with recognizing that China is our greatest geopolitical threat. Uh, you, you, you see all these folks uh, run around. Mitch McConnell says the number one priority is Ukraine. Uh, the number one priority is, is the Texas border. Uh, we've got millions of illegal aliens coming across. We've got fentanyl coming across. We've got human trafficking, human smuggling. Um, you've got folks from 160 different countries uh, coming across down there. And China is weaponizing the border to bring in fentanyl, weaponizing uh, the, the entire uh, trade imbalance in the Pacific. And ultimately, you know, Do Donald Trump was the threat uh, to, to the establishment on that. Donald Trump was the threat to communism across the globe. Uh, and you saw that for him being a relentless fighter for peace, uh, for peace, sorry. Um, you know, meeting with Kim Jong-un and, and stopping a, a nuclear North Korea event was, I think, a courageous and bold and necessary action. Uh, ultimately, we have to get leaders here in Texas who adopt a muscular and unapologetic uh, tone of, of putting Americans first. We have to look after our own. The, the, what I always say is if you get on an airplane, you know, they're going to tell you during the safety administration, you know, during an event of turbulence, the cabin might lose pressure, masks will fall down, uh, secure your mask before helping others. And that's absolutely what we have to do. Uh, we have to do it to stop this country from becoming a third world country, to save it as a republic, to stop the seeds of communism and complacency that are taking root in this country and ultimately want to control the lives of every single American. That's great. Um, having the young voters on board is very important. Um, Mark and Tenor, what are your views on how GOP should, um, you know, 
approach young voters um, for, for the upcoming elections? Well, I think a lot of, there's a lot of energy in the young voters, especially um, I've seen it at events Republicans for National Renewal has hosted, the annual Christmas reception, events outside of CPAC, TPUSA, a lot of energy, but it needs to be guided. And so towards blo uh, block walking, towards becoming a precinct chair, that's how we take over the Republican Party, make it a party of the people again, make it America First Party, and you do that by getting involved first and foremost in the local party, because that's where it goes, that's where the foundation, because we are being fed candidates from the establishment, but we should be having that strong foundation and pushing forward our candidates from the grassroots, as opposed to getting our America Last candidates from the establishment. Perfect, Tanner? Yeah, absolutely, and I think one of the biggest messages that the GOP misses out on is culture. Um, we've ignored culture for a long time. It has caught up to us in what we're seeing in public schools, what we're seeing in businesses, what we're seeing across all different levels um, uh, uh, of America. And I think, you know, of course, tax policy is important. I think, of course, domestic policy is important. But we're seeing a rot of our culture. We're seeing an attack to the nuclear family. We're seeing an attack against families. We're seeing an attack against personal autonomy, personal decision making. And it's, uh, uh, I think, one of the biggest messages that resonates actually with the youth today because they are seeing it more and more, uh, more so than any kind of foreign policy, tax policy, anything like that. So the left has always done a good job on taking hold of the culture, whether it's through Hollywood, whether it's through music, whether it's through social media, celebrities, whatever it is, I think the GOP needs to focus on those issues, which I think are the biggest issues today. So as long as we do that, we have a chance to grab a hold of a generation and uh, raise them right, raise them uh, uh, to bring this country in a different direction that it's going, because other than that, right now, everybody else has a stronghold on the youth. And you guys that are here today, you guys are the exception to the rule out there. No, I mean, most uh, uh, teenagers, even most people my age, aren't going to show up to a 9 a.m. Uh, conference on uh, our country. So I think we're doing a good job of that right now. All right. So I believe our time is up already. I want to thank all the panel members for such a great insight and thoughtful discussion. And thank you all for being here. Thank you. Hi guys, that this last segment was part of our uh, 504 or 501 C4 um, Youth Texas Action. Thank you. Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Kai Bishop, and I represent White Crow Chaplaincy Service. And uh, for about 40 years, I've been in the ministry. I served as a pastor in churches. I served as a missionary on the field. And then I served as a chaplain uh, for the last 15 years at a big oil and gas company. And so everything that I did as a pastor, everything I did as a, as a missionary, I was able to do for the oil and gas company. I have to tell you that that's been the most rewarding years of my life, being able to walk into uh, business and a professional environment and bring the kingdom with me into the marketplace. The, one of the benefits that the business saw by hiring a full-time chaplain was that they were able to help, it, help a, it was able to help with retention and recruitment, it helped to build culture, it helped to build morale. It was just a great opportunity to invest in the lives of people who probably uh, never darkened the door of a church. Uh, of course, uh, it was just uh, rewarding to me in that I was engaging with people who didn't know Christ, uh, engaging, engaging with people who didn't understand the Bible, but they, had all, they all had the same thing in common. They would have someone that passed away, or they would need uh, relationship counseling, or they 
uh, were having ch uh, children, a uh, difficulty raising their children. And so I was able to step into that environment by permission of the company and offer them the help and the assistance that they needed. So one of the things about that, I would always counsel from a biblical perspective and always do counsel from a biblical perspective, but the people that I'm talking to may not know that. But I'm bringing God into every situation and introducing them, throwing breadcrumbs for them to, to come to Christ. Uh, uh, currently, <clears throat> I'm offering my services to businesses of all different sizes. I no longer work for the, the oil and gas company, but uh, I decided to do it on my own. And uh, Dub, which is a, a medical sales company, is my first client. And uh, Andrew is here representing them. He's also my bodyguard, so. <laughs> hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Andrew Beard. I am not only a small business owner here in Montgomery County, like Kai said, um, but I am on the board of the Texas Youth Foundation that puts this great event on. So thank you all so much for being a part of it. Um, and thank you all so much for spending your weekend and your time with us today. We really truly means a lot to, to all of us. Um, I wanted to give a little bit of my testimony. Uh, Kai has been my personal mentor for many years now. Um, him and I have grown deeply uh, in our faith together, and he has been a guiding light for me, um, not just professionally, but, but for per, uh, personally and spiritually as well. Uh, my business partner and I, uh, we do own a smaller business, and uh, when we uh, started you know, talking with Kai about what he did for um, the bigger companies, um, we realized that small businesses don't have a chaplain or someone that um, their employees can go and confide into um, and, and practice good mental health even. Um, and so we decided that Kai would be a great avenue for that. And so we've been implementing him for about a year now, and our employees have um, seen really great progress, not just in their own personal faith, starting their own Bible studies even, um, but uh, the production and their work uh, capacity has gone up greatly because they're just happy to be at work now. So um, if there's any small business owners in the crowd today, please go by, talk to Kai, talk, uh, go by his booth, see what he does. Um, the uh, return that you get off of um, having someone of faith um, implemented into your company, um, you know, is, is astronomical. Um, so, you know, take care of your employees, not just by giving them a paycheck twice a month. Do it by looking out for their mental health, making sure things are okay at home. Even if it's that simple, your employees come from different backgrounds, different walks of life, different upbringings. Um, and so everyone's story is different. And having someone like Kai, who is not the boss, who's not a coworker, who can pray with you, who can just be an ear or a shoulder to cry on if they need it, um, is something that really uh, will not just um, help your business, but more importantly, um, helps the lives of the people that work with you and for you. So um, please go by his booth. He's got great packages. He's got great um, opportunities for um, all the small businesses in America, uh, or in, in Montgomery County. America someday, right? Yeah, right. Uh, and, uh, and so please go by and see him. Thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Liz Willis. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. Quick background on me, um, I did a lot of television hosting and rallies and events, stuff like that. Now I'm working at a tech company. But today's panel is going to focus on the deterioration of Harris County and um, the surrounding areas. So before I begin, I want to take a moment and just introduce some, or let our panelists introduce themselves and a little bit about them. Charles. Awesome. Good morning, guys. My name is Charles Blaine. I'm originally from New Jersey, but like everyone says, I got to Texas as fast as I could. I live in Houston and I run an organization called Urban Reform. We focus primarily on local government in Houston and Harris County. So we try to get people engaged and informed about what's happening at the local level and try to get them to understand that the things that are happening at the local level are equally, if not sometimes more important than what they're seeing happening at the state and federal level. Um, we encourage people to really look at their city councils and county governments because those are the places where you have an opportunity to reform government and change what's going on every single week of the year, unlike sometimes at the state level where they are only meeting, you know, for four months every other year. So I'm gonna be encouraging you guys to get involved with your local government today. Hi, I'm Jessica Hart Steinman. I'm the General Counsel and Director of Litigation at America First Policy Institute. So America First is a think tank that's based in DC. We started after the Trump administration, actually from the Trump administration. So we have um, former cabinet members, former senior officials, 
started this think tank to further Trump policies. Um, and the Trump administration, I was a senior official at Department of Justice. I oversaw about $9 billion in funding that went towards victims of crime. And our big focus there was um, human trafficking. So we were the largest federal funders to combat human trafficking. And so like I said, I'm at America First right now, and I'm the director of litigation, so we really further and bring active litigation to um, further Trump policies and protect our Constitution. My name is Alex Mueller. I was the Republican nominee for Harris County Judge, ran against Lena Hidalgo. Uh, I spent my career in the U.S. military, was in the Army bomb squad. I'm a West Point graduate, and after that went and moved here to Houston, similar to Charles, got here as fast as I could, worked oil and gas investment banking, and most importantly, proud wife and mom of two toddlers. All right, thank you so much for being here, each of you. Now, the Biden administration is telling us that we are safer than ever before, that our economy is booming, and mainstream media is furthering those lies and wanting us to believe it. But I have these experts here today, and we're going to talk to them about the truth about what's actually going on. I'm going to start with you, Charles. Americans seem to be fleeing larger cities for more rural neighborhoods. Is this a trend that is happening here in Texas as well? Yeah, definitely. So um, when you look at urban areas as a whole across the country, just from 2020 to 2022, we saw about 2 million people leaving urban centers and moving into suburbs and exurbs, places like the Woodlands and other surrounding areas of Houston. And in Houston and Harris County, we've seen growth stagnation um, in terms of population in recent years as well. And a lot of that is attributed to the policies that we're seeing in many major urban areas, which we can talk about a little later. But we're definitely seeing that in Houston and Harris County. And a lot of that can be attributed to overall qual quality of life issues. And so if you're in a city, you're paying a lot of money to live in a city, and traditionally millennials would pay that in exchange for you know being near their friends, being near their workplace, having the amenities, living near a ballpark. But when you're starting to look at your bottom line now and you're paying to live somewhere, you have crime that's just running rampant, you have infrastructure that's breaking down, you, you look at this return and you're not getting a return on investment that you think you should be. And so we're starting to see more people move out. And you know we've, did, we've done a number of events out here um, with organizations in the woodlands and what they're now seeing is that a lot of younger families and just younger single millennials are starting to move out here as well which isn't traditionally the case i mean in the, the past the woodlands was a bedroom community for older families um, who wanted to get out of the city but we're seeing that transition now and i think we're going to continue to see that in the coming years unless we start to see some reform at at, at the urban level well, yeah, I'm seeing that in Atlanta as well, and I'm actually thinking of leaving where I am for many of those reasons. Uh, you mentioned it just a second ago, but what policies are hindering economic growth the worst that you've seen here? Yeah, I mean, one of them that, that start off is, it's, you know, we all look at our cost of living, whether that's buying a home or renting an apartment, and it's a lot of these democratic policies in our major cities, these regulatory burdens, these permitting processes, all these things that come with development that are driving up the cost of housing. And so a lot of millennials just cannot afford to get a house or can't afford to get an apartment that they would like to live in, and so they move out to an area where they can. And so that's one of the primary ones, but also just letting crime run rampant. I know Alex is gonna talk a little bit more about that, about that as we move on, but letting crime run, run rampant is something that has an economic impact and the so social and societal impact. No one wants to live in a city where you have crime just plaguing you on a day-to-day -day basis and you have homelessness and your cost of living is high and you, you know, pop a tire every time you drive down the road. It's just, it's, it's unsustainable. Thank you. Now, Jessica, I've noticed a theme amongst the Biden administration and that is overreach of power. Fortunately, lawyers like you are fighting back for our constitutional rights. Can you tell us about some recent cases where Americans are actually winning? Yeah. So I think in kind of building on what Charles said, you see the left's policies in these bigger cities, but also at the national level, we see the left really overreaching. Um, and that's what we've, you know, Liz is talking about too. So we have one case, um, we represented 36 members of the Air Force, and they were mandated by the Department of Defense to take the COVID vaccine. Um, these were healthy young men, most of them had already had COVID. So they actually had a religious liberty right to not take the vaccine. Um, on top of that, and an issue that we were just talking about is this overreach. You see the Biden administration and the Department of Defense reached in and tried to grab that power that actually is a legislative branch power. Um, so the legislator actually gets to decide in our constitution 
that power. You know, it's not given to the Department of Defense. And so we fought that case, and we had another case, too, that we actually took to the Supreme Court and won on. Um, and you see this nationally. You see the Biden administration really reaching out unconstitutionally and trying to grab power that was never delegated to them. And I think we'll, we'll talk a little bit more locally, too, but we have a, a local case. This is actually in Colorado. We have um, a 12-year-old girl and a 13-year-old girl, and they went to um, an after-school art program, which their art teacher invited to them to. They were excited, and they go there, and it's actually a program, a secret transitioning club program, nothing to do with art. Um, luckily, this is in Colorado, not here, but it doesn't mean it, you know, it isn't happening here as well. Um, the two girls went home, um, you know, told their parents, they were, one of them told her parents that she decided to transition, that um, she went through a, a really hard couple of months. The other one went home, didn't tell her parents, and um, actually tried to commit suicide. Both, luckily, are doing really well right now. But this is a kind of another overreach that we're seeing even at the local level, where actually it's, it's a parent, in our Constitution, it's a parental right that the parents decide the education of your children. It is not the government, it's not your schools, it's not your teachers, it's your parents, right? And so, and I think especially to a lot of people in this room, um, the art teacher told the kids that if you don't feel comfortable in your body, you're transgender. And I want to let everyone here know, you know, that age gap, you know, from 12 to 18, you're going to feel uncomfortable in your body. I mean, that's, you're going through so many changes. I did, you know, I think probably all of us did. Um, so if you have problems like that come up, you know, talk to your parents about it. Talk to your grandparents, your aunt and uncle, your pastor. You know, there are people to talk to about it, but don't just assume that you're going to be transgender. Um, so these are the types of cases that we're trying to push back on some of these policies that, again, you see from the left at the national level, really, you know, reaching way too far in unconstitutional authority they don't have, but even at the local level and at, you know, school districts, reaching into things that they don't need to be a part of that's, you know, part of the family life, and again, that's guaranteed by our Constitution. That's absolutely horrific, but thank you for the work that you're doing. Now I want to get over to Alex. You recently ran a campaign as Republican nominee for Harris County Judge, and it was a very tight race. You got to see local politics and experience it firsthand. What did you learn about Harris County and the importance of getting involved in state politics? Well, just would like to echo Jessica's uh, comments and sentiment. The government overreach was a very uh, decisive driving point for my decision to run. It seemed, particularly in Harris County, government was everywhere I didn't want it to be. So I had a toddler, she was forced to be masked. We had very aggressive lockdowns in Harris County. Uh, even kept mandates well past uh, what CDC recommended, which was, you know, years too long. Um, but then in the things that we did need our local government, it, particularly in the criminal justice system, that's where they could not be found. And what's so appealing on the local side is that it is immediate. Um, you don't have to wait through these long years and de uh, delays. You're talking about local entities that have multi-billion dollar budgets and are making critical decisions about those core issues that touch you every day, uh, including parental rights, where we saw actually our local government start trying to do COVID shots in the high schools when the parents didn't know. Obviously, transgender, much more serious issue, but it's that same mentality of government knows best, um, while at the same time abdicating their very core services is, do we have effective infrastructure? You know, flooding doesn't stop at the border, nor does the crime that's impacting this whole region. Uh, and those were the really exciting things to see that why these were very alarming problems, they were also very fixable. Um, and the idea that, you know, a county that people had written off as blue were able to get quite a bit of support. Um, roughly 50,000 Beto voters were willing to cross the line and say, well, I don't agree with you on all of these issues. I do trust you to fix it. And I think that's why it's so important to keep battling in these cities is you can always say, don't believe your lying eyes for so long, but it's not hard to look around regardless of what crime stats say and understand that things are inherently safe, uh, unsafe, that our infrastructure looks third world and that things are not improving despite such strong economies. Now, despite being starting off as a grassroots activist, you actually really got combated by what I call the Democrat machine. Do you mind sharing some of that experience and what Hollywood even did yeah. here in Texas? So I had a lot of Hollywood actors weigh in on my race, uh, so you can uh, help me fill in, but uh, aside from the major political uh, leaders on the Democrat, Nancy Pelosi, Hillary Clinton, Amy Schumer on the Hollywood side, 
uh, Common. Uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda. Yep, so Hamilton producer. <laughs> Uh, Jane Fonda, that was very interesting having her campaign um, against me as a combat vet telling me how I'm a threat to our country. Um, but the reason if you said like, all right, why were all of these Hollywood actors so involved, it's the idea they know that Harris County, that's that foothold, the anchor or kind of the beachhead that you need if you're going to flip Texas. And so for especially so many people in the surrounding counties, this is kind of the heart of the fight right now to keep our state red. And even if your particular county is very red, which, you know, very grateful to see what good government looks like in Montgomery County, we need you to vote like, you know, every vote is on the line because these races are getting so thin and the amount of resources that are coming in from outside of the state, um, it's really imperative that everyone that does support our cause is getting involved. Thank you. One Jessica. Jessica. We had talked about this a little bit before, too, but what we see from the left is, you know, our side is focused on the policy, and we have the right policies, but they have to bring in these Hollywood stars to kind of, you know, sp put sparkles in your eyes to kind of clear what's going on. And instead, our side focuses on the policies, and we have the right message, but they have to do this because it's not, you know, working in Houston. No, and that's very true. By the end of my race, it almost sounded like uh, my opponent was a law and order candidate, so I was very proud to have every law enforcement organization endorsing me, uh, essentially in the state. Maybe there's one we didn't find. Um, but it was a very simple solution of, you know, let's back the blue, let's give them the resources and fund the entire criminal justice system. Uh, where in Harris County, despite um, literally extra $2 billion, uh, our cases are grinding to a halt because we don't have enough detectives. Uh, rape kits are staying, waiting for six to two months to two years. I mean, that's not a functional criminal justice system. Um, but they'll, in campaign time, see public safety is our number one priority. Um, what they don't mean by that is that they're going to call sidewalks, trees as public safety spending. Um, and that's why they hide from it, because everybody knows I want to feel safe in my neighborhood. I want to res resource our law enforcement. Uh, and those are things they can't say. Um, and people also are generally in favor of lower property taxes and parental rights. And so the more that we can actually continue to articulate our policy positions, the substance behind them, you know, that's where they're vulnerable. They have to rely on the Hollywood elites uh, because they don't have policy on their side. Thank you. Now, something that I learned just from talking to you all, and I'd love to share it with the audience as well, but it's that drastic difference between Harris County and Montgomery County. You can look at the two policies next to each other and see how, you know, the party of law and order actually does work better. But as people who actually live here, I want to start with you, um, Charles. What have you seen firsthand where you see these kind of drastic differences? Yeah. Well, I'm gonna, I want to let Jess take that because she, she brought that up first. I don't want to steal your thunder. Yeah, I can. And so I actually lived in Harris County, lived in the Heights area before, and then moved up to D.C. for the Trump administration. But now we actually live here in the Woodlands. And so I would say, you know, it's just a drastic difference. And I know um, our sheriff here in Montgomery County, Sheriff Rand Henderson, will tell you that his, his people are out on the road and they'll catch a criminal near the border. And they will actually ask, am I in Harris County or am I in Montgomery County? And they're hoping that they're in... Uh, Harris County so they can get let off. And if they're in Montgomery County, they know our DA, Brett Ligon here, is going to enforce the law and they're, they're going to have to pay for their crime. Um, yeah. So I think, I mean, that just shows you the drastic difference. Our criminals even know, oh gosh, the, the policies are different out here in a conservative area. And I think to kind of just add on to what Alex and Jess was saying before was that even just the idea of what public safety is. I mean, in Harris County, during the election, they created this early childhood education program with using federal relief aid, COVID relief aid, and then framed it as public safety because they assumed that if they create an early childhood education program and they get these kids in the program 10 years down the road, they won't be committing crime. So technically, that's public safety. Whereas in Montgomery County, I think you can understand that public safety means public safety, which is probably just cops and you know people on the street. And then I think it even when you're talking about other policies that we're seeing we did I would, can you just show of hands do you have you guys heard of guaranteed basic income or, or is anyone here familiar, familiar with this okay so we've got a smattering of hands well what's interesting about this is that we're here in Texas this is something that we don't talk about very much but our state has not banned this and because we have not banned this we do have three major areas Houston Austin and San Antonio which have implemented some form or fashion of this and what this is it's a monthly stipend that they give to individuals that meet a certain you know 
set of parameters that they set out. There's no work requirement. They use your tax dollars to give it to them on a monthly basis, and it's reoccurring. And so across the country, we've seen them do this for a, for a number of different groups. In New Orleans, they're doing it for um, just youth who are, who are pre previously incarcerated. I mean, they're doing it for a number of people. But here in Texas, this is an issue that we're having now, and it's quickly growing where they're creating these programs to literally take your tax dollars and then re give it to people who fit a certain set of criteria that they deem appropriate. And I know you want to jump in with this too. Well, and, and the issue is scale too. So 4.79 million people in Harris County, we're picking a handful of lucky winners who get these benefits. So instead of doing things that can benefit, how do you help as many people as quickly as possible? Um, and I'd say that starts with investing in core services that benefit everybody. We've been picking these various social programs, all funded by one-time COVID dollars, uh, that do not have a sustainable source of funding that now several thousand families are going to get significant checks uh, without strings attached, but that's also showing in who gets selected, how, um, that we're picking the system of government winners and losers and doing it very fast and aggressively at the local level. And we call that public safety as well. Well, and I, I'd hate to not mention too, I mean, look at our, again, our national politics and the weaponization that we're seeing by the FBI. And, you know, I used to work at, again, Department of Justice, so it's just so hard for us to see this two-tier justice system we're seeing at the national level. You know, we're seeing it down here too with some of the, I think, local ethical issues in Harris County as well. Thank you, guys. Now, I also want to mention how just proud I am of each of you teenagers, I'm seeing so many audience, and that's kind of a first for me at many of the conferences I go to, this is different, and I admire you so much for being here today. Something I want to end on, we have a couple minutes left, but that's what can we do to save Harris County, and if you can, I'd like for each of us to, you know, encourage the youth and give them a little bit of information or a tip on how they can get involved so that one day we get to watch them up on stage. For me, I just want to encourage everyone, it sounds silly, but Get involved on social media if you can. I know some of it, it's not great, but some of it is, and it amplifies your voice tenfold. So whether you have five followers or 500, people are watching you, and don't be afraid to speak out, stand up for what you believe in. Yeah. Um, and, and I'd say just look for ways to be involved in your community and, and show your values and your principles through that, whether that's through volunteerism, whether that's through engaging with your neighbors and talking about the issues that matter most, learning how to debate in a constructive way so that we can articulate our values and convince other people of, of the benefits of them. And also just use whatever avenue you have to get your voice out there. So if it's showing up at city council and talking there, whether it's submitting an op-ed to your paper, even if it's a liberal paper, guess what? They're looking for people to publish. And if you don't submit anything, they're only going to publish the other side. Or it's being a citizen journalist and getting out on social media and putting your voice there. Just look for different avenues for you to get involved because it's not that hard. And the left has understands that and they take full advantage of that and I think too often we sit on the sidelines and we just complain that our, vo our voice is not heard but we miss out on these great opportunities to make it heard. Absolutely. So I have two things very different. So first, you know, as a litigator, I'm going to say we get our cases from you guys, um, from the grassroots. So like I said, the one case we have is a 12 and 13 year old and her parents. So if something's happening in your community, let us know, America First Policy, we want to keep pushing these issues, you know, here in Texas, but nationally too. And then I think for a lot of people locally, like I said, I'm here in Montgomery County, and I know Alex will talk about this too, but obviously you need to turn out to vote here in the area, but then help in Harris County too. And this is where you can spend a lot of your volunteer hours really helping races like Alex's. Thank you, Jessica. So first, yeah, just wanted to thank everyone for giving up your morning. You're now in probably the 1% of the population that would be willing to do something. So I uh, very much appreciate that effort. And what just gets startling is just how low engagement is. So we were talking about local races. City of Houston, one in five registered voters will show up to pick a mayor. So, you know, you'll be selected mayor by winning a little over 100,000 votes out of a city of over 2 million people. That's going to impact the surrounding areas. So that's the exciting part where just being willing to have these conversations, start articulating your view, like I said, your local newspapers, being willing to write and start um, expressing these policies and getting comfortable with those conversations because um, a lot of people that you might find unlikely are actually supportive of probably a lot of your beliefs. And uh, there right now is this fear culture uh, that there's only one approved me message um, and just finding those outlets where you can start to articulate your views and 
would also echo with 2024, this is gonna be one of the toughest races Texas has had. Um, but if we can show up in numbers, bank those votes early, um, can have a nice decisive win and keep Texas, Texas. All right, thank you guys for having us. Harris County is not lost and it's up to all of us to fight for it. Thank you. Live action. Live action. Live action. Live action is a pro-life group. Live action founder Lila Rose. She and her team continued to go undercover. Rose has become a sort of messenger in chief for the anti-abortion rights movement through her media company, Live Action. But Lila has no plans to stop. seen people flip from pro-choice to pro-life simply by learning what abortion actually does. We're going to answer to a holy creator who is the author of life. And we don't have the right to take that away. Ending this travesty is the greatest human rights battle we have before us. Every living human being is a human person. I was becoming known as a town abortionist. No, I, I am, am a pro-life pro advocate. It's not a normal medical procedure, I think. I didn't know they had to crush brains of something that was like the size of a hand. I'm pro-life now. Now it is the time to turn our attention as a movement to the new North Star, which is equal protection for all. How are y'all doing? Well, we'll have our next speaker in just a second, but I want to encourage you to stay connected to what we're doing here at Texas Youth Summit. How many of you have your, your phones? What all of you can do right now is go to Instagram and follow us on Instagram. How many of you can do that real quick? Awesome. I want you to stay engaged with what we're doing. So go to, your, go to Texas Youth Summit on Instagram. Give us a follow. Also, if you're on YouTube, go to Texas Youth Summit and subscribe. And you can follow us there. And this way, uh, you can watch all of the content that you may have missed when you go outside, go to the restroom, or talk to your friends, or go to the different booths. Uh, but that'll give you uh, more material that you can come back and look at later. So the goal here at Texas Youth Summit is to educate you with Judeo-Christian and conservative values. It's so important that you know why you believe what we believe. And we've talked about this. You have to understand why something is true. Don't just accept it at face value just because your teachers or whomever say so. You have so much power as young people. You have so much power. It's more likely other young people are going to listen to you than they are anyone else. You have so much power. 
And so I want to encourage you to take the time to get registered to vote here. And that's another way you can get involved. We have a booth right out there where you can register to vote. If you're in Harris County or in Montgomery County, get registered to vote. And encourage your friends to get registered to vote. Doing so will help take back our country. Are you guys fired up to be here? Well, I want to give it up for our next speaker, Yenmi Park, and she's going to speak for a bit, and then I'm going to get the privilege of interviewing her. She's done TED Talks. She's been on Joe Rogan. Uh, she talks about her story of defecting from communist North Korea. It's amazing. And she talks about her freedom here in the West and in America. We so often take it for granted our freedoms, but when we hear stories of communism like this, I'm sure it's gonna shake you to your soul. So the video is gonna play, and let's give it up and get on your feet for Yinmi Park. It really is a genuine privilege to have as my guest, Yunmi Park. The most dangerous thing that you have in your body is your tongue. Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. It's, it's not an option to fight or not. And equity is evil ideology. This is a complete evil. I recognize the patterns. This country is not that truly free anymore. If we really follow those ideologies, we're going to become like North Korea. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> Please sit down. <laughs> wow. Uh, so Houston is a very special place in my heart because when I came to America for the first time, the first place I came was actually Houston, Texas. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I still remember the day when I was getting on the plane and at the airport, crying with my mother in South Korea, I was not knowing what America was waiting for me. And I remember how anxious I was in that plane because until that moment, I wasn't really 100% sure about the things that uh, North, Korean taught, North Korean teachers taught me about America. So up until that point, my life was very different. All my life, when I was not here, but back in North Korea, I believed that Americans were bastards. Americans were monsters, cold-blooded reptiles were trying to eat North Korean people. And then I remember getting out of that plane at Houston airport, and I was like, so ready. Is this people gonna attack me right now? What's gonna happen? And then I saw this guy, and he's like hoodies, eating chips, and saying, hi, how are you? <laughs> and that is when I realized, guys, lies do not have power. Yes. <laughs> we do not need to fear lies. But what we need to fear is that right now, currently, I live in America, and actually, I became American ambassadors myself. I became American myself last year. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And I see the same playbook. It's in a way, if there's a dictator's handbook, there should be one, right? The same playbook that was played to North Korean people is happening to American people. So let's compare a few examples why I'm saying this. When I was born in North Korea, to a country that was built upon the idea of complete equality of outcomes, where everybody's equal, everybody's happy, and everything is taken care of. When I was born there in North Korea, there were 51 different classes. Governments like, divided us into three different groups. The first group is uh, tomatoes because you are red inside and you are red outside. Therefore, you are complete communist. And they are how, that's how you're in the royal class. 
The second is what we call wavering class. Government named them apples. You're red outside, but you're white inside. That means you deserve surveillance for government. But the last group is called hostile class. You're completely screwed because you're grape. You're not even red inside or outside. That, that third of the population constantly persecuted by, by the government. And this class system was not our choice. This class system determined by, by the Northern regime what our ancestors did. If my ancestor, if my great-grandfather owned the land, that means he was a landowner. Therefore, anybody who born in that bloodline, their blood is tainted. Their genetics is oppressive. So, in America, this same story is played with differently. American currently, the leftist government uses race as the same thing to divide people and control the people. Thank you. <laughs> I have a son who is uh, like he's half Caucasian, half North Korean. And then now he's learning about white privilege at his school in New York City. Even though his mother was an actual slave, his dad never owned a slave, the society asking him that he supposedly be responsible for the crimes that happened for his ancestors. Something called guilt by association, a collective crime. The first thing my mother told me as a young girl was, don't even whisper, because the birds and mice could hear me. What an irony right now, I'm standing here <laughs> speaking so loud. But in the North Korea, saying one wrong word is not just gonna kill you, it's gonna kill up to three to eight generations of your family, guys. Cancer culture is the beginning of that spectrum. That's where it begins. They might cancel you right now. They might ask you to lose your job, and then they might go your immediate family, and then your nephews or cousins, then, then your in-laws. When one of the top officials, North Korean officials, escaped to South Korea, more than 30,000 people got sent to prison camp in North Korea. Those people, a lot of them did not know that they were related to this guy who escaped. And now in America, that guilt by association is right now is happening. Your ancestors' guilt is your guilt, therefore you need to be punished. The second one is happening is redefining the words. I came to America believing that this was a promised land. And I went to Columbia University in New York City. And thinking, you know, this is a place I can grow and I can learn to think critically. And when I got there, Professors were telling me, Columbia University is a safe place. We have safe space, therefore, you cannot talk anything other than the things that we allow to you talk about. That is a complete opposite from safe space for North Korea and myself, right? And that, thank you. This is like, it's a redefinition of language. Recently, the Chicago mayor saying, instead of you calling the rioting or, or like go on the mob, we call them as a large gatherings instead. This is scary because if we governments keep doing this, have you, how many guys read the George Orwell's 1984? Yes, a lot of you. In that book, George Orwell talks about double speak. Why is it important to have a word to describe your situation? And the reason is that if you don't know the word, you don't know the concept. So for instance, guys, in North Korea, we don't have word love. We don't have word freedom. We don't have word human rights. So if somebody, nobody told you about those words, would you have known what that was? There's no way we'd know. That is why currently in America, the leftist is so obsessed on getting rid of certain words and controlling what we can say, what we cannot say. 
And thank you. <laughs> if, you if we let them keep redefining these words and push us, the end is like North Korea, where you do not even know what love is, and where you do not even know you are oppressed. The common question I get when I talk about North Korea is that often people ask me why there is no revolution in North Korea. It's been 80 years, same fat Kim dictators, three of them been running North Korea for last almost 100 years, and there hasn't been one single revolution. And they do ask, are you guys dumb? Why do you guys, why not thinking about rising up someday? And I'm like, how do you fight to be free if you know, don't know you're a slave? That's the ultimate leftist goal. They want to push you towards the point where we don't know that you are enslaved. We don't even know that we are oppressed. We think this is somehow the norm. And that is painfully the reality of Northern people. Under the same sky in the 21st century, 25 million human beings inside North Korea, not knowing that they are even Asians. In North Korea, our calendar begins when Kim Il-sung was born. That's called the Wijute One calendar year. They tell us that we are not Asians, but we are Kim Il-sung race, our dear leader's race. We have a different time zone. It's a different planet. They don't even know what the internet is, and they've never even seen a room like this, where there is electricity, where there's air conditioning, where there's a carpeting. And that could be simply our reality if we stop fighting for freedom. And that's, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Oh. I quite, I feel like by now I lived a thousand years. Um, I escaped from North Korea simply for one reason, because I was starving. I did not know the rest of the world was like this. I, with that one promise, I thought if I escape to China, I could find the rice. When I was 13 years old, in 2007, I crossed the Yalu River into China with my mother. When I got to China, the first thing that happened to me uh, was my mom being raped. And then they sold her for $65. And then they sold me over $200 because I was 13 year old, the child virgin. And the perverted human traffickers in China they love child virginity. And two years later, I was rescued by Christians from South Korea. And <laughs> thank you. <laughs> God loves all of us, for sure. <laughs> and these Christians told me there was a way for me to be free. And that's for the first time I was hearing the word free. I asked this Christian, like, what do you mean I'm going to be free? And how would you explain freedom to a North Korean 15-year-old young girl? They did the perfect job. They said, Sudi, if you go to South Korea, you can wear jeans. Because in North Korea, guys, jeans are made in America. It's a symbol of capitalism. They literally send you to prison for wearing jeans. And they said, and you can go watch K-dramas if you go to South Korea. And that's how I understood freedom. And for that, I risked my life for it. I walked across the frozen Gobi Desert into Mongolia. And eight years ago, I came to America. Thank you. <laughs> but do you know how many North Koreans made it to freedom over the last eight years? 209 of us made you to America, this promised land. Thank you. <laughs> it's a truly miracle. I don't even know why I'm here. Somehow, God chose me to be here today. But with this mission, because there are right now currently 300,000 North Korean girls 
their organs are harvested out of them right now, currently, and they were sent to brothels and get raped 500 times a day, and they die within three to six months. And these girls are sold like, like pigs right now. And with this mission, my initial goal was trying to raise awareness the brutality that North Chinese government, CCP is running this biggest holocaust that's happening in North Korea. But I faced so many challenges. There was a time one of the producers in Hollywood made, wanted to make a movie about my first book, In Order to Live. And he sent me a script based on my life story. And the script is that China was my promised land. They rescued me and they gave me refugee. And I was, I was calling this producer, are you kidding me? This is a fake news. This is not what happened. And he told me this. He's not a bad guy. He said, this is the only way we can make a movie currently in Hollywood. Even if we get the independent funding for your film, CSP is going to drop all the funding and distribution rights for other films that this studio is going to produce and in the future any movie they ever touch gonna be banned from China. That's why nobody in Hollywood can tell the truth, truth right now. So we're in a pivotal moment. We are also being lied by our own government, by our own institutions. But the good thing is, I still believe in America because we have guns. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I think, I know, people think like, oh my God, you're saying all this raving stuff. I did not even know this was a raving stuff, right? Because imagine, when government come to take your child away from you, if you're a father, are you not gonna shoot them back? If North Koreans had guns, if Hong Kongers had guns, no country ever, ever be that be completely enslaved to their government like that way. That's why when the governments want to enslave people, the first thing they come for is guns. So, thank you so much. Thank you so much, and we have a Q&A with uh, <laughs> our CEO of... Uh, Give it up for Yinmi Park. Thank you so much, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> So we've gotten to hear your story. We've gotten to learn about the, the horrors of communism. Um, what do you tell young people about having faith and grit um, to pursue something in your life, to pursue a dream, to pursue a calling, to pursue your freedom? What do you tell young people about having drive and perseverance? Uh, so many things. I have a young child myself at home, so I practice every day. First thing, you really need to learn, any, as anybody, that nothing is free in the world. Yeah. When somebody says the education should be free, healthcare should be free, housing should be free, nothing is free. How is that free? Right. Somebody have to be uh, educated to teach you. They don't get paid, that's injustice, right? And this promise is ruling so many American people right now currently, especially at Columbia. They are so entitled, they think everything should be free for them. And because of that, I do think that young people should be really get off from social media and go back and reading all the books that were written by our founding fathers. I mean, I do that myself. I do that. Like, Understanding world is a very complex thing, right? Like, how, how are we here? How our country was built? Why some countries fail? Why some countries su succeed? And one thing I really want to ask American people is that, it's like, I ask my classmates at Columbia, like, I ask them, like, why do you hate America so much? What about America that disgusts you so much that you want to dismantle the Constitution, that you want to rebuild this nation in the name of collectivism? And they say, look outside. We live in the richest city, and there are homeless people. And there are billionaires. We have inequality. And for me, it was like, what do you mean there are billionaires? You can become a billionaire? 
You can rise above if you work hard. The enemy is poverty. Enemy is a starvation. And our enemy should never be inequality. Inequality is an actual proof that America is a progressive country. And this message is being lied to young American people, and they keep believing that somehow the inequality is our evil, that we need to eliminate inequality. Wow. When you talk to people about America, and you've learned so much about America, and you contrast that with other places in the world, what does it take for people to have gratitude? I mean, what does it take for people's hearts to change? What is it you see when you speak for people to understand the, the magnitude of how blessed they are to live in America? What does it take for them, for the light to go off for them to change? I always wish if there's a magic I can do is that anybody who, who complain about America, I want to ship them to North Korea with a one-way ticket, right? <laughs> if you love... If you love socialism so much, go for it. There's a socialist paradise waiting for you right there. It's called North Korea. But I don't think that's a practical option. Remember, so many people saying they're going to immigrate to Canada when Trump was, like, became a president. None of them have left. And I think there are two groups of American people. One is actually know what's happening, that they know that socialism sucks. But they know there are people who are truly brainwashed and following this ideology. So in order to appease this group, I do think the corporations being woke is really trying to make profit out of it. So they are monetizing by being woke because it sells, right? Why Lululemon says they're the anti-racist yoga pants. Everybody in Colombia wearing Lululemon yoga pants. There's a reason for that. And but then there's a real genuine young people I see that they are brainwashed. Um, that I think is going to be up to parents. It's really, I see that failure in parents. I don't believe that it's a government job or teacher's even job to educate your children. If you cannot find a good school, you really have to find a home school. And it, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I do think that it really starts with the like, self-government. It's that if we were there for our children from the beginning and made sure they understood what it means to be free, right? what it means to live in a country that, where there's a freedom, I think we wouldn't have this generation of young people believing that America is so truly evil. So I think that we need to fix education system somehow. I don't know, it's so big beyond me, but I try my best to educate my son so he doesn't turn out to become a communist. I mean, can you imagine? <laughs> Thank you. I'll finish that sentence. You come from communist North Korea, you come to America, and then in America, leftists at the public schools teach her children, teach her child communism and promote it. Unbelievable. And these people, they have no idea. They have no idea what it's truly like. They, they read books and they think it's a good idea, but they have no idea because they've never experienced the horrors of it. Um, wow. Profound. Profound. Um, so t tell us, um, you've, you've been able to share your story in so many different places um, throughout this country. And I'm sure you've seen a lot of people that are following you now and, and paying attention to what you're saying. Um, what do you attribute uh, your success to? Uh, because obviously your message has gotten out and people are being attentive. You know, they want to follow you and they're engaged. So what do you attribute that success to? It's... <laughs> saddens me whenever I meet American people. They are so apologetic about their past. And so many of American people are guilty that, oh, sorry for our past and all colonialism, all of that. And it breaks my heart because my story, as you said, that the fact that I'm able to even go places standing on a stage or having going to even Columbia University or anything is that is a testament 
how tolerant America is, right? Like the leftists keep saying that America is racist. Look at America currently. A North Korean girl come here, not even speaking a word of English, can write two books, can do anything she wants to do. There is no systemic racism in America. <laughs> Thank you. I really hope that someday we all realize that we live in the best country in human history. It's better than winning any lottery. And that we can have a pride of this nation. It's not perfect, but not, nothing is perfect. But by far, this is the best nation that we've ever gotten as a humanity. And this is a nation give a home to any country, even Iranians, North Koreans, Cubans come here. They find home. They become Americans. And Americans embrace us. When I went to South Korea, guys, do you know why I came to America? because there was so much discrimination. South Koreans, our people, they were discriminating me because I had a Northern accent. North Koreans in South Korea cannot even get a job as a waitress because of their accent. And in America, my friends come here, they work in the nail salon and they're so grateful. They're like, they can get a job. There's no risk. They can start a business if they want. Like anybody can do something in this nation. And that's why we should be proud because this is a really home for anybody who wants to believe in the, in the principles that we stand for here. Well, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, what do you tell young people about getting involved in the conservative movement and making a difference, how can they make a difference? Uh, I think so many of these young people here are hungry and they're at this conference listening to you because they dream of stepping up, you know, being an influencer and making an impact in this, in this world and in this country. Am I right? I mean, we needed so many young people like coming out, talking about how wonderful America is. Because do you see TikTok? I mean, there are so many these youngsters. They're like they lost their mind, literally, and <laughs> trashing America, disrespecting this nation. But I think to me is that it, it's in a way it's random, as I said, or it's it's God's plan. It's however you want to put it. Nobody moves a mountain alone, right? You need to have that faith. You need to know why you're doing this mission and what you're trying to do, what you're trying to help. And if that's your calling, believe in it. Don't ever give up. And if that is the case, I know how God led me through the literally Gobi Desert. I know he can lead us all to that promised land. So I think it's keeping that faith in in the higher being, I think that's the most important thing to me, at least. Yeah. Amen. Well, let's give it up for Yanmi Park one more time. Thank you so much, everyone. Love you guys. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good morning. How many middle school kids do you know that love going to school? Mine does. Optima has been life changing for my son in sixth grade. Traditional school just wasn't working for him. He had turned from an A, B kid to D's and F's. He hated going to school and he got in trouble for not paying attention. His self esteem crumbled and for years he couldn't tell our family that he had made any new friends. Standardized testing only made things worse. Then we found Optima. Some of the changes I've noticed in my son from this past year, he is happy, like legitimately, truly happy. 
A couple of months ago on a Sunday, he asked, is there school tomorrow? I said yes, and he started celebrating. Not sarcastically, actually happy that he had to go to school the next day. He has made great friends. The time they spend together has created meaningful bonds, even though they haven't met in person yet. The social connections he has made virtually are stronger than the ones he made in a face-to-face -face environment. He loves school. When I used to ask what he liked about his day in a traditional school, he would say recess. Now he tells me things like, math was fun today because we got to fly as part of the lesson. That was an email I received from an Optima Ed parent last spring. Hello everybody, my name is Dr. Dan Sturdivant. I'm the head of school at Optima Academy Online, the world's first school of record that meets in virtual reality. I wanna tell you about Optima Ed, how we are transforming education in America, bringing school choice to thousands of American families across the country, and building a platform to deliver timeless, excellent, and virtue-centered education in Web 3.0 to American students. Over the past two decades, I have been a teacher and a coach, a department chair, an assistant principal, and a head of school. I have worked at public schools and private schools, Christian schools and secular schools, and I have taught or led in schools covering the spread of grades kindergarten through 12th. While serving in these roles, I have seen dozens of innovations, especially in educational technology, come and go. And to tell you the truth, most of them never created a real difference in how we taught or how our students learned. My frustration with these incomplete innovations drove my own research as a graduate student. And I spent several years examining schools and school data to discover what innovations would have a meaningful impact on student learning and what would make schools more efficient so they could Im innovate and implement those innovations. The short answer is that flexibility in the classroom space, including access to various locations, room to move around, and opportunity for collaboration created the most ideal learning environments. Far and away, the most common trait of efficient schools was that they prioritized strong relationships with their students and student support. It sounds too easy, but it really is that simple. Students need to be interested in what they're learning and where and how they are learning, and they need to know that they are valued and loved. These conclusions led me to Optima Ed and to VR education. VR is unique among educational innovations in that it does substantially change how we engage with our students, how we teach them, and how they demonstrate their understanding. Virtual reality is inherently social as a classroom tool. Unlike Zoom, VR allows for students to build strong relationships with their faculty and one another, and to engage in small and large group activities and discussions. I know that some of you are thinking that a school day is a long time to spend in virtual reality, but don't worry, our students are not in headsets for even the majority of a school day. They are in them for about three to four 30 minute periods for four days a week. VR learning really is that efficient. At Optima Ed, we're passionate about expanding access to our VR coursework because we support, equip, and operate schools of choice. In addition to our coursework, we offer field trips that are available to students around the world, uh, and we add more and more each month. Once students are enrolled in our coursework or our field trips, our fully accredited curriculum emphasizes what is good, true, and beautiful without shrinking from objective truth or prioritizing social trends above established fact. At Optima Ed, we believe it is our privilege and our responsibility as the first school of record in virtual reality to bring virtue into the metaverse. Especially for your generation, VR and AR will soon be used every day and we are equipping our students to lead discourse, engage and influence others, and to think critically about what they see and hear in Web3. We are proud to sponsor the Texas Youth Summit, and we hope you'll stop by our booth to say hello, to learn more, or to sign up to experience our VR field trips. Thank you for your time, and God bless. Good afternoon, guys, or late morning. I'm Jakub Boyens, excited to be with you today. We're gonna transition really quickly here into some weighted material, some weighted subject. Our organization, Jakub Boyens Ministries, fights human trafficking. 
We've been fighting human trafficking. Now we're going into our 29th year, 56 countries around the world. And you're sitting in a city, as we're sitting here right now, that is the number one city in the United States for human trafficking and the number two city in the world at the moment, with the woodlands being a particular target. So when we talk about freedom, we talk about the United States, we love talking about the Constitution, we love talking about the Bill of Rights and the First and the Second Amendment. I will tell you this, in America, the conservative movement has gotten really good at doing triage. Triage is when you go to the emergency room and someone's bleeding. We've gotten really good at triage. We're very bad in the operating theater. We're very bad as the Christian conservative movement to take the Word of God, which is a clear direction of how to solve problems, and go and find the root issue of all the things you deal with. So whether you talk about abortion, transgenderism, comprehensive sex ed in the classroom, drag queen story hour, double mastectomies for teenagers, the border that is open, trafficking through the border, homelessness, fatherlessness, the fact that 90% of the incarcerated were raised without a father. You can take any issue that was set on this stage, any, and the root issue is a nation that is veered off of its true purpose and its true identity, a nation that has lost its culture and its morality. It's a moral issue. So when we deal about sex trafficking and we go in to rescue a 13-year-old that's sold 5 to 15 times per day, forced against her will to do certain things, that is a symptom of a society that has abandoned morality, if that makes sense. So to really solve these things, to fix problems in America, we've got to go way back. We don't have to go too far back. Let's go back 90 years and look at 1933 when John Dewey signed the Humanist Manifesto that came to America and said the way for public education is the way of Joseph Stalin. I know most of you don't learn this in school, but this is our history. Your public education systems was built on Stalin's system. When he signed the Humanist Manifesto, when they drafted the penal code for the sex offense section for all things in America off of a pedophile's work called Alfred Kinsey. And then the result in 2023 is they ask you, what is a woman? The result in 2023 is we have to write legislation in Texas to prevent grown men from dancing half naked in front of children. The result is the fatherless. The result is 55% divorce in the church. The result is more than 50% of the men in the church addicted to pornography. Those things don't just happen. They happen when a culture or a nation abandons its purpose. You do understand that the Constitution of the United States was drafted for a moral people. It doesn't work for an immoral people. You're watching today has your own legislators, conservatives who are sitting on Capitol Hill or in Austin, Texas, abandon your values. Do not fight for, for liberty and justice. Do not fight for the unborn. Do not fight for the afflicted, the oppressed, the child sex traffic victim. You will not hear a single question on any of the presidential debates regarding child sex trafficking. They won't touch it. Because to touch it, you actually have to expose the root. And the fact is, it's not a Republican or a Democrat issue. This is a bipartisan issue. It's a moral issue. We arrest as many pastors and police officers as we arrest people who you think should be the pedophile. This is an abandonment of God's value on life. This nation was formed to be set apart, to be marked by God, to be a lamp on the hill, to show the rest of the world this way to righteousness, which, by the way, righteousness means the ways of God. Self-righteousness is the ways of Yaku, or the ways of you. Now let's talk about a Me Too movement. This is how I identify. This is how you should change language for me. This is how you should no longer call it pedophile, but minor attracted person, because that makes me feel more comfortable. You're in the greatest me movement of the history of mankind, where it's all about self, self-righteousness, selfishness. This nation was not set apart to become selfish. 
This nation was not set apart to have an open border where children are trafficked across the border. You may not know this. Let me share a little nugget with you. We are burying, as a nation, infants in Texas soil without their parents knowing that they're deceased. Do you understand what I'm saying? The United States of America, I don't care if you're a dolphin or a smurf or however you identify. Identify any way you want to. But you cannot have children ravagely raped and murdered by cartel and then you bury them in Texas soil and their parents who live in Guatemala, Honduras, Venezuela, maybe Turkey, don't even know that their child is alive or dead. That you bury a child with a plaque that says, Baby John Doe. No DNA. That's not America. That is not what we were set apart for. That is not what founding fathers gave their lives for, all of them. That is not what our men and women in uniform fight for every day. That is not the legacy that the baby boomers and the Xers and the early millennials should be passing down to you. So at the Texas Youth Summit, what do you do with this? You course correct, and you course correct quickly. You have to abandon all things that is not absolute truth. You cannot participate in it. This is how culture works. You cannot change a society without changing its language. It's impossible, historically. So they must change language. That's why you're seeing language change. A redefinition of freedom. A redefinition of justice. Hey, go into Walgreens and steal $930, and that's not a crime. That's a redefinition of crime. Hey, maybe Gavin Newsom, if he gets his way, which I'm sure he's going to run for president, if Gavin Newsom gets his way, then next year, January, because I've seen the bill, they're going to lower the age of consent for children to sex to age 14. And there's 13 states in the United States that's running that bill. See, when they lower the age of consent to 14, then you don't have statutory rape. All the sex trafficking laws in California disappear. But then again, this is the same guy in March 2020 who signed into executive order the comprehensive sex education into every single California public school. This is, in fact, the champion of the gender queer book, Gavin Newsom. He's the champion of the perfectly normal curriculum. He's the champion of teaching boys age 10 about consent. But we as a nation champion people who are diabolically against the Word of God. And somehow, we expect God's favor, God's hand on us. We want a fire by night and a cloud by day. We want provision. We want freedom. I'll tell you the kind of freedom most Americans strive for today. It's the freedom to do whatever they want. Charlie Kirk stood on the stage last night and he told you, freedom is not that. Freedom is to do what you ought to do. The freedom to do what is right. You just heard from someone that escaped communism. Where you don't get to do what you ought to do. You do what you're told to do, which will never be in line with the Word of God. If you think a person in the Oval Office makes a country moral, you are sadly mistaken. A person in the Oval Office can be strong in foreign policy, as President Trump was, can have executive order to fight human trafficking, as he did, can secure a border, as he did, but cannot make a man moral, cannot fix a marriage, cannot get a drug-addicted person sober. The stuff that really matters in America takes a lot of hard work because it's root issue. It's not triage. You can't fix this country by just swapping the White House. What we have done as a nation, you don't invert with policy. You know what policy is good for today? It's toilet paper. You can flush it because it's not enforced. If we rescue a 13-year-old girl in this city tonight, we have nowhere to take her in the country. Our beds are full. We don't have support. But we've got a youth that believe to take masculinity back is a good thing, and I agree with you, but you got to do it the right way. you got to do it by honoring women, by defending women, by defending virtue, by standing for justice, by standing on truth, by understanding the Word of God. <laughs> yeah.
You don't do it like Andrew Tate that says, I got three bees who make me coffee in the morning. That's not the way. Because if you do, you might as well fall into the crowd and ask, well, what is a woman? Do you understand how broken a culture is? The African tribes, I'm from South Africa. I'm an American citizen, but I'm from South Africa. I live in Dallas, Texas. I know Texas. Do you know the African tribes were laughing at America? I got phone calls from Africa. They said, you guys don't know what a woman is? Are you out of your mind? Or challenge me, please. Bring me one that was not born with a womb that can deliver a baby. It's a simple conversation. It's a one-liner. What is a woman? One that was born with a womb, and she's sacred. She's to be protected. She's to be honored. She's to be valued. She's to be defended. Because if you don't, if you break the woman like you, Hefner, did through Playboy, and all of the boys in the room, listen, let me tell you, I will go with you all day long, man. You cannot sit here today and tell me you're about Texas youth and you're about constitutional, constitutional soundness and intellectual honesty and the Word of God, but you participate in porn. You cannot. And I'm not your judge, God is, and I'm not here to ostracize you, but I'm here to tell you, you got to get help because you will not when the chips are down and the bullets are flying and you're in the middle of a war, you will not stand for justice in that moment if you are bowing to the spirit of lust because that spirit has no place in the kingdom of God and you can't cohabitate two spirits. It's either God or Satan. Make a choice. So this is, at the Texas Youth Summit, Christian, a truth moment, some truth serum. We want to fix America, start in the mirror. You want to fix culture, start in the mirror. You want to honor women, start in the mirror. You want to defend the voiceless, start in the mirror. You want sex trafficking to stop? It's so cool today to say, fight sex trafficking. 29 years of fighting sex trafficking. Do you know why? Because when I was 18, my sister was 12, and she was trafficked for six years. You have no understanding what it looks like when you look in the eyes of a 12-year-old that had been raped by so many men that they can't count. You don't understand what it looks like when you have a 31-year-old that's been sex trafficked by her own father since she was four, and he's now trafficking every one of her children, and he's protected in law enforcement in this country. You don't understand what it looks like when a woman is living under sexual abuse her whole life, trying to make it, trying to survive, and then a nation asks, well, what is a woman? It is an absolute disgusting abomination of acts going on in this country at the moment. And we engage like the other side of the conversation has any merit. Scripture says this, do not quarrel with a fool. It is foolish to ask what is a woman. When you engage in a conversation or you make a movie about it, here's what you're doing. You're giving it merit. You're giving it voice. It's like taking the face of a mass shooter and naming his name and giving him attention. You don't do that. You don't quarrel with a fool. Someone asks you, well, what is a woman? One who was born with a womb in the conversation, your point does not have merit. There's nothing to substantiate it. There's no data. There's nothing in history. Nothing in history agrees with you. The Word of God says it's an abomination, so depart from me. That's Deuteronomy 13 that says you will not walk with fools. You will not agree with them. And do not be dismayed or misled by leaders with a silver tongue. You know how many... Republicans, we would arrest today if we did a thing called discovery on their cell phones. When we go after a pedophile, we do a thing called discovery. We take all their technology, we scrape the dark web, we build a profile, we go into your DNA. Do you know how many of the people we've elected would go and be incarcerated for 30 years for child porn dis dissemination, distribution, for sexual abuse? Do you know that we have a fund in Washington, D.C to cover sexual misconduct. 
to silence it. We have a porn lobby on K Street that lobbies for child porn. They're funded with over $100 million to go knock on the doors of senators every day and pressure them to lower the age of consent, pressure them to bring child porn in, pressure them not to repeal and replace Section 230 to hold Facebook accountable for child porn or, or Instagram or TikTok. We don't have a lobby in K Street that lobbies for the sex traffic. We don't have a church in America that's willing to speak about porn. I'm going to talk OnlyFans. I can talk OnlyFans all day long. It is modern day trafficking. You don't need a pimp to be a sex slave. You can sell yourself. And they're selling themselves. And culture is celebrating it. You got absolute idiotic podcasts saying you should have a high body count because that means you have value. It is an abomination. So if you want to fix America, you fix the nuclear family. You bring fathers home. You tell men, every guy in this room, I'm going to ask you to stand in a second. You tell men in this room, you were born to hunt. I hunted for food. You've never hunted for food. None of these boys even know what that looks like. You ask kids today in kindergarten, where do chickens come from? And they say, the store. We've lost our minds. But we do politics. We do politics well. Oh, my goodness. We know how to play every four years for the White House. But we don't even look surface level as into who we elect. For the men, you're supposed to hunt. And if you don't hunt for food, then what have you hunted today? And do not tell me, woman, because I will smack you across this room. That's a good way by my hand for you to see the ER. You hunt injustice. You hunt inequality. You hunt for the afflicted to rescue them. You hunt for those who are breaking culture. You hunt for those who misrepresent you. You hunt for the politicians that don't represent your voice. You become like a mama bear as a man, and you say, show me the unjust. Show me the unrighteous. Show me where they hide in the corner. Show me who's trafficking children, who's writing policy. Do you know that we had over 144 bills in this state that were bills to protect children against predators? Those bills were struck down in Texas. We have a supermajority conservative house that is in complete disarray. The Texas House of Representatives is a debacle. It's an absolute debacle. Take me into any capital, show me the bills that went to the floor, take me straight to the bills that protect children, and I will tell you the moral state of that house. Like I can go into any one of your homes, and if there's a father or a mother, do you know we did a study? This is truth. If there's nightmares in kids in a home, if children have repeated nightmares, one of the parents watch porn. That's a fact. Why? Because it's spiritual. Sex is spiritual. It's designed by God for a husband and a wife to come together to become one. Why? Because when they're one, they're strong. When it's a three-stranded cord, husband, wife, and Jesus, they cannot be broken. That house will serve God. Those kids will not fall away. They will defend the Constitution of the United States. But what if Satan uses sex to break apart, not to unite? What if Satan gets the adults to engage in sexual immorality so they can't defend the children from it? No, no, no. So much so that in our country, the mothers drive their five-year-olds to the drag show. Because I haven't seen a five-year-old drive himself yet. But we don't want to have these conversations. We want to talk politics. We want to talk about restore America. Let's go. Come on, the land of freedom. We have abandoned morality. You will not have what you think you want. 
if you don't change your ways. That is in fact the prayer God instructs this nation to humble yourself, get on your knees, repent from your sin, turn from your wicked ways, and I will hear your prayers and heal your land. No, but we want to defund the police. Very good idea. Let's defund the police, and somehow children who are being raped by grown men will be protected. That's a brilliant idea. Do you know which groups were defunded first through defund the police? Special victims units for children. Dallas, Texas was the first. Remember, we lost six police officers in Dallas through a shooting by absolute radical criminals. Within a week... Texas lost funding for the vice unit, and for two years we had no child victims unit in Dallas, Texas, the number two sex trafficking city in the world. Does that sound like sound policy to you? Or does it sound like it's by design? Because it's by design. Because in 1933, when John Dewey signed the Humanist Manifesto, he met a guy named Fritz Belusek. Fritz Belusek came to Alfred Kinsey and said, we will sexualize America's youth. They sodomized boys six weeks old. They wrote the, the, the model for American sexuality. They birthed a Hugh Hefner, which brought porn into this country. Then we had the Lovers Love movement. And then we show up in 2023. And children are being taught things in school that you can't imagine. And moms are saying, what the heck? When, how did this happen? It's been happening. So when I dig in prayer and I ask God, you got to show me where to go. you got to show me how to fight. you got to show me how to find that child. 29 years is a long time. We've learned a lot. We've seen a lot. You give me five minutes with any man, and I will read him like a book. We have the wrong people representing us. You've got the wrong people who you think, when the chips are down at 5 o'clock, cocktail hour in Washington, D.C., you think when they walk into that hotel that they represent you. They don't. It's a uniparty. Or you would have heard Mitch McConnell or Lindsey Graham Or Kevin McCarthy, the Speaker of the House. Have you heard him talk about children being sold for sex in this country? Do you understand that we have over a half a million women and children today being sold like slaves in this country? If that doesn't move your heart, maybe you're not alive. You will not have America that you think you want if you don't fix it in your home first. So you, the youth, have to take ownership. You've got to educate yourself. Pick one thing. If it is education, then that. If it's pornography, then that, that you want to fight. If it's the fatherless, if it's the homeless, if it's the sex traffic, pick one thing. Get enough information so that you're confident enough to speak about it when it's not popular. And then speak. Start opening your mouth and speak truth. When a girl is surrounded by a pimp and two Johns and three bottom girls and she's sold over and over and over, she is the only one. Every single girl we've ever rescued or boy have told me, I had hope if God was real that he would send somebody and it kept me alive. They're the only one. We are so comfortably numb in the American church and the American conservative movement where we love to come into a room like this and we've got friends. And nobody disagrees. And then you give me a microphone and I'm going to challenge the base because I don't pander to the base because the base is addicted to porn. The base is trapped in divorce. The base is being trafficked. The base goes to church and their pastor lies to them, preaches around the gospel, doesn't tell them that sexual immorality is an abomination to God, not to be negotiated. (laughs) So when you talk about fire up the base, purify the base. Get the base to be righteous. 
Get the base to stand when no one else will. Because a man that's morally compromised will not, in the face of danger, be the only voice against the wind. He will not. He will walk away and he will condemn himself. He'll be bitter. He'll say, I should have said something. We're not talking about making war. We're talking about speaking from a position of love. Which, by the way, America has made love a God. Love is not God. God is love. So you love everybody. You are not to love everything. You're not to love actions. You're not to come into agreement with demonic actions. You can correct somebody because you love them. That's actually the instruction God gives me for my own children. If I don't love them, I won't correct them. So Mayor Adams in New York does not love his city. Do you know why? Because he arrests a pedophile and then he releases the pedophile onto the street within two hours. That's not love. That's demonic. That's the opposite of love. So, 49 seconds and counting left. Challenge hour. Not for your masculinity or your pride. And by the way, just real quick, pride is the sin that got Satan, Lucifer, kicked out of heaven with a third of the angels. And then Satan goes as an insult to America, and he names his movement Pride. And we celebrate the sin. That's not love. We're out of our minds. So, 12 seconds. We'll close with this. For the women in the room, I pray that you get to see something cool right now. If there's a guy, I'll, I'll do it. If there's a guy, a man in the room that's willing today to go stand in the mirror and say these words, do not be part of the problem, be part of the solution, and you're willing to morally return to righteousness, then I'm asking those men to stand. So here's what you're going to do, woman. You're going to find a guy that's standing when I walk off the stage, and you're going to look at him, whether he is or is not, and you're going to tell him, go hunt evil, man of God. Go hunt evil, man of God. Stand on righteousness, man of God. I actually want to highlight a guy. I didn't know he was here. You've got a legislator in Texas that I have with my own eyes and my own ears witnessed when the wind was blowing in his face, stood on the Word of God. He's the only guy that hosts worship nights and Bible studies in the Capitol. That's Representative Steve Toth in the front line. Thank you, Steve. So for the young men in my closing, if you don't know how to do it God's way, reach out to Steve Toth, a House representative in Texas, because that man needs your prayer and your support. I pray that you are the righteous. I pray that you're the defenders of freedom. And I pray that you don't just do triage, but we go to the root cause and we fix this nation. God bless you. Well, howdy. Are you guys having fun? Day two of the Texas Youth Summit 2023. Just a couple of notes. Um, if you want to get involved in Texas Youth Summit, one way that you can do so is you can scan this QR code to donate. And if you're an adult here and you want to sow into the next generation, you can also find at the check-in place, if you want to write a check or something, 
you can, you can leave your gift there and support what we're doing here at Texas Youth Summit because we're doing the hard work, the heavy lifting to change lives and educate young people with Judeo-Christian and conservative values so that they can fight for the next generation. So get involved in the political process, scan that QR code and uh, sign up and donate. Okay, well I know many of you are really excited about hearing from Senator Ted Cruz. Well, Senator Cruz has blessed us by bringing Ben Ferguson, and Ben is a, an amazing uh, radio personality, and they do the Verdict podcast together. How many of you are involved with the Verdict? Well, what you can do is you can go on Apple or on your iPhone, and subscribe to The Verdict right now. Can you guys do that right now? Can you subscribe to The Verdict on YouTube? And subscribe to it on iTunes. Subscribe right now, it's really easy. A lot of people don't want to get their news anymore from places like CNN or MSNBC or different places like that. That's a boring way and a, and a leftist way to get your news. If you want up to date in real time understanding of the news, there's nobody better than U.S. Senator Ted Cruz. If you want to understand the world, then that's the way to do it. So please subscribe on YouTube to watch the video version, but if you're in your car and you can't do that, do not do that while you're driving. Never do that. That's not allowed. Okay. Then what you got to do is just subscribe on, your, on Apple and places like that. Well, Senator Cruz is dealing with the shutdown today, and so he's going to have to tune in virtually. And, and I... Uh, I know that you wanted to see him here physically, but I know Senator Cruz and his team, they want to get him, you know, back and engaged uh, to be here physically, but Senator Cruz has no choice because it's his job. That, that's what takes him away. So, um, so this is a great way uh, to connect with him. You're going to get to ask him questions, and Ben is going to facilitate this. And so um, the verdict has over 700,000 subscribers uh, nationwide. It's syndicated and with Salem Radio. It's an amazing uh, messenger for the conservative cause. So let's give it up for The Verdict broadcast, Ben Ferguson and U.S. Senator Ted Cruz. Yes. How are you? Good, good. So I, I blame Chuck Schumer for not uh, letting Ted Cruz be here right now. You get me and you get Senator Cruz, which will be on that uh, screen in a moment. So you guys are gonna be a part of the actual podcast. This will be out. So if you like something, I'm saying this all before we start recording so you know, if you like something he says or that we say, you can cheer. It will be on that recording. Uh, if we mention somebody or something that you don't like, you can make that known with whatever you wanted to say. You get my point. Uh, we are going to introduce that we are at this summit. So when we do that, I need a very loud yell so that it will be in the audio recording as well, if that makes sense. Y'all, you, you got it? Everybody good? That's what I like to hear. All right, so hopefully we've got Senator Cruz with us. If you can throw that up on the screen, if he is, is he connected now? Let's see. I'm waiting. There he is. There we go. Ben, can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. Excellent. He always gives me an, a complex. He gets a bigger cheer every single time, and he loves it. He enjoys that moment. <laughs> When he's here, I, we walk I, I actually out. pay them regularly, Ben. <laughs> so, uh, all right, we're going to start the podcast, and I will do a real intro, and then we're going to, I want to make sure you guys yell uh, so everybody knows it, and uh, we'll get started. So here we go. Three, two, one. Welcome. It is Verdict, live on the road at the Texas Youth Summit. Ben Ferguson with you is Senator Ted Cruz. Senator, uh, I, I feel like this is a hostage video. You are in Washington, held hostage right now because of a 
looming government shutdown. We know that the president, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, one of your best friends, they're excited about this shutdown. Explain to everybody what's going to happen with a shutdown and how it's playing out. Well, for this hostage video, I will try to refrain from blinking SOS with my eyelids. But, uh, but, but I am indeed trapped in a lunatic asylum. I'm in Washington, D.C. Uh, my plan had been to be back there with you. I've been to the Texas Youth Summit multiple years. It's a fantastic gathering. Let me say to all the young men, all the young women who are there, who are standing up, who are speaking out, who are engaging and, and making a difference, making a difference in your community, making a difference in Texas, making a difference in the country. Thank you for your leadership. It, it, it is a great event. It's why I always love coming. But I'm right now stuck in D.C. because we are hours away from yet another government shutdown. And, and so if, if Congress doesn't act, and I think the chances of Congress acting are very, very low, I think it is extremely likely that we'll have a shutdown. If Congress doesn't act by midnight tonight, then at 12.01 a.m., uh, funding for the federal government will end. And I think we're likely to have an extended government shutdown. I think it's going to last a while. Let's talk about the politics of a shutdown. Each side has to have a calculation. They have these conversations, who wins, who loses, uh, and how this is going to be affecting their party. What is a shutdown? You've been through a couple of these. What are yep. your concerns? And also, there's some civility that should be in these shutdowns that certain people get paid, and yet there are good men and women that protect and defend this country who Democrats seem to be wanting to play politics with them not getting a paycheck, that really bothers me. Well, there's a constraint of two things. One, a basic constitutional principle that the federal government cannot spend money unless Congress has appropriated it. So, so what's causing this shutdown is the fiscal year, the federal fiscal year ends today, September 30th. And that's the, where the, the appropriations run out, which means you need new appropriations. They're typically three ways that, that Congress will appropriate. One, you can pass individual appropriation bills for partic particular government programs or cabinet agencies. That's, that's called regular order. That's the way it used to happen routinely. That happens very rarely now. A second way to do it is you can pass what's called an omnibus, which is basically taking a bunch of those appropriation bills, combining them all together and passing them as one gigantic multi-trillion dollar spending bill. That happens with some regularity. The third way is you can pass what's called a CR, a continuing resolution. And a continuing resolution basically just kicks the can down the road. It, it typically extends government spending for a finite period of time. So you could have a, a, a one-week CR, a two-week CR, a 30-day CR, a 90-day CR. It just depends on what the sides negotiate. If none of those get passed, and I think none of those are, are the most likely outcome today is none of them will get passed today, uh, then what happens is federal government spending stops, but federal workers who are deemed essential workers still have to go to work. So, for example, the military, if you're, if you're stationed in harm's way, the military still has to go to work because they're essential workers. Uh, air traffic controllers, everyone who wants to get on an airplane tomorrow, don't worry, you're not going to get on an airplane and discover there are no air traffic controllers and planes are just flying willy-nilly. Air traffic controllers are essential. They, they show up and go to work. And so there are thousands upon thousands of federal workers that are deemed essential who come in and go to work. But they don't get paid. They go to work, but they don't get a paycheck. Now, in the past, and, and also there are programs that are, that are mandatory programs, that are benefit programs, those programs continue. So for example, Social Security and Medicare, the checks people are getting in the mail, those checks keep coming. So, so that part, which is a big part of the federal budget, that continues automatically. What stops is discretionary federal spending that is non-essential. And, and if Congress doesn't act today, that will stop at 12.01 a.m. tonight. You, you are obviously a huge proponent of fiscal responsibility. I just pulled up on my phone the national debt clock. Right now, the national debt's at $33 trillion, $121 billion, $494 million. Debt per citizen, highest we've ever seen at $98,667 a person, but not everybody pays taxes. 
That means right now debt per U.S. taxpayer is $255,000, $353 and counting. You look at these government shutdowns and the argument is we're trying to fight for more fiscal responsibility. What do Republicans need to do? Because this is at a point where we're bankrupting not just this country, but the future of this country and the yeah. kids and the grandkids in this country. Well, look, that's exactly right. I, I think a shutdown is very, very likely because the incentives of all the players are such that it's just inevitable, that they're just crashing into each other. I think Joe Biden and Chuck Schumer both really want a shutdown. They have decided politically it's good for them to have a shutdown. Now, why is that? The reason they think it's politically good for Democrats to have a shutdown is inevitably 100 out of 100 times the media, the, the official parrots for the Democrat Party blame every shutdown on Republicans. That happens like night, night follows day, every yapping marionette in the media is going to do that. And so the Democrats are saying, hey, you know, the Biden agenda is going really badly. The border is total chaos. The economy is a mess. We don't want to talk about any of that. Let's have a shutdown instead and have all the media blaming those mean, terrible Republicans for shutting down the government. That's why I think Biden and Schumer want a shutdown. On the other hand, in the House, and this is principally a battle between House Republicans and the White House, in the House, Kevin McCarthy is the Speaker of the House, but he has just a four-vote majority. It's an incredibly narrow majority. What Biden and Schumer are demanding of McCarthy is complete and total surrender. Surrender altogether, fund every single one of our big government left-wing priorities, and if you don't, we'll shut down the government. Kevin can't give in. It is impossible for Kevin to surrender the way Schumer and Biden are demanding, because if Kevin surrenders, his speakership will be over. You will see a House Republican member file what's called a motion to vacate the chair, and he'll be voted out as speaker. And so Kevin cannot politically survive surrendering to Biden and Schumer. Given those dynamics, I don't think Schumer and Biden are gonna budge, and I don't think Kevin can give them everything they want I think we go to a shutdown. And once a shutdown happens, what happens next? Well, it ratchets up pressure. People start discovering things they're not happy about. For example, if there's a shutdown, tomorrow our national parks are closed. So maybe some of y'all were planning to go to a national park, go hiking in Yellowstone. All of that's closed when there's a government shutdown. Uh, maybe some families coming to Washington, D.C. and planning to come to the Smithsonian. If there's a shutdown, tomorrow the museums are all closed. Uh, those tend to be some of the things early on that really tick off uh, people interacting with the government. Now, the nightmare for Democrats is you have a government shutdown and the people by and large don't notice. And I'll have to say an awful lot of people, if you're not specifically using some federal asset or activity, you may notice very little is different during a government shutdown. And, and, and that's, that's a dangerous lesson. Uh, Democrats don't want the American people to learn that. That being said, the, the breadth of a shutdown varies because often Congress will have passed some appropriations. So in past shutdowns, we've always paid our military. That's what typically happens. And this week, I've gone to the Senate floor three different times trying to pay our military now. And, and in particular, I want to contrast, Ben, what, what happened this week to what happened 10 years ago. In 2013, we had a big government shutdown. I was right in the middle of that battle. That was over Obamacare. Government was shut down for 16 days, but we paid all of our active duty military. That was actually a bill that passed right at the beginning of the shutdown. It passed unanimously. So it was a Harry Reid Senate. It was a Democrat Senate, 100 to nothing, paying our military during the shutdown passed. The House, 435 to nothing, it passed unanimously, and Barack Obama signed it into law. So 10 years ago, everyone agreed, all right, if there's a shutdown battle, let's not hold our active duty military hostage. The most recent shutdown was 2019. It was the Schumer shutdown. It lasted 35 days. During those 35 days, Chuck Schumer had a showdown with Donald Trump. Schumer did not want to fund a border wall did not want to fund additional resources to secure the border. Schumer wants open borders. We had a 35-day shutdown. During that period, Congress had passed the appropriations 
for DOD, for the Department of Defense. So that meant our soldiers, our sailors, our airmen, our Marines, uh, and, and, and our Space Force members all got their paychecks. But the Coast Guard did not. The Coast Guard is not under DOD. The Coast Guard is under DHS, the Department of Homeland Security. And so for 34 days, the Coast Guard went with no paychecks. And I went back then in 2019 to the Senate floor to try to pass legislation to say, let's treat the Coast Guard fairly. Let's not discriminate against the Coast Guard. Not, let's not treat them like the red-haired stepchild of our military. They deserve to be paid just like all of the other branches of the military. And in 2019, Democrat leadership stood up and blocked it, objected to that legislation. And so Coast Guardsmen went for over a month with no paycheck. Fast forward to today. This week, Dan Sullivan, Senator from Alaska, good friend of mine, and he's, he's in the Marine Reserves. He's also a Colonel in the Marines. Dan and I went to the Senate floor to try to pass a simple, straightforward bill. First of all, to pass the bill I authored that says if you pay the, the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines, you should pay the Coast Guard too. So it was a parity bill. The Democrats stood up and objected. Pat Murray, who's chairman of the Appropriation Committee, Patty Murray, she, she objected on behalf of Schumer, and what she said is, well, I object because this doesn't mandate that we pay everyone. It just says you treat them equally. And Sullivan and I said, okay, great. So we came this week with Sullivan's bill, which is pay all of our active duty military, pay our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coast Guardsmen, Space Force Guardians, pay them all. The Democrats objected. They've objected twice, and so tomorrow, if our active duty military loses their paycheck tomorrow, it is because Democrats said two words yesterday on the Senate floor, and those two words were, I object, that killed the bill. What is your gut on, on Democrats? Do, are they going to feel the pressure to do the right thing? Because you shouldn't hold these people hostage that are protecting and serving, but my gut is they probably say no just because this makes too much sense and they want this to hurt. They want it to hurt. Um, this week, one of the arguments Patty Murray made, she said, well, gosh, I want to pay the military, but I want to pay everyone else, too. I want to pay all the federal government, and so we need to fund the entire federal government. I made clear, look, there's a 19-year-old Marine right now at the DMZ that is facing North Korean machine guns, and that's fundamentally different than an ordinary federal worker. And, and the Democrats' view is they care more about the IRS agent coming to harass small businesses and Texans they care more about the regulators trying to shut down oil and gas in Texas. Th they care more about the bureaucrats at the EPA trying to destroy jobs than they do actually the brave young men and women who defend us. And, and you know, Ben, it's worth reflecting what's changed. So listen, 10 years ago, everyone agreed on this. I pointed out repeatedly in, on the Senate floor, Patty Murray voted for this 10 years ago. Chuck Schumer voted for this 10 years ago. Dick Durbin voted for this 10 years ago. What's changed? And I'll tell you what's changed. When we had this debate on the Senate floor yesterday, I looked up in the gallery. There were no reporters, completely empty. What has changed is the corrupt corporate media has become so thoroughly corrupt that if you rely on CNN or MSNBC or ABC, CBS, NBC for your news, you have no idea that the reason our military is not going to get a paycheck tomorrow is because the Democrats decided to block it to hold them hostage. And the reason the Democrats do this is they know they'll never be questioned. I, I point out to reporters, reporters are all running up to me in the Capitol this week, and they're, and the, and they're, and they're saying, saying, do you think it's right that those terrible Republicans are going to shut down the government? And I laugh and I say, funny. How come you're not asking if I think it's right that that terrible Chuck Schumer and that terrible Joe Biden are going to shut down the government because they want to continue spending trillions of dollars we don't have. They want to continue driving inflation up to hurt people all across the country. And by the way, because they refuse to do a damn thing to secure the southern border because they want these open borders and they're willing to shut the government down on it. And I turn to reporters. I say, did you write a story? about the Democrats blocking paychecks for our military? They're all like, no. And I'm like, shut up. Why are you talking to me? <laughs> you are a parrot. You are a hack. You are a propagandist. You lie for a living. And if you want to prove me wrong, go sit down at your little typewriter and type a damn story 
about what I said and what the Democrats said so that the soldiers back in Washington state know they didn't get a paycheck tomorrow because Patty Murray objected because she thought it was politically advantageous to hold their paychecks hostage. This is why I love doing verdict, by the way, because this is the call to action. I think it's clear. Everyone needs to call their senators, their congressmen, and advocate for the pay of our men and women in military. We've had great success, Senator, with verdict changing policy. But this is one of those moments where everybody listening, everybody watching, they need to make sure they call and reach out to their congressmen and senators and say, do the right thing. Well, and, and I'll say also, right before we started recording uh, the podcast, Christian Collins came out, welcomed everyone. Christian's a good friend. I appreciate his terrific leadership. Uh, and he suggested to everyone subscribing to the podcast. And I'm, I'm going to tell you, there's actually a very easy way to do so. So, Ben, I'm relying on you to be my eyes here because I can't see the students gathered there. But, but I want to ask everyone, pull out your cell phone. Pull out your cell phone right now. Ben, are their cell phones out? They're, 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 they're listening to you. They're doing it. They got their cell phones out. Okay. Pull out your cell phone and text the word verdict, V-E-R-D-I-C-T. Text the word verdict to the number 24005. Let me give that to you again. The number is 24005. Text the word verdict to that number. What happens is you'll get a link back that you can click on the link and it'll subscribe you to this podcast. We do this podcast three days a week. We do it Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And the reason we do it is the corporate media is utterly broken. You cannot learn what is happening by watching CNN. All you can learn is the regime's talking points of what the Biden White House wants you to know. And so this podcast is designed every week. We are breaking news and explaining what's going on that you can't get anywhere else. And, and, and really what it's designed, look, you got a couple of thousand young people gathered there right now. Each of you has a circle of influence around you. You're talking to your friends and your family and, and, and you're able to be champions for liberty. But you gotta have the information, you gotta know what's happening. And so this podcast is designed to give you the tools, give you the equipment, so that when you're talking with, with your classmate or your next door neighbor, or your buddy or your boyfriend or your girlfriend, you know what the heck's going on, you know the facts, and you're able to be a whole lot more effective. Final question, Senator, for you, and this is an important one before we get to do what we both love, and that's Q&A, uh, when we do live verdict events, is there is one story that this government shutdown is going to cover up, that is the uh, impeachment inquiry to the Biden crime family and the President of the United States of America, Joe Biden, and also some shocking news this week that there was money, uh, two payments, more than a quarter million dollars in the summer of 2019. We talked about this on a previous verdict, and if you missed it, go back and listen to it, that uh, went to the Biden family, and the address used was the address of the sitting President of the United States of America now, his Delaware address. Now, what's interesting is, in Hunter Biden's own memoir, he said during that time he lived in California. We also know that in the sweetheart plea deal that Hunter Biden got, in that plea agreement, it also stated that he was living in California at the time of that wire transfer. I know the media is hoping this story gets covered up, but you combine that with this uh, impeachment inquiry that's happening. This is a very important time for truth and what's coming out against what the Bidens were doing. Look, that, that, that is exactly right. And, and we do, in addition to the podcast Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, we do a Saturday issue that is a best of week in review. And actually today's Saturday podcast focuses on one of the stories it highlights is exactly this story, that, that Hunter Biden had wired to him $250,000, a quarter million dollars, from communist China. And the home address on that wire was Joe Biden's own residence. It was daddy's residence. Now, Listen, that's not surprising. Hunter Biden has no skills. He has nothing marketable. He doesn't do anything. When's the last time you had a complex job and you said, what I really need is a crackhead? That yeah. is not what Hunter <laughs> Biden is selling. What Hunter Biden sells is daddy. Joe Biden is the product. Favors from daddy is what Hunter got paid millions and millions of dollars and tens of millions of dollars is selling favors from daddy. And, and 
By the way, at the same time that that $250,000 wire from communist China was coming with the home address of Joe Biden, Joe Biden was telling national reporters, Hunter's never gotten anything from China. He was just flat out lying. And one of the things we try to do with the podcast is walk through the actual evidence of what's going on on Biden impeachment. The podcast is walked through in chapter and verse, the specific evidence taking on, for example, the lie from Democrats and, and, and their puppets in the press that there is no, quote, direct evidence of Joe's involvement in corruption. That's a flat out lie. We explain why. Uh, one of the things we covered this week on the podcast is the evidence that broke that there were three Iranian operatives, assets being managed by the Iranian government who were working in senior positions of influence with the Biden administration, helping set national security policy for the Biden administration. You literally have people controlled by the Ayatollah and the mullahs in Iran in senior positions advising on or working on Biden's national security. Right now, there's still one of them at the Department of Defense still drawing a paycheck with a security clearance, even though that person is an Iranian asset. It's unbelievable. I want to get questions. This is something that you and I both love. Uh, and so you guys come up to these microphones, you can ask questions. I would ask you, since we are remote, keep them uh, short and concise uh, so that we can make sure that we get as many as possible in here. If you'll also state your name and where you live, uh, and Senator, we're going to do a little bit of Q&A. We'll start over there. Go ahead. Hello, my name is Chloe Castillo. I'm from San Antonio, Texas. Thank you so much for being here today, Mr. Cruz. Um, so my question for you is kind of a cultural question. With your recent pushback on Uganda regarding homosexual crimes, what are your thoughts on how the Western popular music culture actively pushes the LGBTQ agenda on our youth? Uh, look, Chloe, it's, it's, it's a great question. And there's no doubt that Hollywood and, and the entertainment media as a whole pushes a radical left-wing agenda, and that includes LGBTQ, LMNOP. I, I can't keep up with all the letters that are attached to it now, but, but they push all of that. Um, they, they push the transgender agenda. Um, they're obsessive in pushing the transgender agenda and pushing it on kids, pushing it on kids as young as they can find it. I mean, look, we recently had Target, who was exposed selling, selling uh, bathing suits uh, for, for infants and for toddlers, for little boys to tuck, to hide their genitals, to pretend to be girls. And this is, this is being marketed to two and three year olds. There is a pervasive effort to brainwash and in particular brainwash kids. I think it is incredibly dangerous. Uh, I've got a new book that is coming out next month in November. The name of the book is Unwoke, How to Defeat Cultural Marxism in America. And what the book does, it talks through every major or, or many of the major organs of society that the radical left has seized. So it starts with, with universities. It goes to K through 12 education. It goes to journalism. It goes to entertainment, music, sports. It goes to science. It goes to big tech. It goes to big business. I actually talk quite a bit about Target. Target and Bud Light together uh, that's a big chunk of, uh, of the chapter on big business because the reaction to that between Bud Light and Target, that's the first time we've seen real consequences to corporate America undermining our basic values. And so, you know, you mentioned Uganda. Uganda made it a criminal offense uh, to engage in homosexual conduct. I, I don't support that. I'm actually quite libertarian in my leanings. I think what consenting adults want to do in their own bedroom is their own damn business. And so I don't think it should be a criminal offense, whatever you choose to do in that regard. But there's a big difference between saying consenting adults can decide what to do in their own sex lives and saying that, that you want to see a, a radical agenda proselytized to, to children and, and normalized. L listen, I am I'm a Christian. Um, the Bible teaches that marriage is the union of one man and one woman. Those are my beliefs. That's, that's certainly what, what I teach and, and what I believe, and I'm not interested in, in, in having an agenda shoved down our throat. And, and I think we need to be, in, in all of these topics, we need to be happy warriors. We need to be, be, be 
saying what we believe with a smile because the other side is so angry. Let's go over here. Uh, Senator, you're going to love this. The T-shirts of the Texas Youth Summit are Don't Tread on Me, which is awesome. And our next question is coming from someone that has that T-shirt on. I love it. Well done. Hello, Senator Cruz. Um, my name is Jenna. I go to U of H here. And I work at a tax firm as a tax consultant. And the tax deadline is coming up October 18th. And I was wondering how the government shutdown is going to affect the IRS and the accounting industry regarding that deadline that's coming up. And if you could explain kind of what's going to how that's going to work. Yeah, look, that's, that's a very good question. Uh, and, and I expect that if the shutdown goes long, and it could easily go a month, the last one was 35 days in 2019, the Schumer shutdown, it could easily go a month. What it would mean as a practical matter is that much of the manpower at the IRS that would be available to assist you, that would be available to process uh, returns that would be available to answer questions, much of that manpower uh, is not going to be there. They will keep essential workers, and it's up to each agency to decide who is essential. But things like customer service almost always get deemed non-essential, and, and you end up with a significantly reduced workforce. And so you're working at a private firm. That, 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 that's going to mean that, that your clients are going to need your advice. Uh, more significantly because the IRS is going to be less available to be responsive, even less than they normally are. Let's take a question from over here. Hi, Senator Cruz. My name is Helen, and I'm from the Woodlands. My question to you is, are you in favor of the age and term limits to be elected for Senate and Congress? Thank you. Helen, thank you for that question. So, so let me break them down one at a time. You asked about age limits and term limits. Um, on age limits, the only age limit we have for the Senate is the Constitution. So the Constitution provides that you have to be 25 years old to be elected to the House of Representatives. You have to be 30 years old to be elected to the Senate. And you have to be 35 years old to be elected president. Other than that, there are currently no limits when it comes to, to serving in federal elected office. And it's one of the reasons why you see so many people in the Senate who are 142 years old. Um, I, I have joked, if you ever want to feel young, come work in the U.S. Senate because the, the median age is such that, that I have colleagues reminiscing about Eisenhower. I mean, it, it's, uh, you know, I feel like a, a sprightly young lad in the, in the body in which I serve. Um, term limits is something that, that I emphatically support. And, and so uh, I have repeatedly introduced in the Senate a constitutional amendment to mandate term limits, to limit senators, each senator to two terms, to limit each House member to three terms. Um, you know, it's interesting. Term limits was something I supported before I got to the Senate. But having seen this place firsthand now, I support it a thousand times more. Because this place is the swamp. It is corrupt. And the people who are here a long time are the worst. You get drawn in and corrupted by the swamp. And it's both parties. Look, the Democrats are bad. But for much of this spending that is bankrupting the country, we have a uniparty. We have Republican career politicians who jump in bed with the Democrats and eagerly spend trillions of dollars. And, and so term limits would be a major step to reducing that power and reducing that corruption. And it's an amazing thing if you look at term limits nationally. Over 70% of Americans support term limits. That's true among Republicans, among Democrats, and among independents. You see massive majorities supporting term limits. The one group that doesn't is career politicians in Washington. In the Senate, I have zero Democrats who support my term limits amendment. Every one of the Democrats is opposed to it. And uh, I've chaired, I, I used to be chairman of the Constitution Subcommittee, the Senate Judiciary Committee. I chaired a hearing on term limits, brought in witnesses to talk about term limits. And the reality is in the Senate, the young guys support my term limits amendments and none of the longtime career politicians do. And that's why neither Chuck Schumer nor Mitch McConnell wants term limits to get a vote on the Senate floor because they oppose it that much. So I've been fighting, but I have not been able to get it on the floor because Schumer and McConnell control what gets on the floor. Let's get a question on this side over here. Howdy, my name is Chad. I'm a sophomore 
in Houston, and I wanted to ask how Congress can give back some 10th Amendment rights to the state and people after events like 9-11 and COVID have taken it away and given it to the federal government. Look, that, that is a fantastic question. Um, if you look at the, the, the Bill of Rights and you asked about the 10th Amendment, when I was in college, I wrote my senior thesis on the 9th and 10th Amendments to the Constitution. And I'll tell you a little bit of the history of why they're written, and, and, and then I will get straight to your question. But originally, the Constitution was written, there was no Bill of Rights. Uh, it was just the Constitution itself. And then there was a debate over whether to ratify the Constitution. And the two groups, there were the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. And the Federalists were advocating the Constitution's a good idea, we should ratify it, we should have it be the organic document forming our government. The anti-federalists were arguing against it. And one of the big arguments the anti-federalists had is they said, well, there's no Bill of Rights. This is a flawed document because there's no, no provision in it protecting our fundamental liberties. Now, the federalists came back and they said, no, 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 we don't need a Bill of Rights. And the reason the federalists gave is they said, this is a government of enumerated powers. If you look at Article One, Section 8 of the Constitution, Article One establishes the Congress, the legislative function. And Article I, Section 8 specifies, it enumerates 18 specific powers that Congress has. And the argument the Federalists said is, look, we don't need to say that, that the federal government cannot violate your free speech, cannot violate your religious liberty, cannot violate your right to keep and bear arms, because there's nothing in the enumerated powers that gives the federal government the power to violate those rights. And so we've already done that by limiting the federal government's authority initially. Now, the anti-federalists came back and they had lots of arguments, one of which was, well, there's nothing to stop them from violating those rights within the enumerated power. So, for example, one of the enumerated powers is the power uh, to create and maintain post offices. Under the original Constitution, without a Bill of Rights, a government could say, the Biden administration will say, we will only transport letters from Democrats. All Republicans, we've decided, we don't want Republicans speaking anymore, so we won't, transfer their, we, we won't transport their letters. Now, if the government tried to do that today, that would obviously be an unconstitutional violation of free speech. Without a Bill of Rights, it would be permissible. I think the Anti-Federalists won that debate. So we now have a Bill of Rights. The first 10 amendments to the Constitution are the Bill of Rights. And the first eight are protecting specific rights. And then Amendments 9 and 10 both say, Amendment 9 says the enumeration of certain rights in, in the Bill of Rights shall not be construed to deny or dis disparage other rights retained by the people. The 10th Amendment says the powers not given to the federal government uh, are, are reserved to the states and to the people. Basically, the, the Ninth and Tenth Amendments restate that the Constitution is a Constitution of, of enumerated powers. In other words, they say, even though we just listed these eight Bill of Rights, we agree that the federal government probably couldn't have done any of this anyway. But we want belt and suspenders. And so the question, I think the Tenth Amendment solves an enormous number of problems in our country. I think federalism, having states decide um, and I, I would actually advise you to take a look at a center at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. It's called the Center for Tenth Amendment Studies. I, I started it. I was the first uh, director, the first leader of the Center for Tenth Amendment Studies at TPPF, and, and, and it's continued and is ongoing. I agree that a vast, we should put as much decision making, as much authority as possible at the state level or even better at the local level because it's more likely to meet the needs of the people that are being affected, and it's also more accountable. You, the citizen, are much more able to express your views and hold accountable local officials and state officials than some bureaucrat in a windowless office in Washington, D.C. Let's get a couple more questions in here on this side. Go ahead. Uh, hello, Senator Cruz. My name is Mary Melavid. I am 18 and from Magnolia, Texas. Um, it appears that Democrats have control of the elections illegally through mules and in counting ballots. How is our vote even going to matter? Is there a, play, a plan in place for 
actually having our votes count? Well, Mary, thank you for that question. It's a hugely important question. Um, you are right that voter fraud is a real problem. It, it is a persistent problem. Uh, it, it's a problem that, that has been around since, since the dawn of time, since the very first elections. I'm convinced that when the cavemen sat, got together to vote on who was going to be Grand Poobah, somebody stuffed the ballot box. That, that's just human nature, that, that we have crooks and crooks try to steal things. Um, so we need to fight against voter fraud. We need to fight to preserve voter integrity. Now, the good news is we're in Texas. And Texas, the Texas legislature has passed legislation, strong legislation, designed to prevent voter fraud. It's not perfect, it still exists, but we have tools in place to prevent voter fraud. There are things like requiring photo ID, which we do in Texas, that reduces fraud. There are things like prohibiting ballot harvesting, prohibiting paid political operatives from handling someone else's ballot. That reduces voter fraud significantly. Ballot harvesting invites voter fraud. Things like limiting mail-in ballots. In Texas, we do so only in limited circumstances, typically seniors or people with significant disabilities. But for the vast majority of Texans, the way you vote is you go vote in person. We have a two-week period of early voting, so it's actually pretty easy to vote, but you vote in person. In-person voting reduces the chances of voter fraud. I think we need to be vigilant fighting against voter fraud. I've spent 20 plus years fighting against voter fraud. At the same time, if you look nationally, they're blue states, they're purple states, that they're not gonna pass legislation to protect election integrity because the Democrats have decided they support voter fraud. It helps them, and, and it's the way the world's changed. 10 years ago, there were Democrats who would work with you on something like photo ID. There are none today because they've decided voter fraud is good for them. In blue states and purple states, they're not gonna change their laws to stop voter fraud. Here's the good news. Historically, voter fraud typically only matters at the margins. It matters in a close election. So the answer is, in those blue states and purple states, we gotta win by a big enough margin they can't steal the race from us. Now, that's not fair, it's frustrating, but the alternative is give up on our country. And I gotta tell you, there are a lot of Democrats and a lot of people in the corporate media that want all of us to give up on our country. They want conservatives to say, well, voter fraud is still there, so I'm not gonna vote to hell with it. And I'll tell you what, if we do that, that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Then our country truly is lost. And I'll point as, as, as a moment of encouragement, look no further than the state of Virginia. Virginia went for Joe Biden by 10 points. Virginia has been blue for the past decade. Biden won Virginia by 10 points. One year later, in 2021, Glenn Youngkin, who's a good friend of mine, I campaigned with Glenn Youngkin all over Virginia, spent two days barnstorming the state of Virginia with Glenn. One year after Biden was elected, Glenn Youngkin was elected as a Republican in Virginia, now Virginia had not changed a single voter integrity law. They had the same lousy election laws they had the, the year before, but a whole bunch of moms, moms who had voted for Joe Biden, got ticked off at what the schools were doing to our kids and they flipped over and voted Republican. That gives us a roadmap to what we can and I think what we have to do in this next election. Senator, it's, uh, it's always a pleasure to see people in person. I love doing these uh, verdict lies for that. Don't forget, we do this show three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, Fridays. We have our best of recap on Saturdays. Make sure you subscribe in those days in between. Download my podcast, the Ben Ferguson podcast as well. I'll keep you updated on the biggest news. I want to give a big thank you to all of you that are here. Senator, I know uh, it's a pleasure. I know you wish you were here not being held hostage in D.C., but give Senator Cruz a big round of applause. You guys are awesome. And hopefully next year we'll be back in person here. Thank you guys so much. God bless, and uh, we'll see you again soon. Thank you guys so much. You're a great audience. We really appreciate you. all have a great rest of your day.
All right. Well, while I'm sad Senator Cruz was not able to be here in person, he's doing the good work in D.C., fighting the fight. Good news is, is Riley Gaines is here in person, and she will be back after lunch. So please come back at 1 p.m. to see Riley, okay? See y'all later.
Good afternoon, everyone. How are you guys doing? Good? You guys excited to hear Riley Gaines? I hope so. I know I'm excited. Well, my name is Kaylee. I am the coordinator of the Youth Leadership School at Leadership Institute. If you haven't heard of Leadership Institute before, we are a conservative training organization that trains conservatives who want to win. So who in this room wants to be a winner? Yeah. Amazing. Well, besides offering over 54 different types of training, we have an entire staff here in Texas whose sole purpose is for you guys to be successful on your campuses, whether that's offering you opportunities to table with them on campus, start new conservative groups on campus, or provide activism kits such as a free speech ball, constitution kits, protect women's sports kits as well. Alongside that, we have our entire free speakers bureau. These are free speakers that you can bring to campus, um, covering a plethora of different topics on different issues. And we also just opened up our new Riley Gaines Center at the Leadership Institute. Yeah, pretty exciting. Awesome. So you can bring Riley Gaines to speak at your campus, or you can bring one of the other many speakers that we have within that group who would want to fight the fight of transgenderism and protecting women's sports across this nation. Now, lastly, I just want to invite all of the high school students, college students, young adults in this room to attend one of our upcoming Youth Leadership School trainings. I have two coming up, one in Raleigh, North Carolina on October 7th and 8th, and then another one on October 28th and 29th in Boston, Massachusetts. This is a two-day comprehensive activism training to train you how to be effective for candidates and causes of your choice. And I still have full travel scholarships left, so that covers the cost of round-trip flights, hotel, meals, and registration costs to attend the training. So if you're interested in meeting your Texas field representative, you can come see us out at the booth in the hallway, or you can come and get more information about the Leadership Institute training and the Youth Leadership School. Thank you guys so much, and enjoy Riley Gaines. My name is Riley Gaines and I'm an advisor for Independent Women's Voice. The NCAA intentionally and explicitly discriminated on the basis of sex. Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. Defending women's rights is not anti-anyone. Believing in biology is not bigoted. And following the science that there are only two sexes this is not hateful, it's fact. There will always be significant numbers of boys and men who would beat the best girls and women in head-to-head -head competition. Claims to the contrary are simply a denial of science. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Thank you guys. Um, I have certainly been in rooms where that is not the reception that I get. Um, so to say I'm grateful is an understatement. Um, speaking of, just a few months back I went to San Francisco State University, which was my first mistake. Um, but I went there. I had this hope that, you know, I, I knew this would be a different environment than what I'm used to in my home state of Tennessee and what you guys are used to, with I'm sure most of your home state being Texas, I knew the environment would be different, but I was naive to think that these people who would come to my event, listen to me deliver a talk very similar to what I'm going to be talking to you guys about, I was naive to think they would come with an open mind, uh, because I was met with vitriol and violence, I was ambushed, I was mobbed, I was punched by these men who were wearing dresses, which fortunately for me, their punches don't hurt that bad. Um, but really, I, I, these protesters, they ended up holding me for ransom 
for over four hours. And the police, they held the police for ransom. Um, in these hours, you know, they screamed the most awful things you could imagine. Uh, the police told me they couldn't do anything because they were scared to be seen as anything other than an ally to this community. The next day, after we eventually got out, um, the next day, the Vice President of Student Affairs at San Francisco State, Dr. Jamila Moore, she released a statement to their student body. I am so proud of our brave students for handling Riley Gaines in the manner that they did. We know how hard it can be to listen to someone who spread so much violence um, and who is so personally abhorrent as Riley Gaines herself. Just know we see you, we hear you, we love you. Here's some counseling resources that you guys can seek because of her presence on our campus. Crazy, they doubled down on what these students did to me. Not once did they say they uphold the value of freedom of speech. Not once did they say they con condemn violence against women. Um, all of that to say, I'm grateful for y'all's applause. Uh, but what's else, what else is expected in Texas? <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, and I'll just start by saying, which I'm sure you guys have been told multiple times, it's so nice to see young people uh, a lot of what I do is talking to like old men. Uh, so to see young people, it makes me as a young person super excited. Um, you might think I'm here to inspire you guys, but it's this right here that inspires me. Um, it, it relights that fire under me to remind me why we're doing this. But a little bit about me. Um, Recently graduated from University of Kentucky, where I got my degree in human health sciences and health law. Um, upon graduating, I had every intention of going to dental school. Um, I had already accepted my seat. I put my deposit down. Uh, what I wanted to do was endodontics, which is root canals, weirdly enough. Um, which I kind of justify God's calling by saying I'm still working on the root of people's problems coming out of their mouths. Um, <laughs> And kind of funnily enough, I think this is more painful than a root canal. But anyways, um, that's what I had set out to do. Um, scored in the top percentile of the dental admissions test, which is the test to get into dental school. This miserable four-hour long test, which covers, believe it or not, biology, uh, chemistry, organic chemistry, reading, math, all of the things. Scored in the top percentile, was ready to go. Um, I had also just recently, after graduating, got married to... Uh, my six foot four British husband, who now has this like super cute country accent living in Nashville. Uh, <laughs> I constantly remind him that, you know, we got our independence from them. Um, July 4th is always fun. But, anyways, all of that to say, it would have been really easy for me to essentially ride off into the sunset with the plans I had made for myself. But I realized the quickest way to make God laugh in your face is to make plans for yourself, um, because he very clearly had different plans. Um, by no means did I feel equipped for what I was doing, for what I continue to do. But I realized if he calls us, he equips us, just as he did Moses, uh, when Moses led the Israelites with, out with his staff and with Aaron, and just as he did with Joshua, with a victory over the Canaanites, and just as he did when he brought Esther before the king. Um, I saw what was at stake after experiencing what we experienced, feeling what we felt, and I thought to myself, how could I not fight for that? For my little sister, who's the Tennessee state champion for gymnastics, uh, as I said, my husband and I just got married. I can only hope that we get to have a daughter of our own one day. I can't imagine being in the position that I was in and not fighting for them. And so a little bit about how I got here. Um, I'm sure several of you have heard the story, so I'll be brief. Grew up swimming my whole life. I'm sure there's a lot of athletes in this room who, who know what that's like. Any swimmers? Oh, I see some hands. <laughs> Uh, you know what that's like. You know, started swimming when I was four, graduated when I was 22. So this means you spend 18 years of your life dedicated to your sport. Um, by the time I got to college, I thought I had worked hard before. But this was a different kind of working hard. Uh, because we were practicing six hours in the water every single day. 
uh, with three of those hours being before 8 a.m. So you practice from 5 a.m. to 8 a.m. Uh, you go to class, you come back, you practice from 1.30 to 4.30, you eat your dinner, do your homework, go to bed, do it all again the next day. Uh, so it was a lot of adjusting. Flash forward to my senior year. Actually, let me take you back to my sophomore year. We were robbed of our NCAA championships my sophomore year because COVID had hit, meaning all competitions were shut down. Um, and so, so we were robbed of an NCAA championships that way. Um, come back junior year, the COVID theatrics, the, the mandatory vaccines and the bullying and manipulation and really the emotional blackmail from our universities to tell us we had to get the vaccine uh, or else we'd be hurting people. We'd be hurting our team. You won't be able to travel with your team if you don't get the vaccine. But I understood mandatory does not mean law. Those are two different things. So I didn't get the vaccine. <laughs> As I said, they told me, I remember they sat us down before our meet against the University of Alabama, and they said, if you don't get the vaccine, Riley, you won't be able to travel with your team. I knew was, I was my university's best swimmer. So I said, okay. And of course I didn't get the vaccine, and of course I traveled with my team. It was all manipulation. But all that to say, that's when I learned to say no for myself. That's when I learned to stand up to authority figures. Um, junior year, Ultimately, this was the year that I won my first individual SEC title. Um, University of Kentucky won their first SEC team title. And I had finished seventh in the country, which I was pretty proud of, you know, to be top seven in the country. You're an All-American. It's a pretty, pretty high honor. Uh, but I knew I was capable of more. And so it was right then and there that my senior year, I had made my goal to win a national title, which would, of course, mean becoming the fastest female in the country in my respective event. And I was right on pace to do that. Um, about midway through my senior year, so about November of 2021, I was ranked third in the country behind one amazing female athlete who I knew very well. Uh, I was trailing her by maybe a few tenths, a few one hundredths of a second, because like in most sports, your top tier athletes know of each other. So I knew her very well. But the person who was ranked first in the nation, leading the country by body lengths, which is a very large margin in the sport of swimming, I had never heard of before. And this is the first time I became aware of a swimmer named Leah Thomas. And so there was a lot of red flags at the time. Keep in mind, you know, I, I didn't know who this person was. I hadn't seen a picture of this person or else it would have been a little more clear. Um, I had no idea. Lots of red flags. You know, this was a senior from University of Pennsylvania, which is not a school that historically produces fast swimmers. Um, as I mentioned, leading the country by body lengths and, and events ranging from the 100 freestyle, which is a sprint, and all of the freestyle events in between until the mile, which is long distance. And for those of you who maybe don't understand swimming, think about this in terms of your Olympic runners. That's like saying your best 200 meter runner is your best marathon runner. That doesn't happen. They're totally different systems. But again, that's what we were seeing in this person. It didn't make sense. Until an article came out. And in this article, it disclosed that Leah Thomas is formerly Will Thomas and swam three years on the men's team at University of Pennsylvania before deciding to switch to the women's team. And I was so shocked when I read this. Of course, I was shocked. But really, I, I kind of felt this sense of relief. Because I went to this database called USA Swimming where you can track people's progression. So if you were to look up my name, uh, Riley Gaines, you'd see my times from when I was eight years old all the way through college. And so I went to look up who Will Thomas was because I was curious. Was this a lateral movement? You know, was this someone who went from ranking first to now continuing to rank first amongst the women? Which is, of course, not what we saw. Uh, we saw this was a mediocre man, at best, ranking 462nd in the nation the year prior when competing against the men, to again now dominating the entire country of women. But that's why I say I felt relieved. Because I thought the NCAA would see it how I saw it, and how my parents saw it, and my teammates saw it, and how 
anyone with any amount of brain activity would probably comprehend this. But the NCAA did not see it that way. They saw nothing wrong with it. And again, keep in mind, nothing hateful, nothing even opinionated. Looking at the paper in front of us, this person went from 462nd competing against the men to now dominating the women. Uh, but it, as I said, NCAA saw nothing wrong with it. Um, about three weeks before our national championships in March of 2022, the NCAA announced that Leah Thomas's participation with the women was a non-negotiable. There was nothing we could do about it. Um, so I got to really personally witness and feel the effect that this infringement, that this injustice had on myself and my teammates and my competitors. I can wholeheartedly attest to the tears that I saw from the girls who placed ninth and 17th and missed out on being named an All-American by one place. And I can wholeheartedly attest to the extreme discomfort in the locker room when you turn around and there's a six foot four, 22 year old man fully intact with and exposing male genitalia, inches away from where you were simultaneously undressing. And I can wholeheartedly attest to the whispers because that's what they were. They were whispers of anger and frustration from these girls who just like myself had worked our entire lives to get to that meet. It's the fastest meet in the world. It's more competitive comparatively than the Olympics because the U.S. has so many fast swimmers. And so that first day, to no one's surprise, Thomas swam to a national title in the 500 freestyle, um, becoming the first man to win a Division I NCAA women's title, trailblazer, um, beating out Olympians, beating out American record holders. Guys, these were not scrubs. They're the most impressive female swimmers in the world, again, by body lengths. Even the time Thomas went in the country last year would have beat every girl in the country this year by body lengths. That next day was the 200 freestyle, which is where Thomas and I raced. We dove in the water. We swam all eight laps of freestyle. We touched the wall at the end. We get out of the water. I realized we had tied, meaning we went the exact same time down to the hundredth of a second, which is pretty rare when you're racing for a minute and 40 seconds and not even one one hundredth separated us. So we go behind the awards podium where the NCAA official looks at both Thomas and myself. Again, Thomas, who's towering over me at six foot four. I know I look tall with these heels, but I'm a mere five foot six. And this official says, great job, you two. But you tied. Uh, and we only have one trophy, so we're going to give this trophy to Leah. Sorry, Riley, but you don't get one. I was so taken aback. Isn't this everything that Title IX was passed to prevent from happening? Because we were explicitly being discriminated on the basis of our sex. And I asked the question that no one dared ask all season. Actually, we asked it. We asked it amongst ourselves in secrecy. Um, we would call our parents from our dorm rooms, shut the door behind us, hoping our roommates wouldn't hear us. Uh, we'd go to our coaches in, in private, talk to them about it. But I said, why? Why are you adamant on giving the trophy to a man in the women's 200 freestyle? Um, you know, I know we tied. I know you don't necessarily account for ties in terms of trophies, but why? what's the thought process? He didn't know what to say. They didn't give him a script of what to say. And so I actually appreciate his honesty. He looked at me, and his eyes sunk in. He, he visibly looked saddened. I can tell he didn't even believe what he was about to say. But he said, Riley, we've been advised when pictures are being taken that Leah has to have the trophy. Again, you can pose with this one, but you give your trophy back. Leah takes the trophy home. End of story. And that was the moment when I knew I was done waiting. Because up until this point, truthfully, that's what I was doing. I'd cowered. Uh, I was waiting for someone else because I thought someone else surely would stand up for us. I thought surely a coach would. I thought surely someone from the NCAA, someone with political power, someone's dad would come down there and yank this man out of our locker rooms. I thought surely someone who is supposed to be protecting us would protect us. But I remember the moment distinctly when I decided 
that I was done waiting because I'm standing on the podium holding the trophy again, the one I know I have to give back, which let me reiterate, I could have cared less about the tangible object of the trophy, okay? I'm a 12-time All-American. I have a lot of those at home. That trophy probably cost them $5 to make. I didn't care about the trophy. Um, but I remember standing on the podium, sharing this spot with a man, holding the trophy I know I have to give back, and it hit me. How in the world could we as women expect someone to stand up for us if we weren't even willing to stand up for ourselves? We had been... We were standing atop that podium and we were smiling. We were applauding. But what were we applauding? We were applauding our own erasure, our own demolition. Keep in mind, we all knew it was wrong, but we weren't willing to do anything about it. And that's when it hit me. It has to come from us, us as female athletes, us as women. We can't stand idly by and hope a knight in shining armor comes and saves us. Um, of course, again, all season, I knew it was wrong. The unfair competition, the locker room, but it wasn't until they reduced everything we had worked our entire lives for down to a photo op to validate the feelings and the identity of a male at the expense of our own, that was when I had had enough. Um, but I know I mentioned the locker room. I think it's important to hear about. Put yourselves in our position we weren't forewarned we would be sharing a locker room. No one told us. There was no prior arrangement. The only time we became aware we would be undressing, again, next to a six foot four, 22 year old male, fully intact with and exposing male parts, was when we were inches away from a six foot four, 22 year old male, fully intact with and exposing male parts, where we were simultaneously undressing. It's feelings of, it's awkward, it's embarrassing. It's uncomfortable, it's violating, but I think the best way to describe this was it was traumatic, and not even necessarily traumatic of, because of what we were forced to see or how we were forcibly exploited. It was traumatic to me to know just how easy it was for those officials and, and the people who created these guidelines to totally dismiss our rights to privacy without even a second thought, without even bare minimum forewarning us. And so I immediately left the locker room and I went up to one of the officials on the pool deck and I said, you know, what are the guidelines that allowed this? I know the guidelines for the competition, but I'm talking specifically about the locker room. And so nonchalantly, he says, oh, we actually got around this by making the locker rooms unisex. And the first thing that came to my mind, the first thing I said to him Okay, you realize by admitting you had to change the rules, you're admitting that you know Thomas isn't a woman, right? Like, you realize that. If you wholeheartedly stood by the fact that Leah Thomas was the same as the rest of us, you wouldn't have had to change the rules. But you did, so I guess thank you for admitting that. Secondly, unisex? So any man, any coach, any official, to be totally frank, any pervert who wanted to be in that space had full access, full reins, and bare minimum, we weren't even told about it. That's what that locker room looked like. And there's one more piece about this meet which I find to be incredibly interesting. And naturally, the media has done a, ter a terrible job of covering. At this same meet where we had Leah Thomas, a man who was self-identifying as a woman, uh, we had to go to training to learn how to use she, her pronouns. We were told we had to refer to this person using she, her pronouns. At this same meet, we had another athlete who was transitioning. But this was an athlete who was a female, identifying, self-identifying as a man. So at this same training where we learned how to use she, her pronouns, we were also taught how to use he, him pronouns because we were told we had to treat Izzy, who now goes by Isaac, as a man. Um, just for, to give you guys a visual, it's the finals of the 100 freestyle, the top eight swimmers in the country. And you have a six foot four man in a women's swimsuit next to a woman who's wearing only a Speedo, nothing covering her top. Um, I'm watching this and I'm like, no, this is surely the Twilight Zone. 
I'm like, I must be crazy. Like, am I the one who, like, am I missing something? But I say that to say, if we were really basing this off gender identity, like the NCAA was claiming, like the IOC, which is the International Olympic Committee, is claiming, like the Biden administration is pushing for in this new rewrite of Title IX, if we were really basing this off gender identity, then why was Izzy, now Isaac, not competing with the men? I can answer this question. <laughs> it's because Izzy, now Isaac, would never and will never be able to compete at the same level with the men. So it was the women who ultimately had both types of transitioning individuals competing in our category. That's the how, okay? But more importantly is the why. Why have I abandoned my life plans, my very secure life plans, to now stand before you guys, um, do the Senate Judiciary hearings and the Congressional hearings and testify in these different states? Um, why? And it's a question we should all be asking ourselves. Why is this happening? Myself as a Christian, I entirely see it as spiritual warfare. It's no longer a battle of good versus bad or right versus wrong. It really is moral versus evil. And I've looked that evil in the eyes in San Francisco, right here in Denton, Texas, a few, a few weeks ago. I see Michelle in the audience. She got spit on by these protesters who claim to be loving and inclusive and tolerant and accepting and welcoming and all of those different things. How was that spit, Michelle? Did you feel loved? <laughs> Glass bottles thrown. Um, again, people yelling the most profane things you could imagine. Liquids dumped on legislators who voted in favor of protecting women's sports. Um, that's evil. It's soullessness. Um, Paul warns us that we will live in a time where these spiritual battles intensify and bitter is seen as sweet, and dark is seen as light, and evil is seen as moral. And that's what we're living through. But I'll be the first to tell you, evil never becomes moral just because it's accepted and embraced by a small portion of society. <laughs> that being said, while a lot of this conversation sounds kind of grim, the most beautiful part of it is we already know who wins. Our Bible tells us who wins, and that's what keeps me grounded. That's what keeps me moving forward, full steam ahead, um, and able to look, <laughs> able to look the, the backlash and dead in the eyes. Um, but on, on a worldly note, on an earthly note, let's lay out the different pieces, okay? Have you noticed we're changing the language that we even use? and we're referring to ourselves as biological woman. I've got a problem with that. Stop it. Stop calling yourself a biological female, biological male, biological man, woman, whatever that might be, because when we do that, we're subconsciously admitting that an unbiological, there's an unbiological alternative. Um, there's not. There's man, there's woman, there's male, there's female, girl, boy, mother, father. This prefix of biological, it has to end. Um, and again, I adhered to this for a long time until I realized what I was doing because language matters. The emphasis that we put on words, it influences our behaviors and our beliefs, again, even subconsciously. I even have a problem with this, this phrase of sex reassignment surgery because you can't reassign your sex. Uh, no matter what you do, no matter what you do, and so these, these little things, it might not seem like a big deal, but it, it, we're subconsciously adhering when we use those words. Um, even Mr. Rachel Levine, a Biden appointee, openly transgender, our Secretary of Health um, for the United States, he's now referring to women as egg producers. Um, cervix havers, uterus owners, menstruators, bleeders, chest feeders, people with birthing capacities. The CDC and in peer-reviewed medical published journals, they're calling female anatomy a bonus hole. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. 
Um, so the changing of the language, the denying of objective truth, a biological reality, a biblical truth even, the silencing and the emotional blackmail, the breakdown of family, the breakdown of our faith. Uh, we used to be a country that stood by the slogan, one nation under God, and in God we trust. Um, the taking away of our freedoms, such as freedom of speech, um, taking of the guns. I imagine that probably wouldn't work well in this state. Uh, we saw how well that worked for the governor of New Mexico. Um, all of these different pieces, lay it out for what it is. It's Marxism, textbook Marxism. And I encourage, yeah. I encourage everyone to have that conversation with someone from North Korea, or Germany, or Russia, or China, or Cuba, or Venezuela, or any of those communist countries, and see, see what they say about where we are as a nation. Um, ask them how it turned out for their home country and why they fleed, because that's what we're going through, and it's a slippery slope. Um, the leaders of this country are actively taking us down, which, truth be told, I don't even think it's a, sl a slippery slope anymore. I think it's a cliff. Uh, with sharp, jagged rocks at the bottom. Um, again, not to be grim, because you people in this room are the ones who can turn it around and get us off of the slippery slope, or I guess off of the edge of the cliff where we're being pushed by our government. It's you guys. And so I'll be the first to encourage you. It is so liberating to speak the truth. You feel like a weight is off of your shoulders when you know you don't have to adhere to the guidelines or the coercion or, or the authority figures. Um, it's truly freeing. I'll very briefly talk about impact um, that's been made because there's been a lot of elbow grease in Texas um, working alongside of representatives like Representative Steve Toth, who is the, the representative of this district. He's awesome. Representative Valerie Swanson, who introduced this bill on the House side. Senator Mays Middleton, who introduced the bill on the Senate side. Of course, Governor Abbott working alongside Texas Values, um, Independent Women's Voice, a, a lot of awesome groups involved in the efforts here. Uh, but 23 states have, have now passed some sort of fairness in women's sports bill, which is great news considering just a couple years ago, only one state had. Um, so lots of work being done there at the federal level. As I mentioned, we have Title IX that is supposed to prevent discrimination on the basis of sex. Uh, but I also mentioned we have an administration in the White House who's rewriting Title IX um, to where it would now be preventing discrimination on the basis of gender identity. And so what this means in a nutshell, because it's a lot broader than just women's sports. Men can join sororities, which is already happening. Uh, men would have full access to bathrooms, locker rooms, changing spaces on campus. Men could take academic and athletic scholarships away from women. Men could be randomly housed in a dorm room with a woman. And if that young 17, 18-year-old girl goes to her administrators and complains about being housed with a man, she's guilty and charged with sexual harassment. That's what the new rewrite of Title IX would do. Uh, but doing everything we can to combat this at the federal level uh, working alongside Representative Greg Stubbe, um, who's been amazing. He introduced this Protection of Women and Girls in Sports Act on the House side, to which it passed um, entirely on party lines, meaning 219 Republicans voted in favor of protecting women and girls in sports. You're clapping too soon because that also means all 203 Democrats voted in opposition. Every single last one of them. And those are mothers. These are fathers. They have young daughters of their own. Yet you're really telling me they have no problem with a grown man undressing in their daughter's locker room? I hold on to this hope in my heart that they don't actually believe that. Because if they do, I think there's a separate conversation that needs to be had involving CPS. Because that's disgusting, it's perverse, and you're a sellout to your own child. Um, <laughs> uh, 
I just wanted to wrap up with my favorite Bible verse. Uh, my favorite Bible verse is Romans 8:18. 8, it always has been. It's for our present sufferings aren't worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. And that was my favorite when I was growing up because I applied it to swimming, if I'm being honest. Um, the sufferings, it was the practice, um, but it wasn't worth comparing to that feeling when you win or when you, you win a championship or break a record. I very much applied that verse to my life then, but that verse is still so applicable, even more so applicable to what I'm going through now. Our present sufferings aren't worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. And so, again, I appreciate you guys being here. Um, stand firm in the truth. Lift each other up. Link arms, unite. We can have this conversation, of course, in a respectful, compassionate way, but don't shy away from the conversation. And don't shy away from the truth. Um, we can't continue to do that. Um, appreciate you guys. Thank you very much for being here. I know we're going to answer some questions, um, if that's cool, with Christian. We'll give it up for Riley Gaines one more time. Well, first question, uh, maybe you didn't ask for this career. <laughs> You've just sort of found it. It's found you, but you're meeting a need. What can you tell people in general about rising to the occasion uh, to, to recognize your calling, to speak out for such a time as this? Yeah, I love that. Um, staying silent. Staying quiet, ignoring your obligations, whether that be, whether that be you're a school board member, ignoring your obligations as a teacher, um, any career path as a parent, it's how we got here. For the longest time, I had empathy towards those who, you know, would privately message me and say, thank you for doing what you're doing. Uh, I, I really can't say anything because, you know, I, I have a scholarship or, or I have endorsements and sponsorships and, or, you know, I work in corporate America. I don't want to lose my job, uh, whatever that might be. I had empathy for that because I understood the risks are there. They're very real. But then as the arrows began to, ca began to come um, more frequent by the day, I began to feel frustrated. You know, I, I was speaking for so many, being a megaphone for so many, this idea larger than myself, I'm done competing, it's not about me anymore, yet why was I the only one taking arrows? Um, and so I, I don't really have empathy for those who aren't willing to make sacrifices anymore, because silence is complicity. Um, by being silent, you're just as bad as the people who are actively advocating for this to happen. And so it's, it's all of our jobs. That being said, not everyone has to have the same role. Not everyone has to get up on a stage or go in front of a camera or, or whatever that might be. But we are a body of Christ. Um, some people are the hands. Some people are the feet. Some people are the mouths. I think I, unfortunately, have always been a mouth, which my parents loved growing up. Um, so, but, but we all have our own role and obligation in this fight. Well, you talk a lot. You talk a lot about common sense issues. It, a man is a man, a woman is a woman. Physically, biologically, but I want to ask you about the essence of being a woman. Um, because there's so many young women, young ladies here that look up to you. And so, um, you're humble and you're gracious, and yet you're bold and you're fierce. Um, what does it mean to be a woman in that way, in the essence of what is a woman of your character and your... Absolutely. As women, we typically, of course, we're acknowledging the physical differences between man and woman in this conversation, uh, but we need to acknowledge the innate 
characteristics that differ between man and woman. As women, we tend to be more apologetic and we tend to be more emotionally driven and empathetic and compassionate, which are all great things for a woman uh, in terms of motherhood, in terms of being a wife. Those are things that are necessary, but it's hurt us. Men, they tend to be more aggressive and assertive and dominant and agenic, which is, is useful in being a man in fulfilling their biblical role, which is to protect and provide. But notice, just food for thought here. That experience on the podium, how I had this realization that talking with my teammates and the girls who I shared that podium with, we knew this was wrong, yet we were still clapping and we were still smiling. Men would not put up with this, right? We saw that with Bud Light. Uh, of course, Bud Light's, I would have imagined their target audience was men, not people dressed as Audrey Hepburn. Um, the minute that men felt threatened, they pulled out. They stopped giving their money to Bud Light because they said enough is enough. And Bud Light lost $27 billion. Um, And of course, their next commercial was a big burly man on a motorcycle with a camo can. It, that's all it takes. But us as women, we're allowing these men to infiltrate into our spaces and sports and prisons and domestic violence shelters and sororities and all of these other different, different realms. And they're demanding we use our language when referring to them, and we're doing it. Men would not be put up with being called sperm producers or any other kind of name reducing them down to their biological function. It's not happening that way because men wouldn't allow it, which is, which is why it's necessary for women to be bold. Uh, yeah. That doesn't mean to totally abandon the things that make us women and awesome mothers, and again, friends, and wives, and sisters, and daughters. Don't abandon those things, but be bold. Be strong. Be courageous. Be outspoken, because your daughters are depending on it. I think we have time for one more question. You know, one thing that struck me about you, talking with you earlier, was you have the maturity at 23 of someone twice your age. And that's a credit to your character and maybe your parents too and uh, a lot of things. But um, what would you tell young people right now, and I want to add about something about your Christian faith, but what would you tell young people right now uh, the things that they need to be doing to be building character and then also um, maybe share a little bit about your, more about your Christian faith and how that guides your decisions? Absolutely. Um, the first thing I would advise young people to do as an athlete is play sports. Um, there's so much benefit to playing sports outside of athletic achievement, okay? Playing sports has given me, it's taught me the leadership and the um, resiliency, tenacity, all of those different things to do what I'm doing now, the security, the confidence. If I didn't play sports, I wouldn't of course, I wouldn't be here, but I, I wouldn't be strong enough to be here had I been faced with the same um, situation. So, of course, play sports. There was a, an Ernst & Young study, and that's to both men and women. I know this conversation very quickly gets centered around girls and women, and we often ask ourselves the question of, where are the feminists? Uh, which is a very valid question, because where are the feminists? And don't even get me started on Megan Rapinoe. Um, but I, I think on, almost just as often as we should ask we ask ourselves the question of where are the feminists, we should be asking ourselves the question of where are the men. We need strong men. And so men in the audience, whether that's parents, whether you know, you're a young man yourself, be masculine. Don't be scared to be masculine. We live in a society where we've deemed masculinity as toxic and bad and this undesirable trait for men to possess. Um, we need strong men. There's a saying, and it's hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men. Weak men create hard times. And it, of course, repeats itself throughout history. Um, I think it's pretty, pretty evident we're in the part of the process now where weak men have created hard times. 
and I don't mean the men in this room because, again, I know we're in Texas, and these aren't weak men. <laughs> um, but weak men have created hard times, so expedite this process. Parents, teach your sons masculinity, and, and men display that masculinity. Um, so, so that's my advice to the boys in the room, so you don't feel left out. <laughs> Well, let's give it up for Riley Gaines one more time. Well, howdy. You've got to stay and listen to Chad Robichaux, an amazing man, an MMA champion, a veteran of our country. He served our country, and he has an incredible life story of overcoming PTSD, and he has a ministry helping all of these other veterans overcome PTSD. He's done res rescue missions in Afghanistan uh, after the disaster pullout situation. He's done rescue missions to help so many people. And he has a new book out called Saving Aziz, and he's going to be doing a book signing right out in the foyer. So you won't want to miss this. Make sure that you hear Chad Robichaud. He's, um, he's a godly man, an amazing man, and I can't wait to introduce him. So... Get, the video will play, and he'll come out in just a second. Thank you so much. It is an honor to welcome back Chad Robichaux. And when the governments of the world failed, good people stepped up and did the right thing. Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. The reason we ended up in this position in the first place is because I believe the American people have been lied to by the mainstream media to say this pressure that we're in this long-term war. I am not pro war at all. However, when America is strong and America has a strong presence in the world, the world is a safer place, including America. How is everyone? Super pumped to be here, and, uh, and thanks, Christian, for not just having me, but putting this on. And uh, congrats to you guys for coming here. Uh, it's, it's really, I guess I'll go around the country here, so many people that are discouraged about the, the future of this country and, and, and uh, worried about you, the youth. And uh, seeing this is really encouraging for me, and I know it's encouraging to so many. I want to speak uh, in the time that I have on, on a topic that you may not expect from a MMA fighter or a special operations guy. I want to talk about the subject of fear. Uh, fear is something that I think everyone, both my generation and your generation, it struggles with every single day. And the Bible has a lot to say about fear. I want to start off with a verse uh, out of Joshua 1.9, which says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Um, during my time in the military, I, I was a force reconnaissance marine. I, uh, I tried out for what's called the JSOC Task Force, Joint Special Operations Command Task Force, and served with what I believe to be the most elite special operations unit in the world uh, at, out of Naval Special Warfare. And we uh, I had a unique job there. My job was called an AFO, Advanced Force Operator, which many people may not understand what that is. Uh, AFO is probably the closest thing in the military to being undercover. You go and you work with the local nationals, you blend in with the locals, you live with the locals, and uh, usually you work by yourself. So it's called a singleton capacity and get teamed up with one uh, local national, which for me, it was a, a Afghanistan man named Aziz. 
And Aziz and I would go way ahead of our unit uh, in, in the mountains of Afghanistan, across the border in Pakistan, to build all the targets and, and do all the infrastructure to put our assaulters on target to capture, kill bad guys. We'd be in the mountains of Afghanistan, across the border in Pakistan for weeks, uh, sometimes months, just the two of us by ourselves. And uh, I want to, and if you guys, I'm sure many of you hadn't read my book, Saving Aziz, but in the book, Saving Aziz, it really talks about Aziz being so special to me because he was my interpreter and my teammate for all eight of my deployments to Afghanistan. We did hundreds of missions, just the two of us like that. And uh, through those times, he saved my life numerous times, uh, three times specifically, but probably saved my life every day. Like, don't walk there, don't eat that, don't talk to that person. If you talk right now, they're going to kill us, so shut up. Like, he was uh, always looking out for me. One time specifically that I'd say he saved my life, he, went out, he and I were in a place called Batakut, Afghanistan. A very remote area of, of Afghanistan where conventional military forces was not allowed to operate, but special forces was. Uh, and so Aziz and I had, were spending a couple of weeks there, and our job was to build this target package to get our assaulters on target to capture or kill the guy who was number six on the list. So if Osama bin Laden was number one, this guy was number six. And uh, while we were there doing that, we, were in a, we parked in our truck in this forest, and it was really cold. I remember it, snow coming, wind blowing, and uh, the two of us got out of our truck and walked across this muddy field. And while we were across, walking across this field, I remember it like being cold, sloshing through the mud and thinking, and I was mad at disease for dragging us through the mud. And, uh, and we made it across this field, and we make it across this field, this old farmer comes up to us, Badakut's like this farming village. He tells us that the Taliban is in the area, and they're looking for a foreigner, which is me. And uh, so Aziz is like, hey, brother, we got to go. We got to get out of here. And so we start walking back across this field, and we're talking about what would happen if we get caught. We're talking about the immediate action drill we would do to get out of this open field, which is now in the military, we call it a large open danger area. We both had, uh, I had an AKS, uh, and he had an AK-47, so we both had rifles. And as we're walking, about 100 yards behind us on the road, three trucks drove by, and all three of them were flying Taliban flags. So they were bold enough to even be flying these black Taliban flags. And I remember uh, hearing them hit the brakes. They backed up just like 100 yards behind us. And as 20 or 30 of them got out the truck, uh, just the two of us, I knew we were in a bad situation. They began to yell. Uh, I remember them yelling. I couldn't understand what they were saying. They were speaking Pashtun. I spoke a little bit of Dari, the Afghanistan language at that time. Uh, but the Pashtun, I didn't really understand. But I heard the word Bosh, which in both languages means stop. And probably the only thing that stopped was my heart. And I realized, uh, you know, the situation we're in. I didn't think they would drive through that field because it was too muddy. They would have got stuck. And I knew they probably wouldn't just randomly shoot us because they didn't know who we were. So we just kept walking. And when I heard the sound of that, either that gun, went, gun fired, I don't know what I heard first, the gun fire or the crack of a bullet over your head. And I hope no one's heard this before, but you can hear the air break, that pop of the bullet whipping over your head. When I heard that, I knew we were in, you know, at that moment, if we ran, we would be killed. If we stopped, we'd probably be captured or killed. The only thing we could do is turn and fight. And so I, t I turned around, and as I turned around, the first person I saw was, the first person that my vision picked up was this Taliban fighter. He had AK-47. He was standing next to this red pickup truck by the passenger door. And uh, when I saw him, I just aimed the center mass of his chest. I fired two rounds. And when I fired those two rounds, I thought I missed him because I seen the window break behind him. But then he fell down. So I think he went back, and maybe his head hit the window. And when he fell, I was expecting... 30 guys against two, I was expecting to be a hail of gunfire and us get lit up. But uh, actually, I don't think the Taliban expected us to fight back. So they actually ran to the other side of that truck and they gave us time. I yelled at Aziz to move and we begin this drill called, that we had talked about. It's called bounding, or those might, anybody here has might have been in the military before, it's called a lateral Australian peel. And what the drill is, is I empty my weapon, and as I'm emptying my weapon, Aziz is moving. He stops and gets in position. He starts emptying his weapon, and then I start moving. And while I'm moving, I'm reloading, I go past him. And so we're bounding off of this linear danger area to get out of that area. The way this drill works is if I'm drawing, as I'm shooting, I'm drawing all the fire to me. And that's keeping the fire off of Aziz while he's moving. So he should never stop. But while I'm shooting on the third iteration, Aziz stops. And I remember thinking, like, why is he stopping? He just put himself in danger. He had saw something I didn't see. He saw an RPG, a rocket propelled grenade launcher. Uh, and being fired up from this Taliban fighter, and he stopped, exposed himself to danger, drew the fire to him away from me, and shot this guy before that rocket went off. And we, at that point, we just said, I just said, run. We ran out of that field in our truck, went back to our safe house, and we had a, like a debrief, and our command was asking us, are you guys compromised? 
can we still do the operation? As he said, we need to still stay there. And we stayed for another 10 days, and uh, our command didn't capture, they killed this, this bad guy, and the mission was a success. Uh, yeah. That's one of, one of several times Aziz saved my life, and when, when uh, I was not in the mountains with Aziz, I was back in his home. I didn't go back to base. His wife cooked us our first warm meal. I held us babies when they were born, Mashuda, Mashuda. Uh, they're family to me. So when President Biden made the announcement that we were leaving Afghanistan, I could spend up here and spend way more than my time telling you why that was a bad idea. It was a terrible idea, and America and the world became a more dangerous place because of it. I couldn't do anything about that at that time, but one thing I could do was go get my friend. And so I put together a team of about 12 Special Operations veterans, and we, get to, we went to get Aziz, his wife, and his six children. And uh, I could, there's a lot about the details of that operation that I could share with you. It's in that book. But I can tell you this. We made a decision to go get them. God burdened our hearts to do more than that, and we didn't only... Uh, get to rescue Aziz, his wife and his six kids, but ultimately we stayed uh, and we got 17,000 other people. And uh, and I, I can tell you that uh, I'm very proud of what me and my team did, but I, I will tell you that I'm not smart enough or capable enough to do that. That event was an orchestrated miracle of God. Uh, I, we said yes. Because God put a burden on our heart and God orchestrated this incredible thing that allowed us the opportunity to be there. And I was so proud to be amongst our team that participated in that effort. And when the, when the H. Kaya Airport was evacuated by our military and our military was forced to leave after 13 of our service members were, were killed at the Abbey Gate, uh, we didn't have to leave and we chose to stay. A lot of reasons we chose to stay. One was that the media in the White House was saying there was 100 Americans still there. And I was saying there was a thousand. Now we know from the Senate hearings, there was over a thousand Americans that were left there. The truth is, it doesn't matter if there was a hundred or a thousand. We don't leave one American behind ever, in, ever anywhere. That's a promise. That's a promise you should have. Uh, and that's a promise that American people have. Where I come from, we will scorch the earth, go get an American left behind. Uh, we, we did another two months in a place called Mazda Sharif, got another 5,000 people out. And then we made a decision to go into a place called the Panjir Valley where hundreds if not thousands of women and children were being moved there to cross the Panjir River to flee into a country called Tajikistan. But there was a very scary place to move women and children across. One, Afghan women can't swim. Uh, most of them are pregnant. And two, crossing the Panjir River to cross that border is ice melt water and Category 5 rapids. Not good for people who can't swim. Uh, and pregnant women in ice cold water. Uh, additionally, the Taliban was there, the Chinese military were there, the Russians were there, which was, none of that was on the news, and the Tajikistan border guard. So we needed to send a small two-man team on the other side to belt to tell them where to cross and how to cross. That's called route reconnaissance, and that's kind of my specialty of what I used to do. And so I got another uh, Force Recon Marine sniper, and we went into Tajikistan. We drove about 12 hours through the mountains, and we spent 10 days uh, doing about 90 miles of border reconnaissance and built six routes out. And every night, uh, Dennis Price and myself would uh, strip down to our underwear, don't imagine it, but we'd swim across that Panjir River into Afghanistan and help build these routes out. Um, as, I, as I said, I want to talk to you about fear. If I told you that during the time of those operations, I wasn't scared, I'd be full of it. Every single moment of those operations was not only scary, but terrifying. But on the other side of that river was something far more important than my fear. There were innocent women and the children on the other side of the river. Nine-year-old girls, as young as nine-year-old girls, gonna be sold off into sexual slavery and be raped the rest of their life because the Taliban took over. 20 million women and little girls were left behind. Yeah, it was scary, but we could not let our fear keep us from doing the right thing and helping those people. The truth is, no matter how tough you are, no matter how smart you are, no matter how much training you have to do something, you're going to face fear in life. Throughout my life in special operations, competing as a professional MMA fighter, uh, doing these humanitarian uh, operations around the world, or even standing here in front of you today, I battle with fear. Any, anybody else like you ever deal with fear? Right? Every single one of us every day deal with fear. It's part of life. It doesn't matter if you're in a war zone or the challenges of everyday life. But if you're going to be the people that God created us to be, you're going to have to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with fear. Right? The question isn't, if you're going to face fear, but when you do, how are you going to respond to it? Are you going to steady, steady your trembling knees and push forward? 
or you can let fear win. Or you can let fear paralyze you and keep you from your goals, keep you from your dreams, your maximum potential, and ultimately keep you from doing the things that God put you in this earth to do. I can't imagine what it's like for you and your generation as teens and young adults uh, to face being targeted and pressured uh, like no generation in America has ever been pressured before. Uh, positions of morality and patriotism are simply right, what's right and what's wrong, have become categorized or recategorized as political. To some of you, simply speaking up for uh, what could be culturally unpopular or anti-woke could be more scary than probably even combat. But I'm here to tell you that issues of morality are not political issues. Issues of abortion, issues of gender ideology, these aren't political topics, and don't let anybody tell you they are. These are issues of morality, and you have a right to speak up for them. <laughs> Honestly, I, I don't think it's, it's fair to you, but I'm sorry to say that life isn't always fair. And America in our future is counting on you, on your generation, to stand up for these things, to be bold and courageous to stand up. You know, the Bible uh, actually says, do not fear in some form or another 365 times. Isn't that ironic, right? 365 days in a year, one for every day of the year. The Bible says, do not fear. You think God's trying to make a point? God doesn't give us a spirit of fear. God is not the author of fear. God is love and perfect love, the Bible says, cast out all fear. So if God doesn't give us a spirit of fear, if fear does not come from him, well, where does it come from? I believe that all fear comes from Satan. It's a demonic spirit that whispers in our ears and tells us, you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, you're not capable enough, you're going to fail to keep you from doing the things that God created you to do. I believe fear is Satan's primary weapon to keep you from doing those things that God burns your heart to do. I've been accused of having some extreme hobbies. Uh, I've been doing, I'd say I've been doing martial arts since I was little. I'm still little. Uh, I've been doing it since I was five years old. I, I uh, 43 years on the wrestling mats. And uh, 20 professional MMA fights. I, there's nothing I love more than Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Like, I drive to the gym still after 43 years of doing it. I drive to the gym, and I can't wait to get there to try to choke my buddies unconscious, break each other's arms and legs. I don't know. I just love it. Uh, it's, my, it's my favorite thing to do. And I, I love scuba diving. I, and it's a four-street kind of you're di you, you dive, and I, I've stayed with it as a hobby. Even skydiving. I was a military free-fall parachutist. I still have over 600 skydives. I'm limping right now because I crashed, like, a month ago, skydiving. Like, I, I love these hobbies. One of the things I, I discovered about the hobbies I do is that when we face fear, I believe it brings us closer to God. Now, I'm not saying go get an extreme hobby to get close to God. What I'm saying is that moments of facing fear are opportunities to build our faith. Every time that I stepped in an MMA cage to fight another professional fighter, those mo that fear comes, and that's a moment to build your faith. Every time we got on a target in Afghanistan, and you're about to go through a door or into a cave to get in a gunfight with some bad guys, like in a moment, you know, maybe one, two, maybe ten seconds, a gunfight's going to happen and people are going to die. And it could be you. Those moments are opportunity to build your faith. Every time before I jump out of the airplane, stand on the edge of that door and at 15,000 feet, and you're like, ready, set, go, and you're out in the air. 15,000 feet, nothing between the earth besides air. You're going 120, maybe 200 miles an hour if you're going head down. And you get to, it's all fun, right, until you get to uh, yeah, your pull out suit and you wave off and you deploy your parachute and hopefully something good's over your head. If not, you got to do some emergency procedures. And uh, if, nothing, if everything goes wrong, you might be at seconds, three or four seconds from impacting the earth. Those moments are opportunities to build your faith. Maybe outside of those extreme environments, being sick, taking a test, having to speak up for unpopular subject amongst your peers. These are opportunities that fear could creep in. But you don't have to let, let that fear crush you or debilitate you. You could use that fear as a moment to build your faith. Faith is actually the opposite of fear. Faith is to complete and absolute trust in the living God. It's your relinquishment. It's saying, God, I can't, I can't handle this pressure. And God says we don't need to. We could actually hand it over to him. And that's what he wants us to do. In fact, fear actually manifests itself in the absence of faith. As an old uh, special operations guy and professional, retired professional fighter, I consider myself a strategist. And every time I've gotten in the battlefield of combat or in the ring, I always look at things from a strategic point. Before I, I would fight an MMA fight, I wanted all my opponent's strength and weaknesses. Before I went and fight the Taliban, 
I want to look at the history from Genghis Khan to Alexander the Great. I want to know what they're good at, what they're bad at, because I want to have a counterattack to win, because I, li I like winning. I don't not, know about you guys, but I love to win. Faith is the counterattack to Satan's weapon of fear. And if you deal with fear, whether you're a Christian or not, a believer or not, if you deal with fear, the only real counterattack to fear is faith. And faith comes through one of two things, and uh, there's no shortcut to it. Faith comes through, one, a relationship with Jesus. And two, knowing God's Word, having a knowledge of God's Word. You need to read this. You need to study it. You need to memorize it, sow it in your heart and in your mind and your soul, so that way when the enemy comes, and he will, you'll be equipped with the full armor of God. When um, I was standing on the edge of that river before we swam across one night, we were going to swim across this river, and about 100 yards this way was, two ta uh, was a Taliban check post of three Taliban soldiers on the roof. About 300 yards this way was a, a Chinese BMP, a mechanized vehicle with a PKM machine gun and a giant spotlight for people swimming across the river. But we had to swim across because these women and children needed to cross right there. And, and, and uh, it was pretty scary. We swam right between those. And I was just dealing with that fear. And I remember thinking in that moment that I just needed to get alone and pray. I didn't have my Bible with me. I couldn't pick it up or read it. Uh, I didn't, you don't bring your Bible to that part of the world. And I, I just went out of my memory because I had sown it on my heart and soul. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures and he leads me besides quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. And he guides me in the right path for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil because he is with me. His rod and his staff, they comfort me. And he prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemies. He anoints my head with oil and my cup overflows. And surely his goodness and love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I prayed that prayer. I had this tremendous peace came, come over me, and Dennis and I swam across that river last night, and that night, and that was the last route we built for those women and those little girls. And that's how our operation ended. I can share uh, so many stories. Thank you. I can share so many stories of courage with you, but my time's running out. Uh, but I've seen so much courage in my life. Fifteen friends... Uh, over the 20 years in war, on the war on terror, 15 of my friends uh, that we buried uh, dying and giving their lives for freedom and for defending people who couldn't defend themselves. But of all their stories, I know there's no greater courage than Jesus when he stood on that cross, when he stood before that cross and got on that, climbed down that cross for, for us. Jesus had a clear mission to trade his life for ours as a sacrificial lamb of the sins of the world. And I know he had to have ton, a ton of anticipation, right, uh, of knowing what he would face false accusations, arrests, torture, a brutal murder, and, and he would face rejection from his own people. Those who he loved most, despite that, despite those fears he may have had, he moved forward with his mission anyway. In Matthew 26, the Bible says before the Last Supper, Jesus went to the, a place called the Garden of Gethsemane, and he said, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He was overwhelmed. The Bible says Jesus paced back and forth. Even falling on his face to the ground saying, my father, if it is possible, take this cup from me. He asked this three times. He was in distress. The Bible says that his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. This is a sign of someone that's scared. But after we see all this, we see Jesus' courage. When he returns to the disciples and he says this, the hour has come and the Son of Man is being delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Basically he said, let's do this. Uh, author Shay Richardson said this, courage is not living without fear, courage is being scared to death but doing the right thing anyway. Jesus didn't turn himself over to his enemies because he was weak. He turned himself over to his enemies because he was strong. And even the brave, uh, brave, bravest of us might have run or tried to fight in one last attempt to beat destiny, but he embraced his. And in his final moments during the horror of crucifixion, he said his final words, it is finished. And it was finished. The prophecy was fulfilled, and Jesus' mission was complete. Why did he do it? Because he loves us. He chose to. On the other side of that cross was something far more important than his fear or his hardships. It was you. And if Jesus could do that for you, and Jesus could do that for me, then how could we not be inconvenienced to go beyond our fears to do the work that he created us to do? Guys, we can't avoid the things that God burns our heart to do just because they're scary, because they're hard, they're dangerous, they're unpopular amongst our peers or uncomfortable. The question that you should ask yourself today with all these amazing people you're going to be able to hear from is are you going to live in fear 
or are you going to live by faith? You're going to be scared. You're going to have to make scary decisions in life. The most difficult uh, things in life, on the other side of those difficult things, on the side of those most scary things, or the most incredible things. I've been able to do so many incredible things in my life. I've been to 60 countries. I've been to combat eight times. Tons of humanitarian missions around the world. Uh, of all the things I've done, the best things on earth and eternal have always come on the other side of the most difficult things. Yeah, life is hard, and life's going to be scary. But this broken world needs young men and women like you who are going to take action in the face of fear. In fact, America and freedom depends on you, the next generation, to have the courage to boldly stand up for what is right. And I thank you for doing that because being here today is, is a step towards that, and I thank you for that. Can I pray with you guys? I want to pray with you guys. Lord, I just thank you so much for these young men and women, for the parents that would encourage their, their children to come here. Lord, I thank you for them. I thank you for the courage to be here today. Lord, I pray for each of them. Whatever fear they're facing or are going to face, I don't know what they are, Lord, but you do. You know each fear that they're going to face, Lord. Give them the courage to boldly stand in the face of that fear, to move forward and do the things you created them to do and be the people you created them to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you guys so much. God bless you. Thank you. I'm going to be in the back uh, signing books and if you want to come say hi. Thank you. Well, he has his book signing outside, and there's also another young man that's going to talk about his awesome company coming up. Thank you so much. How are y'all doing? Good? That's kind of weak. So my name is Joshua White, and I am here to tell y'all a little bit about my story. And it kind of ties in with more or less the American dream. So when I was younger, I want to say I was about seven. It was right before my dad took his own life. I was in a shelter, and I saw this. I saw this quote on the wall that said, if you knew you couldn't fail, how big would you dream? And it kind of stuck with me. And I've always, I've always remembered it. And I went to foster care when I was two years old. And I spent 16 years. I went through nine failed adoptions. And I was, I think it was number three for the worst case in Montgomery County. And... It was kind of tough because I was like, if my parents don't want me, nine families don't want me, how can I want me, you know? And struggling through life, getting beat down and kicked down constantly again and again and again, it just, it gets the best of you sometimes. And today... I've been surrounded by beautiful people, amazing people, and I own five companies, and by the end of next year, we're set to do a $200 million portfolio. Didn't go to college. And the point is about giving back. It's about working together. It's about being united. And the youth are the future. We are the future. And that's why y'all being here today blows me away. Like, I just get emotional thinking about it. Because once you go out in the world, man, it is so difficult. It is so hard. And it's just, you feel like it's dark, but it's not. For every darkness, there's a lot of light. There's a lot of people that will love you. There's a lot of people that will believe in you. You just got to find them. And that was the the hardest thing for me. I've spent my life so long in the darkness that when I finally found light, I was like, <laughs> I didn't know what to do with it because I was just so shell-shocked. I was like, I didn't know such beautiful people existed. You know? And doing conferences like this are, they're amazing. But it was, like Riley said, we got to stand up. We got to say something. Because if we don't, no one's going to know. You know? And so my, my life, I feel like it's not even mine, you know? I feel like I'm a vessel, 
Like my job is to love, my job is to give, my job is to protect, it's to provide. So every dollar I make, I could sit there and call it my success, but it's not. No, it was given to me and I have a responsibility to give that to other people. I have a responsibility to donate that, to give it, you know? And we as collectives, as individuals, I think it doesn't matter if you're working on a $200 million portfolio or a $2 portfolio. We can all do something in our own lives, somewhere, somehow. Like, if you ever thought about it, if everybody that saw a piece of trash just picked it up and threw it away, how much cleaner the world would be, right? It's, not, it's nothing massive. You're not out there curing cancer, but if we just do a little bit, if we just do our part, we could change the world. We just gotta speak up. We just, just a little bit of effort. That's it, that's all it takes. And so I want to, one, maybe hope to influence the younger generation to just try a little bit, man. Don't be afraid of failing. Because you never know. Even hypothetically, say you're aiming for the moon. Say you, don't, say you don't get it. Guess what? You'll still land among the stars. And that's one heck of a view. And so for all the younger youth and all the, even if you're older, Follow your heart, man. Follow your heart and love everybody. Love yourself, love the ones around you, because you never know what battles people are going through. You know? And who knows? Maybe one day you'll change somebody else's life. You know? And that's how I got here. And now, not only am I in a position to help other people, but I'm able to give back and be somebody that I needed when I was younger. So instead of searching for somewhere to go, why don't you make it? If you want something beautiful, create it, right? And that's what I decided to do. I was like, screw it. If no one's gonna be loving and sweet, I'll be loving and sweet. If no one's gonna take care of the kids, I'll take care of the kids. If you won't look after widows and orphans, then I will. And it's crazy, because once you start doing that, you start realizing that there are people out there that do that. And the world is vast. It is vast. And for every corrupt government, every crooked politician, there's probably five more that are 10 times better. And life, we have a tendency to focus on what's wrong instead of looking at all the good. And it's easy to get lost in it. Yeah, it's easy. I'm, Biden's doing a great job about messing stuff up. I think we can all agree on that one. But for every Biden, there's probably 10 of me. There's 10 of you. And we, we outnumber them. Like, hope is not lost. And I know the world seems like it's dark and there's no point. But if that's how you feel, keep traveling. Because you'll start finding stuff that will blow your mind. People that help you for no reason. You know? And I remember when I was, I want to say I was like 16, 17, I got into some serious trouble. I was doing identity theft. I was just trying to make ends meet. And I ended up stealing a lot of money from a lot of people. And it kind of all blew up. And had all the charges gone to court, I probably would have been looking at a 68-year life sentence in prison. And this gentleman over here on my right spoke up and was like, there's nothing wrong with Josh. He's just lost. He doesn't know what he wants. He doesn't know what to do. If you give him another chance, just as he did really bad over here, he can do really, really well. And he had no reason to do that. He had no, like, he wasn't my dad, wasn't my father. Just somebody who saw somebody hurting, somebody who saw somebody struggling, 
and just help them for no reason. And now because of that, I'm able to take that kindness, that grace, and that love, and I'm able to give it to somebody else. That's our obligation. That's what we have to do. When someone gives you love, you don't have to pay them back. You pay them back by loving somebody else for no reason. And you never know. It could be a thank you. It could be a hi. It could be a hello. You could pick up a piece of trash, help somebody jump their car, and you could change somebody's world just from being kind. And so I travel now talking about my story because originally I didn't want to, you know. I didn't. Nobody wants to talk about being whipped and beaten. Nobody wants to talk about not being wanted. And I had to realize that it's not my life. I'm a vessel. And my job is to help somebody else. My job is to talk to other kids who've been sexually abused, talk to other people who maybe are just down on their luck, you know? And once I started, I realized that out of nowhere, my life suddenly had meaning. And I felt the same. I was like, I'm nobody special. But it meant a lot to me. And so now, my new goal is I want to, one, I want to rebuild our education system because it is absolutely horrible. And then two, my goal, I want to make a school. I want to make a school that is free, but it's going to be a private institution that houses foster kids and gives them a proper education, but a conservative education. Because when I, when I, growing up, you know, I didn't know, I heard about God, but I didn't, like, he didn't make any sense to me, because I was like, you're telling me there's a guy that just floats up there, and he's allowing all this to happen? And they're like, not exactly, Josh. But once I started hanging around all these people, all these Christians, they were just so nice, they were so kind, they were so loving. And it's, it's almost like it's contagious. Because out of nowhere, like, I wanted to be angry. I did. I wanted to be mad at God. I wanted to be mad at my parents. But being around those people, being around that light, it's like I couldn't, even if I dug as far as I could. And I watched my dad hang himself. And I still could not find an ounce of hatred to give. Because somebody loved me for no reason. And now because of that, it changed my life forever. And so if you feel lost, if you feel like you don't have a purpose, just keep going. Like you never know. It, it, success is just one step. That's a, it's, a, it's a guy who failed, but just tried one more time. And now, I think by the end of, say, the summer of next year, we'll have 75 employees. And... I've been able, I've been blessed financially to give to those situations. So if you don't like something, change it. If it's not there, make it. I mean, that's literally what the American dream is about. And you'll never know, man. You never know because you could just change someone's life for the better. Or someone could change your life. But you'll never know if you don't try. That's all I got to say. Thank you all. Hello, everybody. All right, y'all. My name is Savannah Hernandez. And for those of you who do not know me, I am a reporter with Turning Point USA's Frontlines Faction. So I do a lot of on the ground reporting for Turning Point USA. And I have been an on the ground reporter for the past five years, detailing everything going on in the United States of America from the East Coast to the West Coast. So I'm really excited to be here today to talk with you guys about not only everything that we've been doing at Turning Point with Frontlines, but more importantly, the importance of each individual's voice, especially everybody here in this room today. Now, over the past year since I've worked with Turning Point, I have covered everything from the San Francisco fentanyl crisis, uh, Measure 110 in Oregon. If you guys aren't familiar with that one, they decriminalized 
all hard drugs over there. So basically, you guys can go do heroin in front of a police officer in that city. And those policies pr pretty much went as well as you would expect in this city. If you go to the West Coast, these cities are absolutely degraded. And various parts of the United States look like the third world. Another big story that we've covered was the toxic train derailment in East Palestine, Ohio, where there was a huge biohazard. The uh, people of East Palestine had their homes destroyed, and the government kind of ignored them for three weeks. No one was there. No one was, uh, you know, available for the American people, and they very much felt ignored. That was another big story that was really nice to go cover because we were able to be on the ground and completely change the narrative nationwide about how this situation really wasn't that bad. Now, I got into media because for some reason, our mainstream media loves to hit us with propaganda and lie to us every single day. Now, if you guys who are actually living in modern day America take a peek at the economy or the border crisis, if you actually go out onto the streets of America, it seems vastly different than what we are told on screen. At least that's been my experience with it. That's why I got into the media. So over the past year, we've been able to combat the narrative. We've been able to uh, straight up debunk lies and social media has been a really incredible way of doing this. So uh, on top of that migrant crisis as well, that's been in the news this week because we have seen how Texas is, being come, is becoming completely overwhelmed right now, especially in Eagle Pass. Now, Elon Musk went this past week, and it was great that he went down there because this is an issue that's been going on for the past two years. And again, because the mainstream media really hasn't highlighted it, not many people are aware of how bad the border crisis has gotten. So uh, a little bit of my own uh, independent reporting as well with Turning Point, I was able to go and highlight one of the biggest migrant hotels in New York City, and that was earlier this May. Now at this hotel, which is about a block away from Times Square, you had upwards of 4,000 illegal immigrants that are being housed at this hotel. Now, rooms at this hotel previously went for about $500 a night, but the taxpayers of New York are currently paying to house these migrants in this nice hotel a block away from Times Square. They're getting free health care. They're getting free food every single day. New York City is an absolute mess right now, but guess what? If you weren't looking at alternative media, if you were looking at the propaganda, again, that we're being faced with, you would have no idea that this is going on. So again, just highlighting the importance of independent media versus mainstream media because the two stories we're being told are very, very different. Now, my reporting uh, over the past year has amassed over 80 million views on social media alone. We've also made primetime news multiple times. And I tell you guys this not to gloat, but because just one year ago, I finally got my Twitter account back. I was actually permanently banned on Twitter for two years for my independent reporting. Because back in 2020, I was covering these uh, little things called the BLM riots. I don't know if you guys remember those. But the entire media, again, was targeting us and telling us that these were fiery, but mostly peaceful protests. That the rioters were actually just looting Louis Vuitton because they had to feed their family. And if we didn't understand that, we were the bad people. Simultaneously, COVID-19 was also going on. And if you were a BLM protester, you could go out in the hundreds of thousands in a group and the media would praise you and say that you were fighting for social justice so COVID didn't affect you. But if you were maybe going out and protesting against the lockdowns or the fact that you were being forced to take a vaccine or wear a face mask that didn't work, you were the problem and you were a super spreader. So all of this was happening at the same time and I was covering all of it and then Former President Donald Trump retweeted one of my videos of my on the ground reporting towards the end of 2020. A week later, all of my work of the BLM riots, all of my work on the ground covering again the anti-lockdown protests was completely gone. It was deleted from history, and this is my first experience with the rewriting of history in the modern day because that's what we are all currently living through with modern day censorship. It's absolutely insane. So that was censorship number one. And again, uh, going back to those BLM riots, uh, you know, I had n news organizations linking to my story of white Antifa members who would shut down an entire highway, stopping a black father from going to work to provide for his kid. 
Now the headline to go along with and corroborate that video, the video was no longer there anymore. So effectually, again, the rewriting of history, the deletion of the proof that 2020 was not in fact fiery, but mostly peaceful, <laughs> not mostly peaceful at all. So about a year later, I made another Twitter account because I said, you know what, the people need to have their voices heard. The reason I got into independent journalism is because I believe in actually going outside and talking to my fellow man and letting the American people tell me what's actually going on. Because again, like, let's take a peek at the economy right now. If you read the media, you'd be like, wow, it looks like everything's doing great. But then you go to your local grocery store and you're like, why are eggs $7 for a dozen? What is going on? So again, I love talking to the American people and then telling me, how policies are personally impacting them. So I made a second Twitter account and I went to this little thing called the 2022 NCAA Women's Swimming Championships. I think you guys just heard from Riley Gaines who actually competed against Leah Thomas. Now, when I was there, I spoke to actually the first athlete to speak out against Leah Thomas during that competition. Her name was Rose, she was a freshman from Virginia Tech, and it was her teammate that was kicked out of the final round because Leah Thomas took her spot. And she was enraged about this. I was on the ground, I was one of the only journalists there because for some reason, the entire mainstream media didn't wanna to touch this story outside of saying that it was great that we had a biological male competing against women. But on the ground, the parents were telling me, very different things. On the ground, the athletes competing were telling me very different things. So this young athlete who watched her teammates' dreams be completely crushed because it was her last chance and opportunity to go for the gold in the NCAA finals, she was courageous enough to speak out to a journalist despite the fact that officials were telling all of the swimmers, do not speak to media, don't say Leah Thomas's name even in the locker room. Uh, they were telling the parents this as well, but this young girl was brave enough to speak out. I put her two minute interview on Twitter. It gained over 2 million views. It got picked up by Tucker Carlson and it completely changed the entire media narrative that Leah Thomas swimming in the NCAA championships was a good thing. For the first time, we actually saw that, hey, the people experiencing this, very different story than what the media is actually saying. Two days later, my entire account was gone. More importantly, her voice was silenced. And it took her a lot of courage to put that video out too. I had put it up and because it started gaining so much traction because she was the first person to speak out against Leah Thomas, she got scared and she was like, you know, I'm a freshman. This is my swimming career. I don't want the whole thing to be destroyed. Can you please take the video down? And I talked with her and I said, you know, if you really want me to, I will, but I think that your voice is extremely important and nobody has spoken out against Leah Thomas during the NCAA championships the way that you are now. So I think it's important we leave it up, but I'm gonna leave it up to you. She decided to leave it up. She said, go ahead, keep it there. Let the people hear what the athletes actually think. I'll be the voice. Like I said, two days later, Twitter completely deleted the video. It was gone off the face of the earth. I made a third Twitter account a couple months later because again, I was like, you know what? I have my first amendment rights in America and we should be allowed to report on what's actually going on. I'm not gonna let the media and again, these propaganda artists speak on behalf of us. I wanna hear what the people actually have to say. So I think this was about a year back. We kept hearing and we kept seeing the media headlines that gas prices were going down, that the economy was doing better, that everybody was a little bit more financially comfortable. And I said, okay, let me go to the inner cities in Dallas and go ask people what they're experiencing. Completely opposite. Uh, that interview blew up and then I went to DC Pride. This was in 2022, where we were all being told that Pride parades were an incredible thing, where children weren't being targeted, they were family friendly. And not only did I highlight some of the uh, most uh, degenerate things I would say that I've seen. It was a hard event to be at because again, you have naked people twerking in the streets of DC on a Saturday at 2 p.m. But on top of that, I spoke to two girls, probably around the age of 13, 14, who basically admitted that the gender ideology is targeting our youth, right? They were like, well, I think I'm pansexual, bisexual, lesbian, gay, I'm not sure. It was kind of a slippery slope and I'm not sure what my gender is. And all I did was go out and ask these young girls, hey, what do you identify as, right? These weren't any gotcha questions. It was just point and cut and dry journalism. And again, after these uh, clips amassed millions of views, that Twitter account was also deleted. 
Now, I tell you guys this story because, to be quite honest with you, there were so many times where I wanted to give up. There were so many times where I wanted to say, does my voice even matter? Why am I trying to fight back against an entire corporation, right, Twitter, who keeps on silencing me and keeps on trying to delete my work? Yes, I should have the fundamental right to report to my fellow man what's going on. But why am I going to keep fighting if I'm going to keep getting deleted? This is a hard battle to win. And I think a lot of us struggle with that question as well because of where America is at in the modern day. I don't know about you guys, but I look around and I sometimes feel like our problems are overwhelming. It's like we have one win, but then we have 10 more things we have to fight against. Like I said, we have the open border crisis right now. The economy isn't doing too great. It feels like we have no leadership in the United States of America. We have to fight for our basic and fundamental rights in the USA in 2023, what's going on? And that fight can honestly get very exhausting. But then I have to think about my own story and the fact that it was my fellow Americans who helped uplift my voice and uplift the voices of other Americans who I was highlighting and helped completely shift the national narrative several times. So at the beginning of my speech, I kind of talked about where my journalism is today, gave you guys some of those numbers, and it's been incredible that, uh, you know, Turning Point and I have been able to accomplish that over the past year, but it has been an incredible fight. And it's one that isn't going to stop anytime soon. But to be quite honest with you guys too, one of the things that gives me inspiration and hope is coming to events like this and seeing people who take time out of their Saturday to come and be at the forefront and learn how to take our country back, how to make our country great again, how to reinstill those foundations. And it takes each and every single one of us. Thanks, Kat. So I just wanna first off give a big shout out to each and every one of you for being here because you guys are the ones that are going to make the biggest change in America. And anybody in the modern day can be a citizen journalist. So Elon Musk going down to the border, right? You might be like, okay, yeah, it's Elon Musk. This man gets like 100,000 likes on every single one of his posts. Of course, his footage is going to blow up. But what Elon Musk did this past week, anybody can go do. If you see something weird going on in your school, for example, I took my, I live in Austin, Texas, right? Super liberal, super fun for me. Uh, I took my dad and brother rock climbing, and there were tampons in the boys' bathroom which was really weird. I don't know, boys, you guys use those? Last time I checked, you didn't, but you know. Um, and it was funny because I was like, you know, this is a great example of how anybody could be a citizen journalist. You see something weird like that, like tampons in the boys' room, you take a photo of it, you put it on social media and say, hey, why is it in 2023 that men need tampons? Last time I checked, men don't get periods. That's kind of weird, isn't it? Boom, you're a citizen journalist right there and you're making a positive change by highlighting what is going on in your city, in your school, at your city council, your school board, do what you will with it. In the age of social media, despite the fact that censorship is very much still rampant, we can still make a positive change. And I think that now more than ever, it's important that we fight for the foundations of America because despite how difficult things currently are, we still do live in one of the greatest countries in the world, I think. So I hope with my story today, it could inspire you guys a little bit because I know things sometimes seem dire in our country. And it takes a lot of courage to speak up and speak out. To be quite honest, it takes courage to have common sense in 2023. If you have the audacity to, like I say, or said, say, you know, only women get periods, boom, you are gonna have an entire mob coming after you trying to get you fired from your job. So even having common sense in America is a courageous thing to do nowadays. And speaking out and standing your ground is even harder. But every single one of us in this room has the ability to do it and the ability to make a change. One of the last things I'll leave you with is uh, one of the things that I grapple with, it's crazy to me that I'm on this stage right now, is feeling like my voice matters or that I could even make a change. Because like I said, sometimes what we are being faced with feels so overwhelming. But one of the very first um, big protest that I did was during 2020, I held up a Police Lives Matter sign at a BLM protest. I got beat up for it. But all I did with that 
was take a $5 poster board, a message that said, Police Lives Matter, and on the other side it said, Say His Name, David Dorn, because BLM rioters had just killed David Dorn in cold blood. He was a former police officer. I went and I stood up and I said, You know what? I don't agree with what's going on, and I'm going to stand up for police when nobody else will. I went with my iPhone. Fox News picked it up. It was a big story. I never thought that it would be anything. But again, with that being said, I just want you guys to know that any single person in this room is capable of doing any of these things. And like I said, you guys are the ones that give me hope and inspiration. So thank you guys for being here today. Thank you guys for being the backbone of America. And um, I really appreciate each and every one of you. So keep fighting, keep pushing. We will continue to fight for our country and take it back and fight for the foundations that made this country great. Thank you guys so much. Yeah, thank you. How's everybody? Good. State Senator Brandon Creighton here in my home district and also in my home county. Just uh, so pleased to have all of you here and uh, just so impressed with the Texas Youth Summit, uh, the speakers that have been coming in and out yesterday and today, and those that are participating for tomorrow's future leadership in this state. And uh, again, when I say tomorrow, I don't mean down the road. I mean tomorrow. That's what Texas needs going forward, is to understand that as we work hard to make sure that this country has what it needs, as Texas does what it needs to save this nation, it will happen right here in Texas, and it will happen among the states. Are you with me? So I want to thank Christian Collins and uh, all that he's done to grow the Texas Youth Summit, the sponsors. And how about Don, Donald Trump Jr., Kristen Guilfoyle? How about Charlie Kirk? How about Myra Flores, one of my favorites? And how about Riley Gaines? I know Riley's not from Texas, but we're going to adopt her. I know we had uh, some Tennessee volunteers at the Alamo, so we're going to continue to rely on uh, Tennessee to send those and others from around this nation to make sure that Texas stays strong, and with that, America will stay strong. So what are we doing here today, and who will we hear from? We're hearing from conservative leaders from around the nation some that I just mentioned and many more, many of our elected officials that will be here flying in from D.C., coming back from Austin and our state capitol to make sure that collectively we all talk together about the state of our country and where we are now with sleepy Joe Biden in the White House, but also understanding that 26 Republican governors in this nation are working very hard day in and day out to offset what the 24 Democrat governors across this nation are working to impose as policies. We have 23 Republican legislatures across this nation. We have 17 Democrat-led legislatures, and we have 10 that are a blend between the two chambers, House and Senate. And why do I bring that up? Why is that important? It's important because as we get together with these conservative thought leaders yesterday and today and through the weekend, and we talk together and share together and witness together about what we need to see going forward to make sure Texas is strong, which will make sure America is strong, we have to know that as we watch what's happening in Washington, and sometimes it's not much, right? Sometimes we see the gridlock and we're frustrated with it, 
And, you know, even Supreme Court Justice Scalia, before he passed, mentioned how our founders set it up to where, with the separation of powers, it would be very, very difficult to get anything done because it's very difficult to pass legislation. In a unicameral legislature where there's just one house, it's difficult. In a bicameral legislature where there's a house and a Senate, it's incredibly difficult. And then, separately, you have the executive office where if the bill passes, it goes on to the president or here in Texas to the governor, and there has to be approval there. In the British Parliament, if they don't like the prime minister, the parliament can just have a vote of no confidence and remove them. Some might call that impeachment. Anybody heard of that lately? <laughs> Who here believes that it's healthy for this nation or this state to weaponize impeachment in repetition and to usurp the will of the voters that have just been cast in the last election? Who feels like that is the right direction for Texas? Not many of us, right? So when we follow our principles, our direction from you as voters and constituents, and the guidelines of ethics and what makes us good stewards, stewards of the public and of our tax dollars and what we're expected to do in office, we also have to temper that with what the founders intended for us to pursue as remedies when there are issues. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit, but I want to fo first focus on why Texas and the states around the country will save this nation, as many of us are focused on Washington, D.C., and whether or not we make a decision in our minds on the future of this country. So we've talked about the majority of this nation is under Republican governance at the state level, both for governors in the executive branch and also for legislatures. And as Texas continues to lead in the state capital in Austin, we need you, our youth of today, working on a plan to not just engage, not just inspire others to vote, not just to work in the trenches on campaigns, but to plan on running as office holders yourselves. And again, I don't mean tomorrow as in a long way down the road, right? Don't ever let anyone tell you you're too young to run for office, as long as you meet the constitutional threshold, right? Don't ever let anyone tell you that. When I went into the Texas House, 16 years ago, I was the youngest Republican. And in those campaigns leading up to going into those first sessions, most people told me when I was walking 20, 25, 30,000 doors, I was too young. But then again, most people voted for me, even though I was the youngest on the ballot. Isn't that amazing? So if I would have listened to the negativity, I never would have found out the positive outcome. Are you with me? When I went into the Texas Senate eight years later, I was the youngest Republican in the Senate. And I held that distinction until this last session when Senator Mays Middleton from Galveston knocked me off. And I was proud of Mays for what he did in his campaign and coming from the House to the Senate. He sits to the right of me on the Senate floor. That doesn't indicate he votes to the right of me. I'm going to tell you that. I tell him that too, right? I'm kidding. We're within about a golf score or a thousandth of a point on our voting record. But what I am proud of Mays, and I'm proud of other candidates that don't let age hold them back, is your experience in seeking office and working on campaigns and being engaged and being here today, it's all going to culminate in a positive result. And I lost my first race for state representative. I got really close. I was within 
of winning against a long-term incumbent, but it wasn't my time. But in the very next election, I didn't let stumbling on the goal line keep me from working hard to continue to score. Because many of us give up on our goals and never really realize how close we were to accomplishing them. So make sure with the negativity that you hear, or if you stumble, or if you fail, that you take that as motivation. Because we all experience those exact same experiences. So in the legislative session, if other states that we meet as state legislators and governors from around the country, when we were visiting with those legislators at conferences all over the country talking about the Texas agenda to save Texas, to put us in a position of strength, to protect our conservative values and our principles, and to make sure that we were protecting our freedoms and our liberties going forward, not just for Texans, but as a benchmark for America. That line in the sand that we hear about that was drawn by William Barrett Travis at the Alamo, that is the Texas legislative session every two years in Austin, Texas. And we've, when we visit with legislators from around the country and we say we're charting out an agenda to do the very things that Texans expect us to do, sometimes we get a blank stare. When we say we're gonna ban critical race theory from being taught in our public schools, we get a blank stare and are you sure you can do that? We accomplished it. When we say we're going to ban ESG in the corporate world and that we're going to ban billions of dollars of state pension money from investing in companies that promote ESG, we get blank stares. And are you sure you're going to accomplish that? And we do. We banned it. When we say we're going to ban the destructive weaponization that diversity, equity, and inclusion offices have brought to our campuses, where Texas A&M DEI units had excluded Asian American students and professors that were applying for jobs at A&M, can you imagine that? We ban the DEI offices and we will put it back on the universities to pursue their own goals to foster a climate of diversity. We did it before and we can do it again and we don't need weaponization of these offices and these strategies under leftist Marxist principles that are bad for other minorities and weaponized against those that will not sign a political oath to be hired as a professor unless you're liberal that put a neon sign above every university in this state because they were all doing this with a neon sign above the front door that said basically if you're not conservative you need not apply here. Is that what we want our tax dollars going towards? No, absolutely not. So CRT and DEI and ESG and woke in our public school classrooms and all of these efforts to commandeer the education system in Texas, we're saying no to that. And you all know better than anyone that the future of this state begins in the classroom and the agendas that are set out from the left, they don't start in Washington. They don't start on campaigns with people that decide yesterday to run for office. They start in education. So I worked hard to convince Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick to ask me to chair the education committees in the Texas Capitol so that we could advance these agendas to make sure that you know, the left and the media might call it radical. Folks, it's just common sense. And in Austin, Texas, you get to where you're breathing the air in Travis County. And I'm so thankful to be breathing the air in Montgomery County, I can tell you right now. 
And we're so blessed for any of you that traveled here, but we'd like for you to stay because as a conservative, if you come to Montgomery County to visit, you're not a tourist, you're among friends. Montgomery County and this part of Texas is the pulse and the heartbeat of, of conservatives across this state. And it shows in the Texas Capitol. But when you're breathing that Austin air, there's little whispers in your ear from taxpayer-funded lobbyists and those that represent all kinds of different interests that want you just to back up a little bit on the common sense. And one inch at a time becomes a mile. And that mile becomes the death of common sense that we will not allow to happen in the state of Texas. So I just want you to know that as we strengthen the Texas electric grid, as we balance our $300 billion budget in Texas, as we return $17 billion of tax money to Texans that no other state in the country has ever done, we can't find where the United States of America in Washington, D.C., where that federal building is, we can't find that they've ever returned $17 billion to American taxpayers. That is a reflection on you, not on politicians that have done the right thing. So continue to demand what you demand. Continue to deserve what you deserve and voice it. Liberals are speaking up more than ever before, but national polls show that conservatives are getting more and more quiet. Are you quiet? No. no. That's what I like to hear. So I'll work at the state capitol in Austin to make sure that we have that line in the sand drawn. I'll expect you there in present. When you can't be, give us your opinions and your advice because we are listening and we're headed into a special session on school choice and education freedom October 9th and we will succeed. Thank you, God bless you, and God bless the great state of Texas. Thank you. Hey, everybody, give it up one more time for State Senator Brandon Crichton. How's everybody doing? You guys feel good so far? Hello, everybody having fun? Are you enjoying yourselves? How many of you, how many of you identify as Republicans? Round of applause, maybe? Okay, more specifically, how many of you identify as conservatives? Okay. How many of you identify as proud Americans? I like that one. How many of you identify as proud Texans? And I think this is the most important one. How many of you identify as a child of God? Well, me too. I'm proud to be all those things. I've noticed there's been a lot of talk lately about identity, you know, as gender identity and racial identity. But I think when we're talking about identity, we've just explained the only identities that matter, and, and individual identity too. As Americans, we're so lucky that we get to be individuals. I'm an individual, my name's Kenny Webster, and I host a morning radio show that can be heard around the South on about 17 radio signals from Georgia to Oklahoma, down to Texas, uh, over to the Florida Panhandle, and pretty much everywhere in between. I host a talk radio show, but I also do a podcast that reaches uh, about a million people a month, and it's very cool to do that. But more importantly than any of that stuff, more importantly than how many social media followers I have, which is about a half a million, by the way, uh, is that I follow God and that you follow God. And I think that's one of the things that brought us all here today. Do you guys agree? Good. I'm glad. I, um, I'm very lucky. I get to do something I really enjoy for a living, and I, and I paid very generously for it, probably more than I should be, uh, which is great. You know, it's nice to live in a country like America where there's so much opportunity. I get up every day and I entertain people while they're stuck in traffic and they're going to work. And that's a pretty grim time for a lot of people. You wake up in the morning and you're frustrated, you're, you're paranoid about your job and the government and the world that we live in, weather and the economy, and so many things that we don't have any control over. And so I am very fortunate, I get to have this intimate moment 
with our radio listeners where I talk to them about what's going on in the world and I try to help people have a sense of humor about it because we have to laugh at the absurdity of what's happening right now. Sometimes there's this feeling of helplessness, like we can't do anything about it. And, you know, in some ways you ask yourself, like, what's the similarity between, you know, President Joe Biden and the Hunter Biden scandal and, oh, I don't know, the dating relationship between Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift, for example. And I think that similarity is, it's absurd. These people are absurd. And it's okay to laugh at them. And, and you should, you absolutely should. And so that's what I do for a living. I, I get up each day and I, and I talk to people like all of you while they drive to work around the South and I try to help them laugh at this stuff. But more so than that, I mean, it's, it's nice to have a good relationship with our sponsors and help to drive the economy. But we also try to inform people because there is so much information that the liberal media does not want any of you to know about. The system was designed to misinform, to propagate, to mislead you. It's not a coincidence that there's so much contradictory information that you guys are subjected to all the time. I'm speaking specifically right now to the high school kids and the college kids in the room. It's a really confusing time in your life. You don't know where you're going. You don't know what you're about to do. But you wanna have that you, you want to have that coming-of-age moment where you stand up, you walk out into the world, and you achieve greatness. That doesn't happen overnight, and it certainly doesn't happen easily with all the obstacles that things like the media and Hollywood and government and academia put in front of you. So for me, when I was your age, about 20 years ago, I had my red pill moment, my, my push yourself over to the right moment, when I was attending college up at the University of Illinois, Chicago. At the time, there was this movie that had been out for a little while. It was called PCU. And for some of you, it might be a, you, some of you might be a little young for this movie. It was a comedy film starring David Spade, and it was about college life. And all of these extremist groups, like the militant uh, uh, black movement, the militant feminist movement, the militant gay movement, and how they were all competing with each other on campus to try to recruit you to be part of what was essentially a cult to get you farther away from your individual identity, your, the identity that God gave you, and to try to turn you into really some kind of a zombie, some kind of a walking android that's just repeating the catchphrases that they taught you. Uh, when I got to college, I found out college life in the early 2000s was a lot like that movie. And it was funny to watch the movie, but it wasn't funny being on college campuses and having that realization that I wasn't like these people. When I walked around the University of Illinois Chicago, there were Marxists and socialists and communists, and they were all recruiting for their different book clubs. And they all followed this guy around. He was a tenured professor at our school, uh, a taxpayer-funded educator, a guy named Bill Ayers. Does anybody know who that is? Show of hands, I know some of, the, some of the people in the back certainly do. For those of you younger people, Bill Ayers is a convicted terrorist. He tried to hurt people. He was part of a group called the Weather Underground. And you would think to yourselves, well, why would they let this guy around college kids? It's remarkable. It turns out he was friends with a guy named Barack Obama and a very, very close, intimate relationship that the two of them had, to say the very least. So at my college, I didn't know what I was, but I knew that as I looked at these people frothing at the mouths with green hair and piercings all over their faces, screaming at the sky like they hated the country that they came from, often very privileged kids from the suburbs that came from nice towns with nice families. I didn't know what I was, but I knew I wasn't that. And I had this history professor at the time, and he was probably one of the only educators I met at the entire school that wasn't that. He didn't hate America. He didn't hate individualism. He didn't hate God. And he asked us a question one day in class. I'll never forget this. He said, our founding fathers lived in a very different time than us. Some of them owned slaves. But they also wrote the and, and doctrination. They, they, they wrote ideas down in things like the Federalist Papers about individual rights, individual liberties that eventually led to where we got today, right? an egalitarian society, a society with free speech, a society where you can be whatever you want. So the question was, were these men racist? Well, that's a pretty complicated question, isn't it? Some of them owned slaves, but they also wrote, wrote articles and papers that led to the end of slavery. 
So I raised my hand and I said, look, racism back in the 1700s wasn't even a word. It hadn't been invented yet. And it didn't make sense to me as a young man to judge people from the past by modern day standards. It was a strange thing to do, right? Immediately, the rest of the class turned on me. I felt like I should have shut my mouth. I felt alienated. I felt isolated. I felt very awkward. I wondered if I was safe at the time. Would I be safe to leave the classroom that day as I walked back to my dormitory? And the most incredible thing happened. The professor agreed with me. And it occurred to me that if the smartest guy in the room, the person that was here to teach us all about American history and American government, saw this the way that I did, maybe I wasn't so crazy. Now, as I was attending school, we had this thing, the Confucius Institute. By show of hands, do any of you know what a Confucius Institute is? Some of the people in the back do. The Chinese Communist Party, this is gonna sound crazy to those of you that have never heard this before. The Chinese Communist Party has spent a fortune on our higher education institutions in this country trying to brainwash all of you, all you people in your early 20s and late teens, and they do this by offering money to your colleges in exchange for permission to influence which professors get hired. 30 years ago, this didn't exist. In the 80s, the 90s, there was no such thing. It was a relatively new thing when I got to college. I'm, I'm 41, by the way, very old. And so, to me, at the time, I couldn't understand this, right? We had, a, we had an office on our campus where we would, you know, students from China would come and learn about America and they would go back. And then we didn't realize at the time the Communist Party was funding the people that were hiring the professors. Over the last 20 years, I mean, there's never been a lot of conservative college professors or moderate college professors for that matter. But over the last 20 years, the number of conservative, moderate, libertarian, right-wing, populist, nationalist, you name it, professors in the school around the country dropped to numbers where they were almost non-existent. And that's where you guys are today. You guys now are attending those schools. Now, people have gotten hip to this. They've picked up on the fact that these Confucius Institutes exist, and they've started to change the names of them. They're not really calling them that anymore, a sort of a rebranding, if you will. Uh, like when Facebook changed its name to Meta, for example. You know, once in a while, you just rebrand, and that's what this was. But they're still there, and it's still happening today. So that's what we're up against right now. Th there's really three tiers to this idea of the liberal institution. You've got Hollywood, You've got the media, and you've got academia. And I bet most of you right now are probably involved in the third one. Oddly enough, academia is where a lot of these crazy ideas that the left is pushing seems to come from. By show of hands, how many of you heard the phrase stacking the courts? Do you know what that means, packing the courts? A lot of you do, right? Donald Trump, one of the great populists of our lifetime, did this awesome job putting really great judges on the Supreme Court. And we were able to overturn something that I bet most of you were happy to see go away. How many of you were happy when Roe v. Wade went away? That's right. Roe v. Wade was unconstitutional. It didn't make any sense. It took away the rights from the states to decide something like the right to life, for example. So after that happened, how did the left respond? They had this idea. The conservatives have a majority on the Supreme Court, and that's a problem. Well, to them, this is war. They needed to change the way the Supreme Court works. So they came up with this idea that they're, we're going to put more justices on the Supreme Court. You guys have this many conservatives, we'll add this many more judges to make sure they're outnumbered. And that idea came from taxpayer-funded, tenured college professors, the very people that many of you are getting your education from right now. And it's frustrating, right? That's what you're up against. You're sitting there in a classroom, not only surrounded by people who disagree with you ideologically, politically, theologically, but people that are actually feeding ideas to the elitist ruling class that's trying to destroy what it is that makes America great. Are you guys okay with that? That doesn't sound like you're not. Say no. Good. It's okay to get a little angry, you guys. Trust me on this. So that's what we're up against. If we lose, America turns into a third world country. If we lose, America turns into the country, the kind of country that many of these people are fleeing from right now to come here. 
It's amazing listening to the people on the left talk about America. We're the most diverse country on earth, the most egalitarian country on earth. We have more rights, more freedom, more opportunity than any other country. And your professors tell you every day that this is a terrible place to be. If it is so horrible, why are these people running over the border to get here? Is anybody fleeing in a boat to try to get to Cuba? Are they? They're absolutely not, I assure you. Nobody wants to go to Cuba. That's crazy. So that's what we're up against. And that's what happens if we lose. But what happens if we win? Well, that's the beauty of it. Your parents lived in a fantastic world, but it's deteriorating. And you live in a great world, but you see the evidence of that deterioration all around you. If we win, we can reverse this. If we win, we can save America. If we live, our children and their children can continue to live in a world as wonderful as the world that we live in or our parents live in. And that's something that's worth fighting for. I think there's room for everybody at the table here in America. I, I think when you talk about things like immigration reform, we're not asking for a lot. We're just simply asking for people to follow the rules. I mean, I, I love the fact that some of, thank you. I love the fact that I live in a country that's diverse. That, 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 is, that is unique, that is a melting pot. That's the beauty of being an American. It's an awesome thing. But at the same time, when people come to our country, we don't want them to believe that this is a place where lawlessness is okay, where socialism is okay, where anti-Christian values are okay, where anti-religious values are okay. There is one creator, there is one God, and this radical idea that, that, that people from a monotheistic religion figured out thousands of years ago that we're all equal and God is our creator, that was the whole basis for why this country was created. No monarchy, right? No ruling class, no oligarchy, no elites. Everybody gets a chance to sit at the table. It's a beautiful thing. So that's what happens if we win. And we're up against a lot here. So... I say all that to get back to the original reason I'm here today, to tell you about what I do. I'm, like I said before, very lucky. I get to do something really fun for a living. I get to travel around the country. I get to meet really cool people like you guys. I've met a lot of fascinating people over the years, uh, presidents and celebrities and musicians and rock stars and comedians. It's, a, it's been a fun life for Kenny. I've really enjoyed it. I have. But you guys can do what I do too. I'm not in some special club. Everybody in this room can do what I do. It's, it's not terribly difficult. If you want to get into politics, if you want to make a difference, if you want to make a change and be part of this movement for, for li the liberty movement or the populist movement or the nationalism movement or the conservatism movement, there's really two paths you can take. One of those is taking the political route. You could go join a young Republican group. There are many of them. They're not all the same. Some of them I think are awesome. Some of them I don't really agree with. And that's besides the point. Uh, you could join those. You could go intern for a politician. You could go work as a staff member for somebody from a special interest group. And there's a lot of jobs like that. And you could go do that tomorrow. And if you spend six months doing it and you work your butt off, it's going to turn into a job. It's going to turn into a good paying career. But there's another path you can take too, which is the path I took. I've never worked for a congressman. I've never worked for a special interest group. I've never really been part of any of those groups. People on the left do something that people on our side don't do enough. They join academia. They join Hollywood. They become entertainers. They join the media. 20 years ago, the conservative media was little more than the National Review and this new fledgling cable news network called Fox News. What's that? Nobody had ever heard of it. It was brand new. Today, the conservative media is massive. Today, there are stand-up comedy shows with right-wing people, with Christians, with conservatives. The Christian music movement is massive. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. We need more people like all of you to get involved in stuff like that. We need people like you to become college professors. We need people like you to become journalists. We need people like you to become entertainers. People on the right are vastly underserved in the entertainment industry, in the media industry. And, and here's the beauty of it. If you choose to go that route, there, there are more people out there 
that are hungry, that are thirsty for the kind of content that you're going to create than there are for what people on the left are doing. There's a thousand people right now trying to be the next Jon Stewart or the next Bill Maher. Well, who's going to be the next Greg Gutfeld? Who's going to be the next Charlie Kirk? Who's going to, who's going to do that? Hopefully one of you. I mean, honestly, looking around this room right now at the kind of people that are here right now, seeing the fact that you're ambitious enough as a young adult to come and do something like this, I guarantee each and every one of you can succeed in that path and become infinitely successful. Make money, have a, have a family, travel the world. It's right there. It's right in front of you. I'm really excited for all of you. There's a lot of opportunity that you guys can go after right now in your life if you choose to take the red pill, if you continue down that path. All that being said, my name's Kenny Webster. I'm on Twitter. I have a morning show. You could download our smartphone app. It's called Walton and Johnson. Uh, I'm on the radio about six and a half hours a day in Houston, and hopefully you like it. Um, it might be a little, it might be a little risque for some of the younger listeners, but I think most of you will enjoy it. Hey, can you all give it up for my buddy Christian Collins and the good folks at the Texas Youth Summit for putting this together? And if you don't mind. Give it up one more time for all yourselves. You guys are awesome. Thank you for being here, and thank you for being a part of this. God bless you, and God bless Texas. Have a great day. Hi everybody, we are so excited to be with you here today. We have such an important topic that we're going to talk about and that is the issue of life. And we have three amazing leaders with us that have really championed the issue of life here in the state of Texas. We have Rep Nate Schatzline, who is in Austin. We have, no, round of applause. We have Jonathan Sanchez from Texas Values. He's a president over there. And we have Dr. John Sego, who was coined by The Atlantic as the man behind the Texas Heartbeat Bill. So he's a president. He's the president of the Texas Right to Life Foundation. So we're going to have an amazing discussion on the issue of life. So for all the panelists, I recently saw an article from The Hill that said that Gen Z is actually majority pro-choice. So what can we do? I, I see this room, and, and I don't think that's true. I, I do think that we are winning on this issue of life, but what can we do to build on that momentum and start getting more people on the side of life? Should I kick it off? Yes, sir. Well, hey, it's incredibly awesome to be here, an absolute honor. How many of you appreciate everything that's been going on this weekend, the incredible speakers? Um, so I'll kick this off uh, straight up about what I believe about the next generation. I believe that this is the pro-life generation. Are you with me? And I'll tell you this. Um, the media is always going to change the narrative about what they want the narrative to be. And what we are responsible for doing is reminding the media that they can throw all the statistics they want at us. At the end of the day, righteousness wins. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what polls say. It doesn't matter what stats say. When we begin to stand up for life, I believe God of all has our back. Do you believe that in this room? And so... 
I think what has to happen is we need more young leaders like are in this room to rise up on their campuses in colleges and high schools and junior highs and begin to shout out loud boldly with their faith and say, the hill we die on is the one of the unborn. And uh, we've got to go all in. We've got to go all in. Amen to that. Amen to that. Dr. Siegel, do you want to jump in? Yeah, so uh, we have at Texas Right to Life, we have a college scholarship program where we give students like you a scholarship. We train you, we mentor you, and help you run the pro-life group on your college campus or at your law school or at your medical school. And so we have pro-life groups across the state that are leading the conversation on their campus. And you know you're not going to hear the pro-life message from your professors. You're not going to hear it from your school administration. Um, but as pro-lifers, we have to be the one to start that cultural conversation. And we're seeing that across the state. Uh, and, and these are kind of front line of this issue. And so we've been encouraged by great pro-life leaders in, their, in college, in medical school, in law school, who are fighting back and saying, no, that's not the narrative. This is the truth, and this is what we want to talk about. And so if you're interested in that, come to our table. We'd love to, to, to connect with you. Um, but we're also seeing on those college campuses is that's the real fight. I think the college campus is the new sidewalk ministry. It's the new sidewalk counseling ministry that we have in the pro-life movement. So you know, we had Planned Parenthood down the street here, uh, brick and mortar. They were committing abortions every week before Roe v. Wade was overturned. We would have prayer warriors out there. We'd have sidewalk counselors out there. Well, now the abortions are happening on college campuses because of this right here. This is the new digital abortion clinic. These uh, pro-abortion forces are telling you, go to their website, order abortion pills, and it will come directly to your dorm room. And so we have to have more of a pro-life presence on that college campus to be the first line of defense for that college student and for her baby. That is vitally, vitally important to defend life in this new era. And Jonathan, in your view, what have been the key factors that have played a role in the success that we ha have had here in Texas for the issue of life? We're one of the most pro-life states here, not only you know, preventing abortions from happening, but supporting mothers as well. Well, sure, I appreciate that. Uh, Jonathan Signs with Texas Values, great to be with y'all. Uh, raise your hand if you have a smartphone. Okay, everybody, uh, while you're here today, I want you to go, whether it's on the App Store or Google Play, our organization has an app, Texas Values, it's just those two words, Texas Values. I want y'all to download that app. That's the way that you can make sure you're getting timely notifications. I think we're one of the few organizations in the state that has an app, you know, as long as until Apple shuts us down. Hopefully that doesn't happen. But I am a lawyer, so, you know, if we have to go to court, we will. Uh, you know, it was funny when you were talking about Gen Z. What happens after Gen Z? Do we start the alphabet again? We go back to Gen A? Is that, is that Genesis? That takes us back to the beginning. That'll be Gen Genesis. Okay. So, um, but on all seriousness, look, Gen Z is the generation, the pro-life generation. All right? I've been in this movement, in the pro-life movement, for decades, okay? When I was a law student at the University of Houston, I sued my law school to protect the pro-life group I was leading when they tried to shut us down on campus. Anybody else sue their law school that's here? Just curious. Am I the only <laughs> one? Okay. Um, but you have to take that seriousness to this issue. But you live in the generation that can say, I was alive. I marched on Washington a year and a half ago with my son, who's a high school student, and, you know, we thought this is where we were going to be. We hoped, but at the same time, you were thinking, you know, it's been 50 years. Sometimes it takes longer than that. We hoped it was there. I was at an event last week with Amy Coney Barrett. We know having that Supreme Court justice on the court was a big part of Roe versus Wade being overturned. You don't have that in your way anymore. I don't know how many times when I'm lobbying at the state capitol, I'm talking to elected officials, yeah, we'd like to pass that law, but Roe versus Wade is there. It's not there anymore, all right? It's like being in a cage and it's wide open, okay? We can do as much as we put our minds to now because we don't have to allow nine people in black robes to tell us what to do. The power is back in the citizens. It's back in the people. It's in your hands, all right? 
a lot of that has to do with who we vote on at the ballot box, okay? One of the things we're going to pass around is a booklet that our organization put together. You're going to have the information of every federal and state elected official in the state, also a guide for how the legislative process works. It's time to move the process forward. And, and this is not a time in the pro-life movement to say, great, pat ourselves on the back. We, we did that last year, right, John? Because um, we had some success with the heartbeat law and others. Now is the time to say, we're not done. Because Roe versus Wade put the power back into the states. But it also says that the federal government has the power to decide this issue. Yes. And we know the Biden administration's coming at us. So here's the key. All right, the elections are the key because we don't have to wait for the Supreme Court to tell us what to do. We need to make sure at the state, at the local, and without a doubt, the federal level, if you want our vote, if you want the youth vote, you better be pro-life. Amen, amen to that. So Dr. Siegel, the heartbeat bill was a huge win for the state of Texas, but you mentioned that there are illegal websites that are targeting Texans to distribute the abortion pill. So what is the Texas Right to Life doing to combat this that many pro-life states are facing? Yeah, absolutely. So if you've heard about this, raise your hand. If you've heard about illegal websites selling abortion pills, just so I know if this is, okay. So. This, this is, there's a false narrative out there. Uh, there's a false narrative that we're done, like, like Jonathan was saying. There's a false narrative that abortion, there's no abortions in Texas. That is absolutely false. There was a report that came out that said 19,000 Texans went online and ordered abortion pills to be mailed directly to them last year. 19,000. Now, some of those uh, didn't actually take the pills, but still, we're talking about thousands of women who are, are taking these abortion pills, extremely dangerous for the woman, extremely obviously deadly for her child. But this is what we're seeing. The enemy is dedicated. The enemy is not over. They saw the headline about Roe v. Wade and they continued to innovate, to find ways to sell abortions, to advertise. On college campuses, we're seeing in the public restrooms, up on the wall are stickers that have QR codes. And it says, do you wanna be unpregnant? That's the level of deception. Do you want to be unpregnant? You take your cell phone, you scan that QR code, and it goes to an illegal website that is run by a doctor in the Netherlands who you fill out this form, and that doctor asks a pharmacy in India to mail the drugs directly into Texas. So right now, if, if you do it, you can go to these websites. There's 26 of them that we're citing. We have to fight back. Um, Representative Toth, uh, is, is here, he filed a bill that would actually help us go after the internet providers to stop access to these illegal websites. Um, there's some litigation strategies that we can do, but the reality is, just like our forebears at the beginning of 1973, they looked at Roe v. Wade and they were like, we don't know what the answer is to overcome this, we gotta start trying though. And then you saw informed consent laws, and then you saw sonogram laws, and you started seeing trends. That's where we are now. We have to start swinging. And so at Texas Right to Life, we filed le uh, legislation to start swinging at the new digital abortion clinic. Um, it didn't pass. Our elected officials didn't want to fight on these issues. Uh, we, we filed some, litiga uh, some legislation. We're going to file some litigation to go after uh, some of the weak uh, links in this chain to make this illegal uh, company work. Um, but we have to start trying. But right now, what we need your help with is to break the false narrative. To, to, to get people to stop being apathetic and thinking we're done in a state like Texas and help us. We're in a unique spot in Texas where we can fight these websites. Our friends in Louisiana can't do it. They're fighting the exceptions fight. Our friends in Oklahoma are scared to death that their constitution is gonna be voted uh, to be pro-abortion. Pro we're in a great spot in Texas to lead on this issue if we actually take the opportunity to be bold and to go after this agent of death that still wants to sell abortion in Texas. That's right. Exactly, that's right. Litigation in this case is really, really important. And Representative, you have said a lot of times that it, we can't only be anti-abortion, but we must be pro-life. Yes. So as a representative in the state capitol, what are you doing to help promote a culture of life where mothers feel supported and empowered to choose life? Well, I think we can all celebrate that right now abortion is down 97% in the state of Texas. 
which is just unbelievable. So there's the positive side. And to go off of what John was saying and what Jonathan is saying, telehealth abortions or these abortion pills are up 136% in Texas right now, which should alarm us. And, and I'll tell you this, there's two sides of this. Number one, you're right. We can't just be anti-abortion. We have to be pro-life. You know, we'll get accused all the time, and you'll hear this on your college campus, of, your, well, you're pro-birth, you're not pro-life. Here's how we combat that. First and foremost, um, we've got to make sure that these young ladies who are experiencing pregnancies and, and they're walking into some of the most complicated positions of their life. You know, me and my wife worked in the public school system for 11 years, helping young ladies decide to keep their baby when they felt like they didn't have any options. This is where we can step in. You know, I still believe that the local church is the hope of the world. Does anyone else believe that? And I'm going to say something really bold, and I hope it comes across the right way. But that is, if you have a church that did not celebrate the overturning of Roe v. Wade, that's not a church, that's a social club that's more committed to pleasing man than pleasing God. And it's time to find a new church that's bold and fearless. Do you agree with me in this room? So we need the church to rise up while also we have to create a culture of life that starts in the state house, that starts in our conversations. One of those is the bill that I filed this last session, which is our adoption assistance program. Listen, one of the biggest factors and one of the biggest things that stands in the way of, uh, you know, more families with the right value stepping in and bringing these children that have nowhere else to go. I think it's some 27,000 children are without a home today in the state of Texas. And one of the things that this bill would do is it would partner with local churches where if a local church is willing to pay 50% of the private adoption fees for a family to bring a child in, then the government is willing to match those funds and make adoption free for the first state in the entire United States of America. Um, we've got to let these mothers know that it is a beautiful thing to allow your child to go to a family that's going to nourish and take care of it. And so while we must push back on these abortion pills that are inhumane, that are absolutely destroying the culture of the next generation, we also must offer alternatives and we must lead the way in Texas for us to show a compassionate hand and say, we want this child to live and to live well. That is incredible, and, and you really are a champion for life at the state capitol. And, and Jonathan, we have time for one more question here. And adding on to that question, pregnancy centers have played such a key role in building a culture of life here in Texas, and you have defended them in, in the courts in Austin. So how do these centers contribute to the pro-life cause, and how can the students here, the college students, high school students, contribute to that and help them in their mission to support mothers? Well, I appreciate that, Ariana. Uh, in the state of Texas, we've allocated $140 million over a two-year cycle for pregnancy centers. There's about 300 or so in the state of Texas. These are nonprofit entities that help women not just when they're pregnant, but up to three years after the baby is born. More women need to be aware of that. The message that people need to hear is we love them both, okay? The mother and the child. That's right. All right. We already changed the law at the U.S. Supreme Court. Now we got to continue changing those hearts and minds so people warm up to us and they know how much we care. One of the keys that Texas, for you here in Texas, who, who knows somebody that lives in another state, okay? And that's one of the beauties of social media to some extent, all right? But our society, tell them about some of the things that we're doing in Texas so they can implement them in their states. Tell them some of the encouraging stories, the ways that babies are being saved, the way that the life of the mother and sometimes the father is being transformed by these pregnancy centers that are incredible. Tell those success stories. The state of New Mexico is the entry point for a lot of people coming to Texas to go over there to have abortions. Make it to where women don't wanna leave, but let your friends and family know in other states what the successes are. We have a little booklet that's got a five-part strategy called After Row. This is what we need to be doing. We, because now it is a state-by-state -state fight, not only federal, but we need to get at that tipping point. We need to help our friends 
in other parts of the country hear about what we've done. We have a website called TexasHeartbeatLaw.com where some of these stories are being told, where these pregnancy centers can get connected and women and children and families can get their funds. But just like we've always done, Texas, as Texas goes, so goes America. And that can be the case for the pro-life issue. Amen. What a blessing it is to live in the great state of Texas and, and have these leaders that are championing the life. But unfortunately, our time is up. But we feel that we, we really hope that y'all feel empowered and equipped to defend life. You know, be able to speak on what they are doing to empower the mothers and just be ready to build this culture of life to make sure that every single heartbeat, every single human being counts. So thank you all and thank you panelists for, for your time. Well, hello, everybody. Are we still awake? <laughs> Late in the afternoon. Look at all you scary right-wing extremists out there. A lot of threats to democracy in this room. And uh, since we are, in fact, threats to our democracy, we have a very important topic to talk about today, and that is banning books. Because that's what we want to do, guys. We want to ban books. It has nothing to do with the fact that most people would rather have their kids read The Great Gatsby than genderqueer in their school. We just want to ban books. You're killing me. <laughs> no, but what we're actually going to talk about today is the leftist attempt to weaponize schools and libraries in order to push their agenda on you, the Texas, you know, the youth of America. And we have a great panel here to discuss this. We have State Representative Steve Toth, one of, one of the unfortunate very few conservative fighters in the Texas House. And then we also have Trent Talbot, who is the CEO of a company called Brave Books, which we're going to talk about in a second. And then we have Andy Roth, who is the president of the State Freedom Caucus Network. And I am Greg Price. I am the comms director of the State Freedom Caucus Network. We are building freedom caucuses in the states, and one of the things that we've been doing is fighting against the American Library Association. And if you've never heard of this organization, they are essentially to libraries what Google is to the internet. And they have a woman as their president named Emily Drabinsky, who is a self-described Marxist, who I am not kidding said libraries need to be sites of socialist organizing. And if you want to know why, all this left-wing pornographic stuff is in libraries. They are a big part of it. And not only that, they have been caught circulating guidance on how to get Trent's events canceled. Brave Books organizes you know, Christian conservative readings at libraries, and they were caught doing that. So Trent, tell us a little bit about your organization, the things you do, and sort of the pushback you've received from organizations like the ALA. We make... Christian children's books, and the, the purpose of, of our books is to provide parents with tools to have conversations with their kids about topics that, that eventually they'll hear out there, you know, because we, can't, we cannot shelter our kids. That's a failing strategy. We have to equip them with truth so that they can stand on, and, and so we make books that teach things like um, gender reality, the sanctity of life, hard work, the importance of family, just Christian traditional values. And never would have thought that we'd end up in a big fight with the ALA or libraries across the country. But one of our authors, Kirk Cameron, uh, he came out with a book on biblical wisdom. And he wanted to go into, I guess, enemy territory, enemy territory, you know, big cities, and do some story hours in libraries that had hosted drag queen story hours. And we reached out to 54 libraries that had not only hosted but sponsored drag queen story hours. They all denied us. And we didn't even ask to be sponsored. We just wanted to go in there and host, host something for the community. And, and then that started this whole thing where we, we, we threatened lawsuit, exercised our First Amendment. Eventually, they backed down. We went on this story hour tour across the country where we're doing just wholesome story hours with Kirk. And 
Um, and then eventually we were like, hey, let's do, let's do a library takeover day on August the 5th. And ALA sort of had a big conference. They had all the librarians across the country and they told the librarians, hey, Brave Books, Kirk Hammer are doing this library takeover day on August the 5th book up your libraries, like book up all the space so, so you can block them. And we were never supposed to find out. We were having a hard time booking libraries. Eventually that video surfaced, it was this big scandal. We ended up fighting it and we had over 10,000 people on August the 5th show up. So, uh, and, and the fight just keeps going on. It's, it, it gets weirder and weirder. So think about this, they circulate guidance on how to get drag queen story hours in libraries. But Kirk Cameron reading to kids about the Ten Commandments? We can't have that. That just shows you the worldview of these people. And when we talk about, you know, the political fight surrounding this, you know, Andy and I, we run, uh, as I said, the State Freedom Caucus Network, and we've been leading the effort to get state and local library associations to defund and divest from the ALA because they get thousands of tax dollars from state governments. So, Andy, talk about a little bit about the work that we've done to do that, and also talk a little bit about, like, how the, the money that's behind them and the big role that it plays in yeah, that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Greg. Uh, so we have 11 state freedom caucuses all across the country, and our Montana Freedom Caucus was part of the effort to get the ALA out of Montana, and we were successful. Uh, we Thank you. We told all 11 of our state freedom caucuses to write letters to their uh, executive branch saying, we demand that our state gets out. Well, just earlier this week, South Carolina got out. And by the way, yeah. And you may not know this, but Texas is out. But just to understand how nefarious the ALA is, they uh, funnel tax dollars through their organization and sends it to all the libraries uh, around the country. And I talked to uh, a gentleman down in Louisiana. We have a Louisiana Freedom Caucus. And I was like, what's taking you guys so long? And he looked at me dead in the eyes and he said, we want to leave, but they just gave our library 350 iPads. That's how they get you, is with the money. And so if you take the 350 iPads, that means drag queen story hours next. And then all the, the books that you're buying with your tax dollars is going into these libraries. And the ALA is the backbone of the entire library system in the country. And so what we're trying to do at the, at the State Freedom Caucus Network is to get every state out. And you guys may remember a couple years ago when a lot of righteously angry parents were going to school board meetings and saying, this garbage that you're doing to our kids, it has to stop. Well, if you remember, uh, the National School Board Association wrote a letter to Attorney General Merrick Garland and said, these parents, they should be investigated by the FBI because we think they're domestic terrorists. And one by one by one, states left the National School Board Association. We need to do the same thing this time, but with the ALA. These associations, whether it's school board association, library association, there are dozens of these associations all over the place. And we know about woke corporations, we know about how the government is weaponized against us. I need you guys to become aware of all of these associations across the country. And we gotta pull them out root by branch and stop them because this is how they're indoctrinating our children. So when we talk about the situation specifically here in Texas, you know, parents, you know, we talk about the ALA and all the, the garbage they've done. Obviously, we see these news stories about, you know, these books that are legitimate pornography being found in schools and parents being upset by this and Democrats saying that being upset by this may, means you only want to ban books. But if, if you're like a parent in Texas, you may think to yourself, you know, I, I live in Texas, I'm, I'm safe from all of this. But Representative Toth, we're, they're really not, are they? We still see those books in these areas, and parents really need to be vigilant about it. So talk a little bit about what you've seen and sort of the work in the legislature to root out the rot in our schools and libraries. So you're in the ninth largest ISD in the state of Texas. It's a counter-independent school district. Within two years, they'll be the seventh largest ISD in the state of Texas. 
And they keep asking the same question Yogi Berra asked, who are you going to believe, me or your own eyes? They keep telling us these books don't exist. They keep telling us these books have been removed. Yet KDISD on the other side of Houston has adopted a policy that says these books cannot be in our libraries. Conroe Independent School District refuses to adopt a policy that says put this book, put this trash in front of my children or you'll be fired if you do. We, they refuse to do it. And so what they've actually done, their attorney, Kerry Gladys, has said, many of you have heard of HB 900, which is a policy we adopted this state legislature, this session, that says no more of these books. Conroe is sa simply saying, we're not going to ban these books unless we're forced to. Unless HB 900 is adopted, we're not going to put a policy in place banning these books and take, I mean, if I showed you some of this stuff, if we put it up on the screen, Christian would never let me come back. I mean, it's, it's just absolutely repulsive. It's graphic. And yet, it continues to exist right here in Counter Penance School District because its board president, Skeeter Hubert, and its superintendent, Curtis Null, refused to adopt a policy to say no more. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. You know, have you guys ever seen these videos of parents at school board meetings and they read from, you know, books like Gender Queer and another one called All Boys Are Blue that have graphic depictions of sex in it and then the school board cuts them off? Have you guys ever seen these videos that have gone really viral? Yeah, like think about that. You know, these books are available, these school boards allow them to be available to kids and yet they, they won't let them read them at a school board meeting? It, it's crazy. And so, you know, to go back to, to Trent, uh, you know, I think what your organization does is great. Obviously, you know, drag queen story hours have become a major cultural flashpoint, and you're kind of serving as the foil to that, where you're holding, you know, these Catholic conservative readings. So talk a little bit about how, you know, the parents in the room and, and the students as well can get involved with your organization and get involved with their local libraries as well. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, if we got any really smart, hardworking young people out there that are looking for a way to get involved and join the fight, Brave Books is rapidly growing and looking for, for those type of people. So you can go to Brave Books, go to the bottom at our careers page and apply for a job. The one thing I'll add to this conversation is that um, the other organization that really needs a thorough investigation is Scholastic. You know, to, to, for the, the, they're, they're similar to what the ALA, ALA is for libraries. Um, to our schools. They're, like somebody has to publish these books, somebody has to distribute these books, that's Scholastic. And Scholastic, they have thousands and thousands of books, and no librarian has the time to go through all these books. But they sneak them in, they, they, put, they make innocent looking covers, and they sneak them in. They're a completely, they've been captured by, by woke ideology from the very top, their CEO. And that's something that I think we as a conservative movement need to need to address because if we don't address Scholastic then you know we're, we're not serious those those Scholastic book fairs that there's you know 50,000 across the country every year um, there's all of these books are in those and so one thing that Brave's going to be getting behind very soon is is giving Scholastic some competition you know so that there's wholesome book fairs out there for kids so these principals don't have to you know, it's, it's the same way ALA sort of bribes libraries, Scholastic does the same thing with books, or with, with schools. And so, uh, but I, I think soon they're gonna have some competition. Right on, so kind of a, a, in the three and a half minutes that we have left here, kind of a dual question to both Steve and Andy. Talk about what like parents in Texas should be doing in order to fight back against this. What par how parents, you know, about being vigilant, talk about what they need to do in order to, you know, get it in, in order to out the rot at their school boards and in their libraries. So we outed one of the books two years ago during session, and on a Sunday, the mom called me up and she said, Representative, you're not going to divulge my son's name that brought this book forward, are you? And I said, no, I'm going to encourage you to encourage him to speak up. And she goes, that could cost him. That could cost him. First Timothy 4, verse 12, it says, do not let anybody look down on your youth, Timothy, but be an encouragement, be an example of the way you live your life, the way you conduct your speech, and the way you carry yourself. Guys, look, if you speak up, it's going to cost you. But know and trust that God has got your back. 
It could cost you something in this realm, in this world, but know that God will bless you as a result of it. You guys have got to be the ones that speak up. Don't expect that your parents are going to do it. Very often, they lack the courage to do it because they're afraid for you. You show them the courage that they need to, that they need to see in your family. Guys, speak up. We desperately need you. Andy, kind of same question to you. What do you how, how parents and students can get involved in this fight? Well, let, let me just uh, make you guys aware of some of the messaging here. They're all about book bans, book bans, book bans. That is total garbage, and here's why. Every single library, whether it's a school library, a public library, a private library, they don't all have every book ever written since the beginning of time. So they are all actively banning books as we speak. We call it curating. That's what libraries do. They decide what goes into their libraries. And so they are already making a choice to ban books every day, all the time. So don't fall for the book ban lie. And anybody that says we're banning books, these, these extremist conservatives, they're lying. So call them out on it. And whether it's on Twitter, Facebook, uh, at your schools, wherever they say it, stop that immediately and turn it back onto them. One more thing. Try and find Lord of the Flies in many libraries. Try and find To Kill a Mockingbird in many libraries. Try and find a lot of the Dr. Seuss books in the libraries. The left has banned those books. You can't get them anymore. They have been banned. Classic literature, Tom Sawyer, Huck Finn, they have been banned by the left. Yeah, one of the funniest things I think that ever happened was uh, the governor of California, Gavin Newsom, tweeting about how the GOP wants to ban books. When it was literally, I think, the Santa Barbara, California school board that banned To Kill a Mockingbird from their schools. And you see this with Huck Huckleberry Finn, too. They are the actual ones banning books. If you're a parent who doesn't one, want books about gay pornography in your schools, that's what these people are defending. It's fully insane. And so just to wrap up here, thank you everybody for coming. Thank you for thank you to Christian Collins and the entire Texas Youth Summit. And appreciate all that you do and enjoy the rest of the show today. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. Good job. Look at that. We left you three seconds on the clock. I wonder, Ryan, when your parents brought you home from the hospital and, and named you Ryan, uh, they probably never dreamed they'd be planning your funeral just a few years later. Do you know who Redmond Quinn is? Yeah. His big complex retreat center thing is out between here and Navasota, right? Yeah, it's called Clarity Ranch. This town is just a, it's a microcosm of things to come. You understand that, right? Yesterday, when I couldn't find my son, it was like I was running out of air. We are his church. We're the only thing standing between this generation and the schemes of the enemy. We've got to stand for the truth. See, Ellis, she didn't need nobody. Before she went to prison, she was half witch. A queen down there, powerful. So if she wanted you to do something, you're too afraid not to. I don't think you understand what's at the heart of the philosophy here. You're being used. That's the name of the game around here. How do I even know I can trust you? I don't guess you do.
You just watched a trailer from a show called Breaking Strongholds. Uh, I get the honor of playing uh, the detective in that show. You should all find it. It's on Amazon Prime, YouTube, Pure Flix, and uh, probably 12 different platforms. You should check that out. We address some really serious cultural issues in that show, and one of them is suicide. And that's what our panel is here to talk about today. Um, and the reason we're talking about it is because it's so important, and I'm about to prove that to you. So I want just to poll the audience. How many of you in the room have been affected by suicide? Know somebody who has taken their life that has impacted your life? Yeah, quite a few, at least 50%. I'm going to introduce my panel and let them say a little bit about themselves. And I'm going to start with Rebecca. And I'm going to share an interesting fact for each of our panelists. And the interesting fact for Rebecca is that she is a therapist. And she works with a lot of people who are hurting. And her organization, Love Hills Youth, has given over 1,500 hours of therapy to people who are hurting. Go ahead. Actually, almost 3,000 hours for free. So my name is Rebecca Smith. I'm a licensed professional counselor. I'm the founder and CEO of my general practice, which is Counseling Center of Montgomery County, my forensic practice, which is Allied Co-Parenting and Family Academy, and then my nonprofit 501C is Love Heals Youth, and we serve foster youth in congregate care facilities and the homeless population. Our next panelist is uh, Kim Hess, and something interesting about her is that she was uh, trained at Texas A&M as an architect, and she helped alongside the people who developed the woodlands. She helped build the woodlands, and this story, Breaking Strongholds, was largely influenced by the story of her family. Go ahead, Kim. Thank you, Terry. That seems like a world ago that I went to A&M. <laughs> Um, so now I am the president of the Cassidy Joint for Hope Foundation, and our mission is to prevent teen suicide. Because in 2015, December, five days before Christmas, we lost our oldest daughter, Cassidy, to suicide. And our lives will never be the same. Cassie looked just like all of you in the audience. She was young. She was 16 years old. She was a junior at College Park High School here in the Woodlands. She was a cheerleader, she was happy. She was a girl who always had a smile on her face, always lit up the room when she walked in, the very last person you would ever think that would take their life. And yet five days before Christmas, we had to say goodbye to her. So now is my mission in life to make sure we don't lose another life too soon to suicide because it is preventable. So I share her story in settings like this to parents and students and churches, whoever will let me share her story. And every time I do, I've realized how more and more young students are struggling in silence, just like Cassidy. So my mission is to break the silence, to have these uncomfortable conversations because they are so important and they're so needed and they can save a life. Thank you, Kim. My next panelist is uh, Rocky Malloy and he was, uh, he was instrumental in helping pass the law in Texas that allows for chaplains to come into to schools. And I think that's pretty incredible because we need people, Jesus followers, in our schools helping people through these tough things. Go ahead, Rocky. Thank you, Terry. Governor Abbott signed into law the Texas School Chaplain Act on June the 18th. It came effective September 1st. This is an opportunity for real mental health to happen through a God representative on public school campuses. We have 26,238 schools with school chaplains. In the last 13 years, not one reported suicide. That's in a database of almost 24 million people. The So yes, chaplains make a difference. So please talk to your school board representatives and your superintendents and request that you have chaplains. It's the law of Texas now. Beautiful. First question for the panel is why it's important to start a discussion like we're doing here on the stage about suicide. And that goes to anybody who wants to talk about that. 
Well, it's important to talk about suicide and, and to use that word because a lot of times teenagers, they don't know how to articulate that, or, or, or children, sometimes even adults don't know how to articulate it. But it's something that once we bring it out into the open and we start to discuss it, then they're going to be more likely to address what's bothering them, what's upsetting them. And oftentimes what I find with a lot of my clients that I work with is not necessarily necessarily that they're looking for finality. They're looking for a way out. They're looking for a way to solve a problem. And they just need somebody to talk to so they can figure out how to solve that problem. But if we don't address it in the moment, sometimes it gets lost underneath all the other things that are happening in life. And then we fast forward a couple weeks or a, a couple of months and we think that everything's fine, but then it comes back with a vengeance. And so it's very important that we address this. It's very important that we put words to this so that the kids are gonna be more likely to talk about what's going on and be willing to hear there is hope, there is a way to get out of this and we're gonna figure this out because everything's fixable. And it's simple. If we don't talk about it, then how can we help them? You know, I mean, it's as simple as that. Suicide really is a silent epidemic, and it's the silence that is killing our kids. You know, um, we have to get them to open up. We have to get them to open up when they're in, in a healthy state, you know, and have these conversations about suicide prevention when, when we're healthy. That way, whenever they get to maybe a crisis point, a crisis situation, they've already had these discussions at home when they felt safe, you know. Um, it's a myth that if we say the word suicide or if we talk about suicide, that that's going to put the thought into someone's head. And that's state cases have shown that that's just simply not the truth. You know, if we can't openly talk and say the word suicide, are you thinking about hurting yourself? Are you thinking about taking your life? Then there's no way that we can help them out of that crisis situation because honestly, when a person is at that tipping point, whenever they are, all, all they're looking for is hope. No one wants to take their life, but sometimes I just don't know how to live through that moment, through that crisis situation. So as parents, as students, and you know, even students, if you see another peer struggling, you know, it's okay to ask, are you okay? And that conversation doesn't have to be too heavy. It doesn't have to be too scary. You know, I, don't, I think at the end of this, we're even gonna show a PSA where it shows you all you have to do is just Give them that, that your time and be present with them and just simply ask, are you okay? Are you thinking about taking your life? Because sometimes that opens up the conversation. They're just looking for someone to ask them that. Rocky, can you talk about why hope's so important? You know what? I was a merchant marine officer, which makes me a professional navigator. There's two things you have to know all the time, where you're at and where you're going. Not knowing either of those two means you're lost. And so, young people, know where you're at, who you are. In any destination is better than no destination. And when you find yourself drifting off course because you are lost, that's when you need to talk someone to help you get back on course. Sometimes it's a short term. Where do you want to be next week or just to finish school? Sometimes too far off is too difficult, but have a goal that's critically important. My favorite, one of my favorite scriptures is a, an anchor verse that we use for the show Breaking Strongholds is John 1.5, and John 1.5 says, uh, light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. Why is it so important to talk about these dark Issues. Do you want to add on to that or add anything to that? Sure. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tie that into hope as well. Um, when, when we are stuck in the darkness and, and we don't believe that there's any light, and Victor Frankel, who is somebody that survived Auschwitz, he wrote uh, about this. And as soon as he noticed that somebody lost hope, it wasn't long that they would end up perishing. And hope is so critical because that's the light. That's the light that guides us out of the darkness. Hope is the most powerful thing I've ever seen when, when we know that this is not the end all be all or that this is it. That hope helps us have the, the drive, the ambition. And sometimes being a therapist and helping the, the kids understand, and this is one of my mantras, everything's fixable. It might not be the outcome that we want, 
but it's still an outcome, and we're still going to figure out how to get there. And so you're not going to fight this alone. You're not on this journey alone. I'm here with you. We're going to figure this out because everything is fixable. So hope is, hope is the light. You know, I'm just pick up on whatever you're just saying alone. I think that's one of the biggest things our kids today, they, they feel like they're the only ones having these struggles, these problems, whatever they are, and what they don't realize that they're not alone. Y'all are all having the same issues. Y'all are all faced with the same stresses and, um, in today's world. And, and let's face it, there's a lot of darkness out there. I mean, the internet, <laughs> I mean, it provides way too much darkness. And if we don't know how to navigate through our social media and all of those, those things that we have, you know, in a healthy manner, then we can, we can lose light and we can lose hope. But, um, you know, I, I just want all of you kids to know that you're not alone. You're, you're not alone. And it's okay to ask for help. Mark 4 says when we bury things in our heart, it produces a harvest. The word of God or the demonic word. So when you're hiding things in your heart, keeping it out of the light, it can start to produce. That's why it's so important to talk to someone you truly trust, to expose that thing to the light and hear yourself express it out loud. It's easy to look at uh, people that come up on stage and go, oh, I could never be like them. But the, the truth is everybody that's stepped up on this stage today is a broken human. I'm, I'm one of them. I used to be an alcoholic. I've gone through all kinds of struggles in my life. So it doesn't matter what you're going through. I believe there's a stage for each and every one of you in this room. It may not look like this, but somebody needs what you have to offer. And I want to just, the, the question, are you okay? How powerful is that? And is there anything that, you, that we can add to that or any other questions? Sometimes it's asking, are you okay? more than one time. A lot of times, it, it, it's hard. We get, we get in that, um, that rhythm of, how are you? I'm fine. How are you? I'm fine. But keep asking. Be attentive and, and very present with the person that you're talking to. And when you notice that there's maybe a little something off with their facial expressions or their, their body language, we have to tune into that. We have to, to listen and watch for the changes in behavior and ask, are you okay, or is there anything that I can do for you? Ask it several times and keep pushing. You know, I have two little boys, and whenever they're having some issues, I tell them, well, I've got all the time in the world, and we're gonna sit here until you're willing to talk about it. So I know that we're, we're in a rush for everything, and there's so many things going on, and I think, you know, since COVID, we, we've got our little smart smartphones or all of our electronics, and I think we're even more fast-paced today than what we were even five years ago. But take the time, because you don't know when it's your last time. And listen to your gut. You know, sometimes you just feel like someone is off, and you maybe don't know what it is. They're just not acting normal. They're not acting right. And even if you ask them, are you okay? And like you said, they say, oh, I'm fine. But, you know, you have that gut feeling that they're just not. Listen to that. You have that gut feeling for a reason. And, and don't be persistent. Don't give up. And sometimes it's not even the way that they're talking. You know, maybe it's the way they're texting you know, be, notice the way that people um, reach out on social media. Are they, are they putting dark messages out there? So I think we can all be the safety net for each other if we just slow down and pay attention. I ask people, what are you talking to yourself about? Because what they're saying to themselves, they might not say to anyone else. A lot of times it catches them off guard and they're actually open up. As far as a foundation goes, I'm sure everybody on this stage has struggled with some pretty tough stuff. Why is a spiritual life and a connection to God so important? Well, my next poem that's going to come out for our gala in January is called A Child of God. And this is something that was very heavy on my heart while I was in the mountains this summer, and I just kept hearing it, you're a child of God, you're a child of God, you're a child of God. And, and, and then Ezra 10.4 is kind of the theme this year, rise up, find the courage, rise up, you're a child of God. God says that we are to take care of his creatures and take care of his children, and we have to rise up and do that for everybody. Take the time 
And it's not just, are you okay? There's the follow-up piece to it as well. Push them, push them until they talk, and then follow up. And it can be a very simple follow-up with these handy-dandy little things that are the bane of my existence. Um, but follow up, text them and ask them, are you okay? How's it going? Hey, you've been on my mind. Or if they don't want to respond, then you can simply say, hey, you've been on my mind, and I just want you to know I've been praying for you. That is so powerful because it feels so, you feel so loved in that moment. And God is love, and whenever you know it, in your mind, you're telling yourself, I'm a child of God, then you know you're loved, and you're loved by all of your brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, I've heard through many speakers today the word spiritual battle. I'm a believer in that. You know, I think um, there's a lot of darkness out there, and sometimes it's hard to find that light. You know, and Cassidy was very, very plugged in to her faith in her church group. Her, um, her you know, she was at church camp every summer. She could recite so many Bible verses. She, she knew her faith, and yet she was a victim to the darkness. So I think it's so important to stay rooted in your faith, and, and, um, and God is going to connect you to the light because there's a lot of dark thoughts that go around in our heads, even as adults. You know, it's, it's tough. It's tough being an adult today, but it's even tougher being a teen, and we get it. So I think you definitely have to dig into your, to your roots of faith. When people come to the end of themselves, I think faith is what will inspire them to have faith in Jesus. And they know Jesus could do it. Maybe they don't believe they can do it, but that's the last, last stronghold. Jesus could do this, so I'm going to make it. I served in the, in the Navy for a little while, and I'm thinking of the Merchant Marines and the anchor that holds somebody in place. And I look out into this room, and there's a lot of people here who have an anchor. They have an identity. They know who they want to be. They have values. So I, I want to open it up to the panel. So if we've missed anything, how would you encourage people in this room? Pray. So... Prayer is one way that we can develop a really healthy internal dialogue. And that's a conversation when you do it silently, just between you and the Lord. And so I talk to my kids oftentimes, because even at my, my boys, they go to a Christian school, and I was there with them, and this is the elementary. And I asked for a, a show of hands on how many of you in here have had bad thoughts before, bad thoughts about yourself. And every hand that I could see went up. And these are little bitty guys and girls. And so I, I, we talked about the importance of prayer because when you're praying, you're talking to our Father about a problem, you're asking for help, and you're expressing gratitude. And that is a really great way to process the thoughts in your mind and learn how to have really healthy dialogue. So my boys will ask me, how often do you pray? And I say, I'm praying all day because I'm talking in my head and I'm practicing what is my problem? I need to open that up and, and let God hear that problem so I can give it to him. Then I'm asking for help, and then I'm thinking about all the blessings that have come to me in this life. So now I'm speaking to the, to the youth in this room. Know that it's okay not to have your whole life figured out at this moment. You know, it's, we live in, in a community of high achievers, and where we are expected to have it all figured out all the time, and, and we expect our children to have it all figured out. But it's okay not to. You know, just take this moment to be a kid. And, and parents out there, I encourage you to take as much off of their plate as you possibly can. Don't get caught up in enrolling your kids in all the AP classes because that's what your counselors push you to do. Know, know your child's limitations. Know your child's strengths and their weaknesses and remind your child that it's okay to fail. We always are bragging on our, our accolades and our successes and sometimes we forget to teach our children that we failed in life. And with each time we fail, it's a learning moment. So just remember, it's okay. Do we have the QR code for the hope test? Do we have a QR code for that hope test? This QR code will link to an evaluation of your level of hope. Hope is the best predictor of future performance. It's six questions.
quick questions. Please take that shot and evaluate your level of hope. If you're not the highest level of hope, you need to share that with someone. If you're in the bottom level of hope, that's concerning. Share it with your friends. Take it together. Look at each other's hope level. And that's our time. I want to end with a quote, and I'm speaking to everybody in this room. The privilege of a lifetime is being yourself. There's no one else like you on the planet, and it's a privilege to be you. So know that. Thank you, guys. I want to thank all of you for being at this Texas Youth Summit. It was an honor to have you this year, and let me say that there were so many people that made this event possible, all of our volunteers, there's so many people behind the scenes, supporters, donors, um, pe partners in the media, people that helped us get the word out. Um, there was so much work to put on this summit. Uh, throughout the course of this past year. And you just see it in the event for two days, but there's, there's board members, there's people that are working and praying for you that your lives will be impacted and changed for the better. And so uh, we do this and it comes from our heart. We wanna make a difference in our state. We wanna make a difference in our country. So we wanna encourage you to continue to be a part of what we're doing. Uh, stay engaged with us on social media. Sign up for our newsletter on our website. Um, get involved with what we're doing. Start a Turning Point USA chapter. That's a great way um, to, to be connected to the conservative movement. You know, vote, um, pray, ask your pastor uh, to get involved in the political process. And ultimately, it's not going to be a political party that saves us. Ultimately, it's not going to be one man or anybody that can save this country. It's going to be Jesus Christ. And so my encouragement to you is if you're not a Christian, submit your life to Christ. Submit your life to Christ. Surrender your life and allow him to change your heart, change your perspective, and you can walk forward in understanding and knowing the gospel that Jesus Christ died for your sins and he has a plan and purpose for your life. He wants to give you redemption here on this earth and that you could be with him in the next life. That's Jesus' plan for your life. The second most important thing, I think, is that we protect our right to be able to share that good news. And that's why politics is so important. We have to protect our right for religious freedom of all faiths, 
because that's what America is all about. That's why America was founded. And so my encouragement to you is, is, is pray for this country. Um, pray and stay involved in the political process and don't give up. It may seem bleak sometimes, like, are we ever going to get our country back? I mean, are you serious? There's like 52 different genders now, they say. I mean, are you serious? Like, they're, you know, running around in the streets naked saying we're coming for your children. This is insane. Like, this is like when they're calling good evil and evil good. This is, we're living in those types of days. There's wickedness and debauchery going around all around. And, you know, and they're forcing us to take vaccines. They're trying to do everything that they can. You know, just wicked stuff that's going on. They're freezing the accounts of conservatives' bank accounts. Wrong, wrong. But we cannot allow that to steal our courage. We have to be bold and we have to stand up for righteousness. We have to continue to fight for this country because it's worth fighting for. So my encouragement to you is don't give up. God's not done with America. He's got good things in store. It's going to be morning in America again. And um, I'm just so thankful that we're able to put on this conference. And my encouragement to you here is it's going to be bigger and better next year. And other people aren't going to hear this, but we're going to kick out this side of the, the ballroom and we're going to go all the way over. My vision is to not just have a backdrop. I want an LED wall. Maybe you don't know what an LED wall is, but it's, it's cool. It has reduction. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be bigger than ever. And that's the vision that we're casting today. And we're going to have um, new amazing speakers next year and some of the ones that you already love. It's going to be awesome in 2024. So pray with us that we can make Texas Youth Summit something that continues to be where lives are changed, where young people get connected to the conservative movement. Um, they get involved. Uh, you know, they make lifelong friendships. They, they have a change of heart. They, they, they get knowledge. And they're excited about making a difference in this community and in this country. Um, would you pray with me as we pray for this summit that we have coming up next year? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for everyone here, every supporter, every donor, every volunteer, everyone that made this summit happen. And we know this happened because of your favor. So I just pray that you will bless all of the students because this is not about the conference. This is not about the, quote, Texas Youth Summit. Um, this is not about, you know, an individual. Uh, ultimately, this is about you, and this is about the people and the young lives that we're trying to affect. And I, this is bigger than just this brand. This is, this is about the movement of young people that are, have a heart for you, that are fighting to take back America, take back this country. So I pray that you bless each and every one of them. Um, we pray against anything that would come against our youth. And uh, we pray that their lives will be changed for the better and that they can be, this can be a, a catalyst for them to go out and do amazing things. We pray that we have, you know, members of Congress that come out of here. We pray that we have um, people that, you know, go on and start things and, you know, get their churches and their communities involved and um, just that they reach so many more people uh, t for the movement. We, we, we believe this. We ask for it right now, and we ask that you'd continue to grow and expand this and protect our, all of the people, myself included, um, that are working uh, so hard to make this happen. I pray for humility. I pray for um, love, and I, I pray for uh, quiet strength and courage to stand up and do what's right. We pray this in the name of Jesus, the name that is above all names. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, thank you so much. Um, I'll be... I would love to meet some of you out in the hallway and um, just thank you again. Thank you guys so much.